Episode 1 Transmigration Kacha! The muted beast gushed out of the crevices like tides of a wave as their shrill screeches continued to ferment during the intense battle. The muddy soil seeped deep within the trenches on the front line, emitting a rather foul smell similar to that of rotten candy. The unusual scene took place on a seemingly normal afternoon at the F-Class gathering point, Royal Mint. The most recent reports of the victory from the front lines had caused those arrogant big shots from Texas, who only knew how to use their heels to think, to once again come up with a resolution for the fight that could be considered as an idiotic battle. Royal Mint was a small gathering ground specially created for the recruits of the combat division, who were given the orders by headquarters to commence a valiant. However, it was a pity that the tragic event proved once again the stupidity of the commanders who only knew how to give orders and hide behind closed doors, whose heads were boiling in nothing but water. Within the lair of the bloodthirsty furious ants, the soldiers discovered no less than ten other E-class blood-devouring ants. As a result of that short yet reckless charge, the combat division nevertheless suffered quite heavy damages in its ranks. What kind of joke is this? Even if I've just narrowly escaped death and have been transmigrated into the midst of a hellish battle, I, Daniel, will not die so easily. As such, Daniel carefully hid in the trench on the verge of collapse. Lowering his head, he stooped down and began observing the precarious situation on the battlefield without blinking as he secretly cheered himself on. Logically speaking, Daniel could not figure out the current situation of humanity. According to the usual development process of humans, shouldn't the Earth be undergoing rapid changes in technology a thousand years into the future? Shouldn't society be thriving as humans began exploring the mysteries of the universe? At this point, shouldn't humans already be able to wander freely into the vast space of the universe, traveling through space wherever and whenever they want to? This was supposed to be the period where they could eat hot pot and sing for entertainment at the same time. However, the reality was that the Earth, a thousand years later, would long since be riddled with craters and fall into a state of utter chaos. Hundreds of years ago, science and technology had advanced to the extreme with the efforts of humanity. Thus, the excessive use of all resources of Earth had drained out all of its life force. In the face of death, Magical energy that originated from the heart of the Earth, later known as spiritual spirit, was accidentally discovered by scientists. To their pleasant surprise, humans realized that this mysterious substance could not only improve the physique of humans, but could also stimulate the hidden gene sequences in the human body. Furthermore, the spiritual spirit could increase one's lifespan and even multiply one's martial strength. This was certainly an opportunity given by the heavens for humanity to once again evolve. In their moment of elation and relief, humanity failed to realize that the spiritual spirit seemed to favor the other creatures of nature more than them. Since their genes were also blessed by the heavens, the beasts of the field and the birds of the air evolved at a much faster rate. By the time humanity had realized what was going on, the mutated beasts had already become unstoppable. Thus, the humans were forced to retreat underground, having no choice but to leave behind the civilizations they created over the past centuries. Humanity must be paying for their sins, Daniel shook his head. This body was originally owned by an orderly who was responsible for logistics in the garrison. Logically speaking, even if the headquarters had sent out the correct intelligence, Someone as insignificant as the original owner would not have the right to be participating in such a crucial counterattack. However, the original owner, in his high spirits, was pressured by others to enlist into the army. Yep, this kid must have lost his mind. Daniel cursed secretly. Staring at the battle that was about to break down at any moment, he immersed himself in deep thought and tried to think of ways to save his own life. With a loud bang, smoke and dust flew in all directions. Suddenly, a muscular man rushed past Daniel like an eagle, 
Diving into the trench, he used the mud of the ground to form a defensive wall as he panted heavily. Captain, how is the situation on this side? The vice captain, Dylan Moore, who was standing next to Daniel, said as he wiped his face and took two steps forward. The person he spoke to was Steve Stone, the captain in charge of their team's operations. The situation isn't very optimistic. Steve glanced at the bearded man. His face, dark as bronze, was filled with nothing but dejection. The false intelligence given by the Texans has led to this severe situation. If this was a normal F-Class mutated beast lair, we would barely be able to clear the lair with the number of awakened practitioners at our gathering point. However, the existence of the 10 E-Class blood devouring ants makes this place no less than an E-Class lair. We have just received news that one of the leaders of the Awakened Practitioners has already died in battle. Meanwhile, the front lines have already begun fighting with their lives on the line. I'm afraid Han's orders to retreat will come within the next two hours. You guys should prepare yourselves. This time, I'm afraid. Steve paused and did not continue. Captain, e even the leader of the Awakened Practitioners died in battle? Then... Is there still any way for us to survive? C Captain, I, I don't want to die. The young soldier around Daniel's age trembled uncontrollably and said in a wavering voice, Awakened practitioners were chosen people who had awakened their gene chains and possessed extraordinary martial power. Every single awakened practitioner held high positions in the gathering ground as they were known as the strongest fighters among the group. Not only did they possess extraordinary martial powers, but they even possessed the ability to fight mutated beasts head-on. Being one of the strongest few in the gathering ground, their significance was far beyond what ordinary members like them could compare to. The Royal Mint was simply an F-class gathering ground. As such, the awakened practitioners only numbered up to five people. Now that even the great awakened practitioners have suffered such a loss, the group of small soldiers would definitely not have any luck or hope to survive in such a dire situation. What are you afraid of? If worse comes to worse, we'll just have to fight it out with these beasts ourselves. Though we may not be awakened practitioners, we'll at least be known as heroes 20 years later. With his face filled with viciousness, Dylan fumed with utter rage, as if he had been provoked. Hearing that, Steve sighed and surprisingly didn't say anything. As a captain, he knew that the news he brought would ultimately be a devastating blow to his soldiers' morale. Despite that, Steve took the opportunity to remind his comrades of the tragic reality happening before them. All right, Dylan. Notify the others and prepare to retreat. Once the order of retreat is declared, it will naturally be passed down the ranks. When that happens, run as far away as you can. Although... There will most certainly be countless deaths resulting from the retreat. It will be inevitable. Every name that I call, please step forward to receive a Beast Corps. Steve waved his hand and said. He then took out a bag and shook out a few thumb-sized sparkling beads. These beads were the Beast Corps. These cores originated from the body of mutated beasts and were also the source of their immense power. After extracting them from the mutated beasts, even ordinary people without any potential could use those beast cores to cultivate by absorbing the strength from the cores. Due to its fluid nature, the Human Federation had recognized the beast cores as a common currency. Even a small core could be exchanged for a year's worth of expenses and living rations. The soldiers lined up silently to receive the beast core from Captain Steve. If it was a normal day, they would be elated. However, even an absolute idiot would understand that they were receiving the Beast Corps now as a last resort since they were on the verge of defeat. Each soldier received four small Beast Corps. Each one would ultimately decide whether they would be able to escape this hell alive or not. At this moment, the atmosphere turned stifling, making it difficult to breathe. Daniel. Suddenly, Steve called out to Daniel and proceeded to say, 
You were originally an orderly who did not need to participate in this battle directly. At that time, you were still arrogant and young. Despite that, I was ultimately the one who accepted you into my squad. However, I didn't expect that situation would become this bad. Among the soldiers on my team, you are the weakest when it comes to physical tasks and combat prowess. When the order to retreat is declared, get the hell away from the place as fast as you can. Since your father and I were sworn brothers, I've watched you grow up your entire life. You must live. With that, Steve patted Daniel on the shoulder and gave him five beast cores, one more than the others. Having already observed and figured out the dire situation they were currently in, how could Daniel smile back despite Steve's kindness? Since he could not even protect his own life, how could he possibly hope to escape this hell alive? It seems these are my funeral expenses, Daniel aside. Just as he was about to put away the beast cores, Daniel's gaze suddenly froze. After all, the five beast cores he had been holding in his palm had just disappeared in an instant. What was going on? At that moment, swish, a small panel suddenly appeared in his mind. Name, Daniel Wilson. Energy, 500 points. Stamina, 7 points. Strength, 10 points. Spiritual force, 6 points. Gene chain talent, none. Energy replenishment completed. First level extraction is ready. Number of times remaining, 5 times. Daniel stood dumbfounded at that moment. After all, Daniel was extremely familiar with this exact panel that had just appeared. What in the world is going on? Isn't this the attribute panel from the video games I used to play? Damn, did it follow me into this body? Daniel, in a state of shock, did not have sufficient time to digest all this information at once. Suddenly, crash, boom. A huge explosion resounded from the direction of the front lines, followed by an ear-piercing ring. At this moment, Daniel felt like his head was about to explode as he was temporarily deafened. Recovering from the shock, he looked towards the source of the explosion. In the winding crevice, dozens of ants, the size of calves, suddenly crawled out of a crack in the ground. Their shiny green eyeballs were moving in an irregular pattern while their bare jaws, which seemed to be sharper than steel blades, gleamed with a cold light. A single glance at those disgusting creatures was enough to send a shiver down Daniel's spine. Blood, bloodthirsty, furious ants? A series of cries suddenly rang out. Episode 2 Extraction Swoosh. At that moment, everyone's expression changed drastically. Compared to the other exploration teams in the Royal Mint, the team specifically led by Steve was not very strong. Although they were also part of the main force, they usually acted as support for the other teams and did not face the attacks of the bloodthirsty Furious Ants directly. Positioned at the left rear of the front line, their small team did not have many risks. Even if a few beasts did slip through the vanguard occasionally, with a veteran like Steve leading the team, they had suffered zero casualties thus far. But now, a dozen or so bloodthirsty furious ant had crawled out of the crevice, which posed as a devastating attack to them. Retreat now, immediately. Steve's face became terrifyingly pale as he turned around and shouted aloud without any hesitation. Dylan, send my order to retreat at once. There's no need to wait for Sir Roger's order. I'll take care of the rear and buy time for you guys to run. Each person that escapes is ultimately a victory for me. Damn it! Why the hell are you wimps still standing there? Get the hell out of here! Steve shouted in anger. Seeing that his men had yet to recover from their shock, he immediately burst out in curses to wake them up. His face turned ashen as the veins on his forehead were seemingly on the verge of bursting out. Steve then jumped into the trench with a steel sword in his hand.
from the looks of it, he intended to stay behind to buy as much time as he could for the rest of his soldiers to escape. Captain, we should retreat together. Dylan, his eyes turning red, reached out his hand in an attempt to pull Steve back with him. What the hell, Dylan? I don't intend on dying just yet. Even so, what I decide is not up to a vice captain like you. Hurry up and leave now. Steve's eyes opened wide as he raised his foot and kicked Dylan's butt, causing him to fall on his back. Dylan, now covered in mud, stood back up with the determination to stay behind with his captain. The bloodthirsty, furious ants roamed throughout the muddy grounds and packs. Wherever they passed, not a single blade of grass remained. Though they may travel in groups, the destructive power of each beast should not be underestimated. In the entire gathering ground, the only ones who could destroy dozens of bloodthirsty fury ants, ants at once were the awakened practitioners, who had awakened their genes. On the other hand, Steve is the leader of a team who possessed the strength of an intermediate warrior. For intermediate warriors like him, it would already be difficult to handle two or three bloodthirsty furious ants by himself, let alone facing more than ten of those beasts at once. There was simply no way for him to come out victorious in such a one-sided battle. God damn it, I'll just have to fight it out with them. Dylan gritted his teeth. Dylan, do you want me to die with regrets? Just get the hell out of here. Steve roared towards the sky before jumping onto the swarm of ants with a solid resolve. Captain! The veins of Dylan's forehead throbbed as he turned around to escape without any hesitation. Damn it! Everyone run away now! We need to use the time the captain bought for us to escape. Even if only one or two of us can escape this hell, it'll be a win for us. We can't let the captain die in vain. Dylan shouted at the top of his lungs. He held his sword horizontally and stood in front of his teammates with great determination. With Steve now dead, Dylan would naturally become the leader of the team. Though he may only be an entry-level warrior, who did not even possess 10% of Steve's strength, he was determined to give his life for his comrades. Even if he could only buy a single second of time, if that would result in saving another life, his death would not be in vain. The group of team members wore sorrowful looks on their faces, but they could only grit their teeth and run. In the presence of those mutated beasts, their lives were as fragile as a thin piece of paper. At this point, they had no choice but to run as fast as they could. On the other hand, Daniel did not even have the time to feel the remorseful atmosphere. With a single glance towards the direction Steve dashed into, he began retreating for his life. Having been born a meddler, he did not possess any sort of physical powers. As the group dispersed, he was left behind at the rear of the retreat with another young man called Matthew Benton. The problem is, how could Daniel and Matthew win against F-class mutated beasts? Suddenly, one of the bloodthirsty furious ants, the size of a calf, caught hold of Matthew's bare feet. He then let out a blood-curdling screech before falling into the muddy ground. Daniel subconsciously turned around when he heard the scream. However, the bloodthirsty, furious ant had already pressed down on Matthew's body to prevent him from escaping. At this moment, Daniel felt as if his heart was about to jump out of his chest. Daniel, save, save me, please. I, I don't want to die yet. Matthew's snot and tears flowed down his face and spilled all over the muddy earth. He desperately reached out his hand towards Daniel in a final attempt to survive this hellish place. However, the bloodthirsty, furious ant had mercilessly stretched out his sharp lower jaw and pierced through his chest like paper. Matthew's eyes dimmed as blood spurted all over Daniel's face. Death. It seemed that he was a moment too late. Daniel, who was born in the peaceful era, never thought there would be a day when death would be so close to him, that he could feel the lingering scent to the grim reaper next to him at that very moment. Daniel wished very much that this was a nightmare. However, the stench that lingered around his nose, as well as the merciless gazes of the ant that felt like daggers pointing directly at him, reminded Daniel that this was definitely not a nightmare that he could wake up from. Is this death? No, I will not accept this fate. I 
I want to keep living. In this crucial moment between life and death, Daniel possessed a strong desire to live. Clenching his fists tightly, he began thinking of any possible ways for him to survive. Energy replenishment complete. First level extraction is ready. Number of times remaining, five times. It was at this moment when a clear voice sounded in Daniel's mind. Extract. Without any hesitation, Daniel chose the extraction option for the bloodthirsty furious ant that was within his reach. Suddenly, Daniel felt as if he had received some sort of success notification in his mind. Before he knew it, an interface popped up in his mind. The green panel appeared in his blank mind like a dense mass of green fireflies. In the next instant, a wisp of green light entered his body. Daniel felt an incomparable pain shocking through his body along with some sort of aura. Everything in his body, his flesh, cells, and bone, began to tremble as he groaned in pain. The pain felt no less than a thousand cuts through his body. At the same time, the places that the green wisp of light passed through began to feel stronger than before. He felt a surge of power that could topple mountains and overturn the seas running through his veins. The intense pain came and went like a tsunami, only to leave behind a path of destruction. Though he indeed felt much stronger than before, Daniel sensed a vicious feeling arising in his heart. His body seemed not to be able to bear the sudden surge of strength. At this moment, the bloodthirsty furious ant pounced towards Daniel with its sharp jaw. Having reached the limit of his patience, Daniel exploded towards the sky and punched the ant on its head with a loud roar. Crash! A loud sound echoed through the air. The single punch was as heavy as a mountain. Soon, the surging power in Daniel's body gushed out like a flood from his fist. The bloodthirsty furious ant, which had previously ripped apart Matthew's body with its bare fangs like some sort of snack, exploded like a watermelon despite its tough armor. Daniel maintained his punching pose with a look of disbelief on his face. This is my power? For the first time, Daniel felt as if he possessed the strength capable of letting him penetrate a rocky mountain. This feeling was something that he had never experienced before in his life. Swish. At this instance, the interface suddenly appeared in his mind yet again. Name, Daniel Wilson. Energy, 400 points. Stamina, 17 points. Strength, 200 points. Spiritual force, 6 points. Gene chain talent, strength of an ant. Broken ant gene chain, 61% complete. Daniel stood dumbfounded in his place. He looked at the heaven-defying extraction interface in a daze and felt as if something bad was about to take place. Of course, he knew the potential of this interface since it was similar to the one he previously used in an online game. Having been caught with this exact cheating interface, his in-game character was killed miserably. To express his further dissatisfaction, Daniel resorted to using cheats in the game. Extraction as the name implies, is a method that allows its user to extract what they wanted to from their target. These mutated ants were able to move things that were ten times heavier than their own weight. Thinking about the great power that he suddenly accumulated just now, in addition to that simple annotation on the gene chain on the interface, how could Daniel not know that he had extracted the gene chain that contained the strength of the F-class ants? Oh my god! I'm going to go crazy. Daniel waved his fist and celebrated his survival. After a moment of silence, he kicked away the bloodthirsty furious ant's corpse and walked towards Matthew's lifeless body. Daniel squatted down and closed his eyes, which had already lost all its light. Having only transmigrated to this world for a short while, he had only exchanged a few words with Matthew and did not interact with him much. However, he knew that this kid was timid and afraid of death. 
Being a soldier was something he had no choice but to do. In contrast to his fate, his dream was much simpler, to ensure that he would have enough money to go home and live a happy life with his wife. But now, there was no need for him to struggle anymore. After all, he was dead. He escaped the cruel and unjust world. Daniel took a deep breath and heard another gut-wrenching scream. He looked around as his gaze turned cold. Episode 3 The Savior Bang! With the veins of his arms popped up, Dylan hacked at the pack of ants with all his might. The power of an entry-level warrior exploded in that instant and forced back the bloodthirsty, furious ants that were getting closer to the trenches in the front line. Such strength comes with its own consequences, as the heavy impact caused by a backlash to his own body. Collapsing into the trench, he ended up spitting out a mouthful of blood from exerting a force much greater than what his body could handle. Damn it! Ants, if you have the courage, come back to me! I'm not afraid of the likes of you, beasts. Dylan, whose beard was dyed crimson red with blood, laughed out loud in his final moments. In the trench behind Dylan, Steve was too covered in blood as he was barely pushed by the wave of ants. Steve currently had more than 30 wounds all over his body, the most severe injury being his broken right knee. If it wasn't for his strong willpower and determination, he would have long since collapsed from the sheer amount of pain and blood loss. Dylan, come back. Don't rush forward. It seems that the two of us will be left here to die this time. I'm not sure how many of those bloodthirsty furious ants we managed to hold back, but I hope that it'll be enough for most of our comrades to escape in one piece. Steve tried his best to stay alert as he gasped heavily for air. Captain, stop thinking about those things. You've done more than enough. Damn it, I hope those brats manage to escape this hell. Every single one of them signifies a life that we've saved. Since I have yet to lose my conscience, I will bear my hatred and vent my anger towards these stupid ants until I die. Even so, I, Dylan, am only a single man who can only do so much. I believe that I have already done my part. Stepping down on the head of one of the bloodthirsty, furious ants, he had long since put his life on the line to save as many of his comrades as possible. This single bloodthirsty, furious ant was killed by Dylan after putting his life on the line. Even as an entry-level warrior, he was still able to subdue that one ant despite being surrounded by dozens of others. If this was a normal situation, He would surely have bragged about his feats to the world nonstop. However, Dylan had made it clear to himself that this was it. Even if they had killed half the bloodthirsty, furious ants, there were still eight or nine of them remaining. It was already a miracle for an entry-level warrior and an intermediate warrior like Steve to resist for such a long time despite getting outnumbered and overwhelmed. No matter how arrogant Dylan was, He understood that this was the end for both of them. Damn you, little brat. Why didn't you just listen to me? I told you to run away, yet you stayed back with me in the end. Though we're going to meet our ends in this place, I will smack you on the head when we go on our way. Ugh, forget it. Dylan, help me up. Even if I meet my ends here... I will definitely not let this group of beasts get away with it. Steve cursed and coughed up even more blood. (coughs) As he stated, he was indeed struggling to stand back up on his two feet. In Steve's current injured state, despite possessing the physique of an intermediate warrior, he could not bear the massive amount of blood loss. Even then, he gritted his teeth and glared menacingly towards the remaining ants. If he were to die, he would go out in a valiant manner, not by lying helplessly on the ground. All right, Captain, let's go out with a bang. Dylan laughed loudly. Supporting Steve onto his feet, 
The two of them stood holding on to each other as blood dripped down the steel swords in their hands. One of them was out of strength, while the other was no longer capable of moving on his own. So, how could they possibly withstand the incoming barrage of attacks sent by the mutated beasts? At this moment, a few bloodthirsty, furious ants began crawling their way over. Just as Steve and Dylan were about to be shredded by the jaws of the ants, an explosive sound reverberated through the ground from behind. In that instance, one of the heads of the bloodthirsty, furious ants was decapitated cleanly as it fell back into the trench. Has an awakened practitioner come to save us? Dylan and Steve looked at each other and saw the glimpse of hope in each other's eyes. However, they began doubting that possibility. At this moment, the front lines were slowly being pushed back, and the remaining four awakened practitioners were facing the blood-devouring ants' overwhelming counterattacks. If they had all their attention set in that direction, how could they possibly have time to pay attention to the lives of the insignificant troops at the front lines? Even then, the only person capable of killing a bloodthirsty, furious ant with such ease would be none other than an awakened practitioner. Captain, it's that brat Daniel. That brat is back. What the hell? Didn't we already tell him to run far away? Does he think he could become a hero by coming back? Damn it, where is the awakened practitioner? And with his sharp eyes, Dylan could only see Daniel standing behind the bloodthirsty, furious ant. When he observed his surroundings, he did not catch any sights of an awakened practitioner. Thus, he could not help the matter. Daniel? Though Steve was confused upon seeing Daniel, he was in no state to question reality right now. Hearing how an awakened practitioner had come to rescue them, Steve subconsciously relaxed his tense nerves and fainted immediately. At this moment, Daniel had just arrived back at the trench. Damn it! Are you tired of living? I told you to run, yet you returned instead. Brat, do you not want to live anymore? Before Daniel had a chance to say anything, however, Dylan had already fumed in utmost anger and glared menacingly at him. He then slapped Daniel on his head and cursed angrily. Where is the awakened practitioner? Where is he? Awakened practitioner? Daniel was stunned for a moment before he asked in confusion. Of course, I'm looking for an awakened practitioner. Otherwise, why would you come back here to seek death? Which awakened practitioner came here? Why aren't there any traces of him? Dylan placed the unconscious Steve gently on the ground and asked in confusion. There is no awakened practitioner, Vice Captain. I came back here by myself, Daniel replied. Just you alone? Dylan's eyes widened when he heard his words. Then he thought of an unbelievable possibility and asked, Wait, are you saying that you were the one that killed that bloodthirsty, furious ant just now? How was this possible? Could, could it be that you have awakened? Dylan said as his hands trembled in disbelief. The chance to be an awakened practitioner was one in a million, since it is extremely difficult for one to awaken their gene chain. Generally, only intermediate or high-ranked warriors could awaken their gene chains. Although there were more than 10,000 people gathered at the Royal Mint, only a dozen or so of them were intermediate or high-ranked warriors. Thus, how could he believe that one of the soldiers who had just transferred over from the logistics team would awaken? This was undoubtedly a huge joke. I'm not too sure either, but I guess I can be counted as one. Get out of the way, be careful. Just as Daniel was about to explain himself, he noticed that bloodthirsty, furious ants were about to attack Dylan from behind. Reacting in time, he immediately pushed Dylan aside and rushed forward to fend off the attack. Clenching his fist tightly, he swung it with all his might. Bang! His fist struck out like thunder as the sound waves reverberated from the point of impact. Dylan felt down into the pit and did not even have the time to curse before witnessing the massacre before him. 
His eyes gaped wide open as he helplessly watched Daniel obliterate the bloodthirsty furious ants that could easily shred an entry-level warrior to pieces. With a single punch from Daniel, each of the ants exploded into multiple pieces and died in the worst possible way. One head. Two heads. Three heads. Uh, awakened? Dylan froze in place as he stared dumbfounded at Daniel. No matter what Dylan thought he was doing, Daniel simply threw the corpse of the bloodthirsty furious ant under his feet to extract its power. Extraction failed. Insufficient energy. Number of uses remaining, none. As expected. Daniel listened to the system's voice and shook his head helplessly. Without thinking too much, he brought Dylan and the unconscious Steve back to safety. With Daniel's current combat strength, the journey back was rather safe. No matter how many bloodthirsty furious ants tried to attack him, all of them faltered under Daniel's absolute strength. However, he was nonetheless panting from exhaustion before long. Before long, the three of them arrived back at the garrison's temporary campsite. Not long after the bloodthirsty furious ants appeared and attacked the team sent ahead, the superiors at the gathering ground gave them the order to retreat immediately. Under the brutality of the bloodthirsty furious ants, however, other than Daniel and the other two, the rest of the team members were all overwhelmed, outnumbered, and murdered, even though they were the ones who retreated first. As for the other teams, they suffered even more losses. From the 20 or so members who made up the smaller teams, only a few managed to escape alive. Thus, the camp was filled with a dejected atmosphere. As the smell of blood assaulted their nostrils, the once lively camp turned as lifeless as an abandoned village. Daniel roughly estimated that the exploration team alone lost at least 70% of their members. Even so, that was still an optimistic estimation. The fainted Steve was immediately sent to the medical area, while Dylan could only temporarily make his report on behalf of his captain. Daniel, on the other hand, sat alone in the corner as he carefully studied the extraction interface. Name, Daniel Wilson. Energy, zero points. Stamina, 17 points. Strength, 200 points. Spiritual force, six points. Gene chain talent, ant strength. Broken ant gene chain, 61% complete. His stamina increased by 10 points while his spiritual force has not changed much. The only thing that had increased by a tremendous amount was his strength, directly multiplying by 20 times. The strength was presumably the characteristic of the mutated ants. However, what Daniel cared more about was that the extraction process also had success rates. Although Daniel had set the extraction to 100% when he was cheating in-game, it was clear that the extraction interface was completely different from before resulting in some unexpected changes. Aside from his first success, Daniel had attempted on extracting three other times. However, he failed in all those three times. It was certainly a pity that the beast cores he had were limited and did not have that much energy. Thus, he had yet to determine the real success rate of the extraction. As expected, the gene chain isn't that easy to obtain. A success rate below 20% would be a headache for me, but after thinking about it, perhaps a success rate of 100% would be far too broken in this world. Daniel understood that clearly. The ability to extract genes was already a shocking matter in itself. Though ant genes were not strong, after he had successfully extracted them, he had nevertheless jumped from being a soldier that could only wait for his death under the jaws of an F-class mutated beast to having the power to overwhelm it. No matter how one looked at it, there was simply no need to elaborate further on how powerful the gene chain was. If the extraction really had a 100% success rate, Daniel would have to consider whether there were any other disadvantages or consequences. After all, there was no way a pie would fall from the heavens, let alone land on the same person continuously. However, 
Daniel's eyes glimmered in excitement. With the extraction interface in his possession, wouldn't he have the ability to establish his own foothold in this world by himself? Daniel thought to himself. At that moment, the entire camp suddenly settled down. The silent veterans around Daniel all stood up at the same time, each of them staring at the entrance of the camp. Daniel was stunned for a moment before he looked up and saw a dark-faced middle-aged man walk in from the entrance of the camp. Step he took. At this moment, he seemed as if he had just returned from a massacre. His shoulders and chest still stained with the blood and flesh of the bloodthirsty furious ant, which had added to his ferocity. Though he looked at the man from afar, Daniel's eyes throbbed in pain, as if the man's fierce aura was hurting him directly. The pressure this man emitted was clearly several times that of the bloodthirsty furious ant. We pay our respects to the commander. The veteran stood straight up and said in unison. At this point, it should be obvious that this man is the one in charge of the F-Class gathering around Royal Mint, William Rogers. Waving his hand to indicate for everyone to quiet down, he announced in a deep voice, the false intelligence we received from Texas has resulted in extremely heavy losses in the ranks of our gathering ground. The ten E-class mutated beasts that we discovered were far more powerful than the usual F-class mutated beasts we found in the lair. As a result, we have paid a huge price for that mistake. Although our Royal Mint Exploration Team, 27 squads totaling up to 540 people, had gone out all for this expedition, the death rate was more than 37%. Even one of our five awakened practitioners, James Palmer, sacrificed himself in a valiant manner to fend off the attacks of the mutated beasts. With a cold expression, William walked to the center of the camp with large and confident strides. Only then did he continue to speak. But this is the reality of war. Over the past thousand years, we humans have never given up, despite suffering countless defeats and losses from the mutated beasts. But one day, we will be able to return to the surface and regain the glory we once had a thousand years ago. As for the dead who have sacrificed their lives along the way, they will all be known as the heroes of the Royal Mint. Thus. We shall not retreat and falter in our advances. In this battle, the five awakened practitioners paid the price of one to kill three of the blood-devouring ants. Furthermore, we even have a comrade who has just awakened his gene chain. William's eyes lit up as he pointed in a specific direction with his finger. Daniel! Swish! All the veterans looked in the direction that William pointed towards and stared at Daniel, their eyes filled with reverence and eagerness. Daniel, you were born a soldier and had your genes awakened during the most recent battle. You have become the sixth awakened practitioner of the Royal Mint and will assist in filling up the vacancies in the F-Class gathering ground. Now, a round of applause for our sixth awakened practitioner, Daniel. God bless the Royal Mint. Although William's voice was not loud, it nonetheless possessed the unique power of calming the hearts of others. With just those few words, Daniel could feel that the depressing atmosphere in the camp was gradually changing, perhaps due to the trust others had for their leader, William. With that, William relieved everyone from the meeting before walking towards Daniel. Daniel, you're not bad. Follow me. When William signaled Daniel to follow him, he hesitated for a moment before giving in to his order. Before long, the two of them stopped in front of the barracks. At this moment, there were already three people waiting inside the barracks. While all of them were dressed in gray battle uniforms, each respective person had distinct features and differing personalities. The first person was a muscular man who stood tall and sturdy like an iron tower. The second was a seemingly refined young man with glasses, 
while the last was an extremely charming and beautiful woman. Seeing that William had returned, the three of them stood up immediately and made way for him. There's no need for you guys to stand up to greet me. Just remain in your seats. Daniel, come, let me introduce you. These three are the other awakened practitioners in the gathering ground. The one beside you is called Aaron Smith, an awakened practitioner specializing in the element of wind. Furthermore, he has already activated two and a half of his gene chains. After William finished speaking, the youth tipped his spectacles up and snorted arrogantly without making any unnecessary movements. Just as Daniel was about to speak, William waved his hand and introduced the next person. This lady over here is Krista Russell. Awakening the superhuman gene that specializes in poison, she had also activated two gene chains. Although she may be a lady, allow me to remind you how she has a rather unique type of gene chain and is ranked in the top three strongest fighters of our gathering ground. Commander, stop exaggerating. I'm not as incredible as you say. You must be Daniel, right? You must act more intimate with your sister from now on. Krista spoke with her scarlet red lips, looking extremely alluring. William shook his head and was about to introduce the sturdy man. My name is Zeke Adams, possessing the ancestral gene known as the Big Yellow Ape. I too have awakened two gene chains. I mean, just look through the report, your name is Daniel, right? Your awakened gene chain should be similar to mine. Zeke burst into a series of laughter so loud that even the tiles on the ground of the camp began to tremble. He reached out his hand towards Daniel's hand, and grasping him with the utmost strength, they shook their hands. Daniel could feel Zeke tighten his grip, seemingly strong enough to crush a rock. In response, Daniel subconsciously used 50% of his strength to barely resist him. It looks like the gene chain that little brother Daniel awakened is quite extraordinary. Wonder what kind of gene it is. This is the first time Big Sister has met a newly awakened practitioner who was able to withstand this brute strength. It seems that you are much more capable than Aaron. Back then, Aaron's face twisted in pain while his hands were bruised. Krista covered her mouth and laughed. Ugh. Aaron snorted, appearing not to get along with Krista at all. Not bad indeed. William nodded in satisfaction. Zeke was a straightforward person who would never lie. To be able to withstand Zeke's strength having just awakened is certainly no easy feat. No matter how extraordinary your gene chain is, we will still have to run some tests to know the specifications of your abilities. Daniel, come over here and put your finger on this. This is the hexagonal crystal that has been harvested from the Earth's core. It possesses the ability to test the type of gene chain in an awakened practitioner. Go on and try it. William took out a purple hexagonal crystal and said, Daniel followed William's instructions and pressed his finger to the side of the crystal. Following that, a dim red light gradually lit up in the crystal that he pressed down on. He did not understand anything that was happening. William, on the other hand, twitched his eyebrows as he could not believe his eyes. It's only the most basic superhuman gene chain? William's brows tightened. With the existence of spiritual energy, all living things would receive an opportunity to evolve at some point. As for the human body, there were hundreds of thousands of gene chains inside, and by awakening, any one of those a human could become an awakened practitioner. However, there are many types of gene chains unique to each awakened practitioner, which could be divided into five main categories. The five main types include superhuman gene, natural gene, ancestral gene, special gene, and unknown gene. Furthermore, each gene chain has its own differences in potential and strength. Starting from the weakest gene is the superhuman gene, ancestral gene, natural gene, and finally, special gene. As for the unknown gene, humans could not determine the potential of such genes. Due to the uniqueness of certain unknown genes, it could most of the time not be identified. 
Since Daniel was already able to withstand the attack of Zeke, even though he had just awakened his gene chain, everyone anticipated his gene chain to be somehow related to the superhuman gene. However, everyone thought that Daniel's superhuman gene would at least be in the intermediate or even higher tier. Now that the results show that he possessed the most basic level gene, everyone could not help but let out a disappointed frown. Seeing his results, Daniel was also stunned for a moment. When he thought about it again, however, his disappointment quickly subsided. After all, the bloodthirsty furious ant was simply a mere insect before the discovery of the spiritual spirit. Even then, they were still one of the weakest creatures among the mutated beasts. Though they were able to lift objects ten times heavier than themselves due to their species' characteristics, they were still far too weak when compared to other beasts. Besides, with the extraction system in its possession, what is there to be afraid of? From the other's perspective, however, Daniel had undoubtedly displayed a rather disappointing performance. Don't be too discouraged. Although the basic superhuman gene won't offer much in terms of improvement, you might be able to open up other types of gene chains in the future. Furthermore, even the lowest level of superhuman gene is nevertheless another step closer to activating your bloodline after awakening 10 gene chains total in the future. As William's facial expression returned to normal, he patted Daniel on the shoulder and encouraged him. Many thanks to the commander. I will definitely work hard to meet your expectations, Daniel replied. Hearing his response, William did not say anything. The superhuman gene was already the weakest among the five main gene chains, let alone the most basic superhuman gene. Although awakened practitioners could awaken even more gene chains, only the most talented practitioners would be able to do so. As for activating ten gene chains, there was simply no such news of anyone achieving that feat yet. It is good that you know how to work hard. The current you is no longer one of the mere soldiers that were gathered at the meeting place previously. You are now one of the five great awakened practitioners of the Royal Mint. Since you have just awakened, however, there are still many things that need to be tested regarding your abilities. Your progress as an awakened practitioner will ultimately be decided by how much effort you put into your training. William continued to encourage Daniel as he explained. According to the regulations, awakened practitioners can obtain a set of F-class gene drugs, capable of reducing the side effects of activating your gene chain and increasing the effectiveness of your gene chain by more than 20%. Daniel simply stood there dumbfounded and remained silent. Commander, I disagree with your decision. Aaron, who had not spoken for a long time, interrupted the conversation and imparted his objection immediately. Congrats! You have earned one coin. Episode 5 Heated Arguments Hearing his objections, William frowned and was rather cross. In the Royal Mint's gathering ground, the commander held a very high position and could practically determine a person's fate. After all, those in the position of power were usually the ones who possessed the greatest strength. Furthermore, according to the rules, all newly awakened practitioners would be able to obtain gene drugs from their respective gathering ground. Similarly, Aaron had gotten it when he first awakened a few years ago. Although Daniel seemed to only possess a basic superhuman gene chain, there was no exception to that one rule. Thus, William did not see a problem with presenting him a gene drug, nor did he show any form of bias towards him. Do you object? William asked. Yes, I do indeed object, Commander. I feel that based on the current situation, giving all the F-class gene drug to Daniel would not improve the situation whatsoever. After all, there are still seven blood-devouring ants in the lair of the E-class bloodthirsty furious ant. On the other hand, I believe that giving the gene drug to me would be most sensible. Aaron glanced at Daniel and snorted. At the moment, 
My third gene chain has reached 71% completion. If you give that bottle of F-class gene drug to me, I might be able to fully awaken my third gene chain and even proceed to awaken the fourth. Thus, it would be best if you gave it to me instead. If my fighting strength increases by several folds, I will perhaps be able to contribute to our survival in this crisis. It would be better to let him wait for another month to get his first gene drug. After all, we can easily exchange the corpse of the blood-devouring amps for more gene drugs in Texas. It will certainly not be too late to give it to him then. His third gene chain was 71% to completion? Krista and Zeke looked at each other and noticed the astonishment in each other's eyes. By activating all ten gene chains, one could unlock the gene lock, which would then condense into the bloodline. Moreover, with each activation of one's gene chain, their combat strength would naturally increase accordingly. The activation of the third gene chain indicated how Aaron took yet another step closer towards the activation of his bloodline. Not only would his combat prowess increase tremendously, but his understanding of his elemental abilities would also be much more proficient. Gene drugs could indeed strengthen the foundation of an awakened practitioner's gene chain as it possessed the effect of directly upgrading one's gene chain. Apart from that, it even has the possibility of triggering the gene chain in that of ordinary people with a measly 1% success rate. In a gathering ground, gene drugs were strategic resources. However, Everyone knew that the newly awakened gene chain in Daniel's body was currently in an unstable state. Therefore, he urgently needed the gene drug to stabilize it. This was also the exact reason for such a rule. Now that Aaron wanted to snatch it away from him, what could Daniel possibly do? That is why I object to giving the gene drug to Daniel. Hearing that, William's expression sank even more. Rules are rules. You can't change the rules just because you want to break through. Even he may have the worst possible gene chain as an awakened practitioner. He will not be treated any different from anyone in this room. Ignoring Aaron's unreasonable request, William took out a light red test tube from his pocket and threw it to Daniel. Aaron's face turned green. Turning back around, he stared menacingly at Daniel before taking his leave. Aaron is someone who remembers his grudges, so you have to be careful. I will go first, but remember to come play with me sometimes. Krista's breath tickled Daniel's ear in a soft yet alluring manner. With a light sniff, Daniel could smell the fragrance being emitted from her body. With that... Krista left him behind, pondering at her unexpected teases. An evil succubus, Daniel cursed silently. Soon after, Zeke also took his leave. At this moment, only Daniel and William were left in the barracks. It was obvious that Commander William's refusal of Aaron's request has resulted in this sullen atmosphere. Daniel held the gene drug with the desire to cry. Damn, I don't need this gene drug at all. Daniel spoke to himself. On the other hand, what Daniel needed urgently was a large amount of beast cores. Commander, this gene drug... Daniel hesitated as he opened his mouth to speak, wondering if he could use gene drug to exchange for some beast cores. After all... This gene drug was worthless to him when compared to the beast cores. However, before he could even finish his sentence, William waved his hand to dismiss his words. There is no need for you to say any more. Since I've already given it to you, it's now yours to keep. The rule is absolute, and there won't be any exceptions. As for Aaron, you don't have to worry about him. With me here, no one will be able to make things difficult for you. Although William did not say much more, his words nevertheless flickered with a great sense of courage and an undesigned resolve. Um, Commander? 
I just wanted to ask whether I could trade this gene drug for some beast cores, or could I possibly sell it to someone else instead? Daniel smiled coyly. You want to sell it? Well, you certainly have the freedom to do so, but... William was clearly taken aback as he did not expect Daniel to ask such a question. Similar to the gene drug, Beast Cores does indeed contain a certain amount of gene energy. For an ordinary soldier, they would usually absorb the energy from those cores to cultivate and improve themselves as warriors. For awakened practitioners, on the other hand, the amount of gene energy from a Beast Core is simply too little compared to that of a gene drug. William pondered for a moment before continuing. I suggest you do not do that. Much less the value of the gene drug far surpassing that of an F-class beast core by as much as a hundred folds. The benefits gained from the gene drug cannot be compared with mere numbers. Since you have just awakened your gene chain, however, you ought to pay careful attention when using it. Otherwise, you might damage your gene chain, which may even result in death. That was one of the reasons why I rejected Aaron's request. If you really want to sell it, however, I will be more than happy to assist you by asking Aaron. Knowing how much he wants to break through, he would certainly not reject that offer of yours. William shot a meaningful glance at Daniel before nodding and walking out of the barracks. As the commander of the gathering place, William had said more than enough for today. Whether Daniel adhered to his words was ultimately up to him. Since he was determined in selling the gene drug for Beast Corps, William did not see the need to interfere with his personal matters. Daniel twitched his mouth. If he could use his extraction abilities to solve the problem, then nothing else would pose much of an issue to him. After all, he knew how to utilize his trump card. With that, Daniel walked out of the barracks. Sir? The moment he stepped out, a voice suddenly sounded from the side. Looking in that direction, it was obvious that whoever was waiting for him outside the barracks must have been there for quite some time. Daniel looked up and found it rather ironic. This person was none other than the vice captain of Daniel's previous team, Dylan. Looking like a wrapped up dumpling, it was obvious that Dylan had just finished bandaging himself up. Furthermore, he found Dylan's docile nature to be quite amusing as he no longer wore the appearance of the bandit, just like when they had first met each other. Vice Captain, what are you doing here? Daniel asked casually. Sir, please don't call me that. How can I still be your vice captain? You are now one of the practitioners of the gathering ground, one of the five great lords. If word of this gets out, then I would certainly lose all face. Dylan's expression changed as he quickly replied. The awakened practitioners stood as the symbol of a gathering ground. Furthermore, they acted as its pillars of support, ultimately allowing for the group's survival. Compared to Daniel, who had just awakened, Dylan was a mere vice captain of the exploration team in the Royal Mint. While Daniel could kill a bloodthirsty furious ant at his will, Dylan would have to risk his life just to take one down with him. The gap between them was far too big for Daniel to refer to him as vice captain. Thus, Dylan took his steps with the utmost care not caring to make any mistakes that would cost him his reputation. This... Daniel was utterly speechless. Judging from Dylan's behavior, however, he understood the situation and could only slightly agree with his remarks. Right. How is Captain Steve? Reporting to my lord, the captain is unfortunately not doing well. Dylan's composed expression turned glum at the instant, as he sighed and shook his head. Since he's only an intermediate warrior, the injuries he suffered are far too severe for his ability to recover. Before I arrived to assist him, he had already taken down eight or nine bloodthirsty furious ant. In addition to his bleeding artery, he is simply unable to withstand the rest of his injuries, even with an intermediate warrior's physique. 
I... I'm afraid he's not going to make it. Dylan's expression was morose. Having worked and fought alongside each other for the past years, the two of them had agreed to walk down the path the river sticks together when faced with death. Unexpectedly, Daniel made his move and allowed the two of them to escape the grasp of the Grim Reaper. Despite managing to survive that ordeal with great difficulty, Captain Steve was still standing on the verge of death's door. Is he really not going to make it? Taken aback by that piece of news, Daniel rushed to the medical sector immediately with Dylan. Dylan was not exaggerating, as Steve was indeed flashing between life and death. In order to buy time for his comrades to escape, he rushed forward without fear and even managed to take down eight or nine bloodthirsty, furious ants. But to do so, he resorted to fighting in a double-edged manner. Consequently, he broke one of his legs and had even caused severe bleeding in his arteries. Even if he managed to last until Daniel arrived, his life would still be hanging by a thread. If it weren't for the great abundance of spiritual spirit lingering in the air today, Steve would have probably already been dead. But even so, it seemed that he could no longer hold on. Is there really no hope? Daniel asked while grabbing one of the paramedics by his shoulders. Reporting to my lord, we really did our best. Even with the blood transfusion, the amount of blood loss was far too great. In addition, certain parts of his body had long since shut down due to the lack of blood, which led to the collapse of his genes. Even if we use every method in the book, he still wouldn't be able to recover from such severe injuries. The deputy chief paramedic explained as he walked over towards Daniel. Is there really nothing else they can do? Although Daniel did not know a single thing about treating people, he, from the bottom of his heart, did not want Steve to die. Regardless of what the paramedics told him, Daniel was still unwilling to witness the scene of Steve's death. The deputy chief paramedic sighed heavily and said, Sir, my deepest condolences. It's impossible for him to survive such severe injuries. Unless... Congrats! You have earned two coins. Episode 6. The Gamble Unless what? In a moment of surprise, Daniel grabbed the deputy chief paramedic by his arm. Forgetting about his overwhelming strength, however, Daniel almost ended up breaking the deputy's arm with a mere grasp, even though he was also an intermediate warrior. At that instant, the deputy's face turned bleach pale. Sweat rolled down his face as he almost cried out in pain. I'm so sorry. I was just stirred by your previous words. Daniel quickly let go of his arm. No, please, don't apologize. Gritting his teeth, the deputy simply endured the pain. After all, how could a mere deputy possibly accept the apology of an awakened practitioner? Sir, there's actually another way of saving him, but all odds are against him. Old Steve and I have known each other for the longest time. Despite only being intermediate warriors, our physiques are in no way inferior to that of high-level warriors. If he manages to awaken his gene chain at this moment and become an awakened practitioner, he would surely be able to turn the tide of his fate, the vice captain said helplessly. It was said that the best time to awaken one's gene chain is during the period between life and death. Even so, how could it possibly be that simple to do so? During the previous major battle in the Royal Mint, more than 37% of soldiers had died and countless more were injured. Despite that, only one who managed to awaken was Daniel. Awakening? Hearing that, Daniel was also stunned. At this moment, Daniel suddenly recalled the gene drug he had in his pocket. According to Sir William, it possessed a hundred times more gene energy than a normal beast core. Therefore, Daniel immediately asked, If we inject a gene drug into him, 
Would it be more likely for him to awaken his gene chain? Gene drug? When Dylan heard what Daniel said, he stared at Daniel in disbelief. Does my lord have a gene drug? The commander had just given me one. Daniel said, and took out the tube of gene drug from his pocket. Even though the gene drug, light red in color, did not look impressive on the surface, it nonetheless contained more gene energy than a few hundred beast cores combined. I... I don't know either, but an F-class gene drug should give the captain a greater chance of awakening his gene chain. After all, he is an intermediate warrior. Dylan carefully received the gene drug, a trace of greed gradually rising in his heart. If he could obtain the gene drug, then he could possibly become an awakened practitioner himself. When he thought of Captain Steve, however, his greedy thoughts were quickly suppressed. But in the terrible condition that the captain is in right now, he might not be able to withstand the intense energy from the gene drug. Just give him the injection, Daniel said without any hesitation. Sir, are you sure you want to do this? Dylan asked again with a serious expression. This gene drug is also important to you. If the captain fails to survive even after this, you will suffer a heavy loss. Just do the injection. Daniel waved his hand and said resolutely. Captain Steve was his father's friend. Even though it was a dangerous battlefield, Captain Steve still tried to protect him, which touched Daniel's heart. In any case, the gene drug would be useless to him, anyways with his ability to extract genes from others. As long as he got his hands on a steady supply of beast cores, Daniel's strength would certainly be limitless, more effective than any gene drug he would ever find. Dylan's heart trembled after hearing his resolve. He never thought that Daniel would be willing to use such a precious gene drug to save Captain Steve's life, to think that he would gamble on that chance even if all odds were against him. When the two of them arrived at the entrance of the ICU, they saw Steve, who was wrapped in bandages and filled with tubes to prevent him from dying. At this point, he even needed to rely on the help of the ventilator to help him breathe. Vice Captain Dillon, we have already done our best, but Captain Steve's injuries are just too severe. He will forever be known as a hero. Seeing Dillon's arrival, the medical staff revealed a pained expression and said with great regret. Judging from the opinions of others, Steve was quite popular in the camp. Even the eyes of the nurses in the room were red from weeping. After all, these people were once protected by Captain Steve. Open the door. We have a way to treat Captain Steve. Daniel analyzed the room for a while and said firmly. At this point, Daniel had no other options available to him. Even if the gene drug could not guarantee Steve's awakening, he was nevertheless in danger right now. In this moment of desperation, this was the only thing he could do to save him. How is that possible? When the medical staff heard this, they were all taken aback. Captain Steve's injuries are too severe. Even through their use of rare medications, we could only delay the time of his inevitable death. What can you even do to save him? Presumptuous of you to talk such nonsense to an awakened practitioner. Just hurry up and open the door. Vice Captain exclaimed with a cold expression. When the medical personnel heard that Daniel was actually an awakened practitioner, they were even more shocked. Who could blame them? This was the first time he'd seen such a young awakened practitioner. When the others nearby heard this, they also looked at Daniel in surprise. In their eyes, the title of an awakened practitioner was far beyond their reach. Thus, they saw him as someone chosen by the gods themselves. Why, haven't I seen him before then? The medical staff muttered as they unwillingly opened the door to the ICU. Right at this moment, a strong gust of wind surged through the room as a figure descended from the sky and appeared before everyone. It was Aaron. Daniel, the gene drug was not given to you to waste on useless trash, but to instead enhance the strength of the entire camp. Aaron 
came in front of Daniel with a cold and handsome face. He stretched out his hand and said, If you don't want to use it, then just give it to me. Ah, it's awakened practitioner Aaron. Why is he here? What did he just say? Gene drug? Does Lord Awakened Practitioner intend to use Gene Drug to save Captain Steve? If so, the captain can possibly be saved. When the nurses around them heard Aaron's words, they immediately became excited as they pierced the puzzle together. Although they had never seen a Gene Drug before, they had nevertheless heard how valuable an item it was. The gene drug was a precious treasure that even the awakened practitioners would long for. If it was injected into Captain Steve, there would definitely be hope for him to survive. But it was just a big gamble. What did you say? Daniel focused his gaze menacingly at Aaron. Didn't you hear me? I told you to hand over the gene drug. Don't waste it on such trash. Or do you want me to take it by force instead? Aaron said coldly as a hint of disdain flashed across his eyes. Captain Steve is not some useless trash. After hearing Aaron insult his captain time and time again, Dylan could not help but stand up and retort. You are not in a position to interrupt. Trash like you should just stay put. Aaron let out a cold sneer. Suddenly, he clapped his hands as a strong gust of wind blew against Dylan. At that moment, Dylan was sent flying away as if he received a heavy blow. Ugh! Vice Captain Dylan! When the medical staff saw this scene, they all cried out in alarm. How dare you! Daniel's heart fumed in anger while his eyes were bloodshot with killing intent. What is it? Do you still want to fight me? A mere child who has just awakened and has not even used a gene drug is no different from trash. Do you still intend to use the gene drug to save such a worthless person? What an idiot. Aren't you afraid of your gene chain turning unstable and causing you to collapse? Aaron said in disgust. A newly awakened practitioner? If an awakened practitioner does not use a gene drug, then his strength would not be much different from a normal human being. Although Sir Aaron's words are unpleasant to hear, he does speak of the truth. The precious gene drug must be used on the awakened practitioners to guarantee the safety of the camp. It would just be a waste to give it to Captain Steve. If they really start fighting, I'm afraid that this little brother won't even be able to withstand a single hit from Aaron. When the surrounding people heard that Daniel was a newly awakened practitioner, they all looked at him with a bizarre expression. Having awakened three gene chains and produced outstanding achievements in battle as an awakened practitioner, Aaron naturally had a greater reputation in the gathering ground than Daniel. Episode 7 Face Off Vice Captain Dillon, are you okay? Daniel quickly inquired about Dylan's current state. I'm... I'm fine, Lord Daniel. Don't fight him. You're not his opponent. Daniel said with a weak voice. Having already suffered heavy injuries from the last battle, his injuries, although treated, had clearly resurfaced after being sent flying back by Aaron's attack. Aaron. At that instant... Daniel recalled the moment Steve and Dylan had fearlessly rushed towards the horde of bloodthirsty furious ants to buy time for their comrades to escape. Daniel could not tolerate abandoning after just because they had suffered major injuries from their heroic deeds. Lord Daniel, don't be rash, Dylan exclaimed. Since you are not willing to hand over the gene drug, then I will snatch it from you with my own hands. Seeing how Daniel still did not have any intention to give him the gene drug, Aaron could not hold himself back anymore. As long as he obtained this tube of gene drug, he would be able to complete his third gene chain and even successfully awaken his fourth gene chain, thus increasing his strength tremendously. At that time, even Commander William would not be able to hold him back anymore. Furthermore, he would be able to leave this small gathering ground and move to an even greater city. With that, 
Aaron made his move immediately. Enhancing his movements with a gush of wind, he rushed towards Daniel at an extremely fast pace. Ha! Ah, the awakened practitioners are fighting! That young lad is surely going to suffer. How can a newly awakened practitioner be a match for Lord Aaron? A newborn cub looking to face an adult lion? He's simply overestimating himself and looking for trouble. When the people of the surrounding campsite saw Aaron take action, they immediately retreated far away, afraid of getting caught in the battle. After all, a battle between awakened practitioners was not something that ordinary humans like them could get themselves involved in. Since Aaron had awakened three gene chains dealing with the wind element, he could already control the wind with great familiarity and authority. Every completed gene chain would give Aaron an additional skill. Thus, he currently possessed two different skills of the wind element. On the other hand, Daniel had not even completed his first gene chain. Not to mention his strength, he was clearly much weaker than Aaron. With his lack of strength and abilities, he was simply powerless when it came to facing Aaron. This would certainly be a one-sided battle. Despite Aaron's attack, Daniel stood on the spot without moving at all. Has he already given up? I guess it's true that he has no way of resisting against Lord Aaron. If he knew his limits, then why did he still ask for trouble? Why didn't he hand the gene drug over to Lord Aaron earlier? They're about to come into contact. Amidst the whispers of the surrounding crowd, it seemed like they had already pictured the scene of Daniel being blown away by Aaron. Captain! When Dylan saw this scene, his eyes were filled with despair. If Daniel were to inject the precious gene drug into Steve, then there might be a chance for Steve to awaken his gene chain and even have a slim chance of survival. However, this slim chance of survival was also about to be taken away. Thus, Dylan could only resent himself for being powerless. I'll let you know what true strength is. Aaron dashed in front of Daniel and threw a punch towards his chest. Being an arrogant, self-righteous person, Aaron did not see the need to use one of his skills to deal with a newbie who had just awakened. By defeating Daniel without the use of his skills, it would certainly teach him a good lesson. At this precise moment, Daniel made his moves. With his eyes wide open, a bloodthirsty look flashed across them. Go to hell, Daniel shouted. Without saying anything flashy, he threw out a punch of his own. At that moment, the two fists collided as a great force reverberated through the air, causing all things to tremble. Bang! ka -cha. A muffled sound resounded, followed by a loud crack of one's bone. Under everyone's gazes, Aaron was sent flying like a kite with its string cut. Ah, my hand! Collapsing on the ground and letting out a blood-curdling screech, Aaron curled up on the ground as he lost this ability and strength to continue fighting. <gasps> Everyone present was stupefied as their eyes gaped with strong sense of shock. They could not help but suck in a breath of cold air as they looked at Daniel, who had yet to move in disbelief. Having accomplished many remarkable achievements and killed dozens of bloodthirsty furious ants with utmost confidence, Aaron had made a name for himself as one of the strongest awakened practitioners in their gathering ground. Yet today, he was actually defeated by a newly awakened practitioner. Furthermore, he had only used a single punch. This, this. Dylan was shocked speechless as he stared at Daniel with his wide-opened eyes. When he was saved by Daniel on the hellish battlefield, Dylan had clearly witnessed the extraordinary one-sided massacre of his battle against the bloodthirsty furious ants. However, those bloodthirsty furious ants were surely nothing when compared to Aaron, a genuine, awakened practitioner. Even then, Daniel actually defeated him with one mere punch. After hearing the loud commotion, William finally arrived at the entrance of the medical center. 
William, Daniel crippled my hand. It's all your fault. Why didn't you give me the gene drug? Aaron looked at William and screamed hysterically with a twisted face due to the immense pain. Daniel, what is going on? William glanced at Aaron before turning to Daniel and asked. William was also taken aback by the results of this battle. Although he also hated Aaron as a person, there was no doubt about Aaron's strength. But Daniel actually managed to defeat Aaron? At this point, he really could not see through Daniel. Reporting to the commander, Aaron wanted to snatch the gene drug away from me. Attacking him was merely an act of self-defense. Daniel said calmly, What a clown! How dare that bastard engage in close combat with me when I have extracted the genes of a bloodthirsty furious ant and possessed 200 points in strength? Daniel thought in his heart. Although his gene chain had not been fully developed, it still did not stop Daniel from unleashing the full strength of the bloodthirsty furious ant. Awakened practitioners, who specialized in elemental power like Aaron, were simply a bunch of brittle creatures before he awakened his gene chains and filled his body with elemental energy. Is that true? William's gaze shifted to Aaron. He's talking nonsense. Daniel wanted to give his gene drug to some piece of trash. To waste such a valuable item would be considered taboo. When I tried to stop him, he attacked me by surprise and crippled my hand. Standing back up on his two feet, Aaron covered his fractured hand as he said with a ferocious expression. When the surrounding people heard this, they looked at Aaron with utter disgust. To think that the guilty would actually plead innocent. Despicable. Dylan could not help but curse aloud and defend Daniel. Commander, it was Aaron who attacked first. Daniel was only trying to defend himself. Since the gene drug has already been given to me, it now belongs to me. How I use it has nothing to do with you. If you dare come at me again, I will not hesitate to cripple your legs next time. Daniel squinted his eyes. Instead of hesitating in William's presence, he asserted his dominance as he spoke. Lord Daniel, so manly. He's so strong. To dare act so arrogantly in front of the commander. Lord Daniel is the innocent one. He was doing everything he could to save Captain Steve. Hearing Daniel's words, the surrounding crowd burst into a massive uproar, all of them deeply affected by Daniel's bold attitude. Episode 8. Miracle Yes, the gene drug belongs to you. No one will be able to tell you how or what to use it for. However, you have nonetheless disturbed the camp's order and even injured one of your comrades. You better come meet me and receive your punishment after you finish dealing with your affairs. William said with a stern expression. From the perspective of the bystanders, it sounded like he was going to punish Daniel. In reality, on the other hand, he was actually being biased towards him. Only when the time came would William decide whether or not there would be a punishment for Daniel. After Aaron heard what William said, he left without saying a word, his face gloomy while his eyes lit in flames. With that, Daniel and Dylan entered the ICU and walked to Steve's bedside. Uncle Steve, you have to make it through this. Daniel prayed with all his might for Steve in his heart and injected the gene drug into Steve. The light red drug entered Steve through his veins, causing his body to become boiling hot. Ugh. Suddenly, the unconscious Steve let out a muffled grunt. His face revealed a pained expression as the medical equipment sounded the alarm, indicating that something had gone wrong. Not good. The energy from the gene drug is overwhelming his body. Captain Steve's body can't take much more of it. Dylan exclaimed. Vice Captain Dylan, do you have any beast cores on you right now? If so, hurry up and give it to me. Daniel frowned and said to Dylan. Although he did not know what Daniel was going to do, Dylan still gave him all the beast cores he had. There were a total of seven of them. 
Daniel took the beast cores and instantly swallowed it, gaining a total of 700 energy. Gene extraction. Resorting to the use of gene extraction, Daniel hoped that it would have some sort of effect on him. Not only could gene extraction be used on monsters, but it could be also used on humans. Extraction failed. Daniel's gaze remained calm as he continued extracting. Extraction failed. Extraction failed. After failing five times in a row, the pain on Steve's face became even more intense. His vitality was rapidly decreasing, and the device indicating his heart rate was beeping at an increasingly shorter interval. Captain! Dylan shouted in despair. Gene extraction. Extraction successful. Suddenly, a wave of gene energy was forcibly extracted from Steve's body by Daniel. Name, Daniel Wilson. Energy, 100 points. Stamina, 20 points. Strength, 202 points. Spiritual force, 8 points. Daniel looked through his stats after the extraction. His stamina had increased by 3 points and strength by 2 points and spiritual force by 2 points. Since Steve was just an intermediate warrior, even if the extraction did succeed, the growth in his stats would be very limited. As long as Steve could be saved, however, that would be more than enough. As expected, after Daniel succeeded in extracting the gene energy, the pain on Steve's face immediately alleviated as the rest of his body returned back to a normal state. Captain, Captain, how are you? Dylan hurriedly asked when he saw how Captain Steve had miraculously calmed down. Water, water. As Steve slowly opened his eyes, his cracked lips moved slightly as he spoke in a hoarse and weak voice. At his request, the paramedics immediately brought in a special nutritional water. Half an hour later, Steve's condition had completely stabilized while his physical strength was also recovering rapidly. Captain, how are you feeling now? Dylan looked at Steve excitedly. Better than ever. Of course, it would be nice if my leg was still here. <laughs> Having almost fully recovered, Steve said cheerfully, I'm beyond satisfied now. Not only did I survive, but I have also awakened. That's right. Steve had indeed awakened, and Steve surviving such an event was no less than a miracle. Although it was also a rather weak superhuman gene chain, Steve was already more than happy to be able to keep his life. It's all thanks to Lord Daniel this time. It was him who injected the gene drug into you and helped you awaken successfully. Dylan said with reddened eyes. What? A gene drug? Steve was stupefied upon hearing those words. As an intermediate warrior, he naturally knew how precious a gene drug was, let alone to an awakened practitioner. Daniel, you, you silly brat! Steve sighed. Uncle Steve, your survival is more important than anything else. I don't need that thing. Daniel smiled. What if I didn't make it? You took too much of a risk, Steve said with fear still lingering in his heart. To think that Daniel actually used something as valuable as the gene drug in an attempt to save him despite knowing the risks. It would be a lie to say that he was not moved. Uncle Steve, what kind of gene did you awaken? Daniel asked, seeing how Steve's body had returned to a stable state. Come, come closer. Steve built up the suspense and waved to Daniel. Daniel came to Steve's side and saw Steve's eyes emitting a gray light. Suddenly, Daniel immediately felt as if some weight had appeared above him and was weighing him down. Gravity field. Thump. Dylan was completely caught off guard and directly collapsed to the ground. Only after Daniel got used to the gravity weighing him down was he able to move around freely. With his strength as his greatest ability right now, a mere increase in gravity would not hinder his movements whatsoever. Superhuman gene, gravity field. Steve retracted his ability and smiled. Unfortunately, the range of the gravity field is too small, 
so its usage will be very limited. There's no such thing as a trash gene, only trash users. Uncle Steve, I believe in your abilities, Daniel said. Daniel, what sort of gene did you awaken for you not to be affected by my gravity field? Steve laughed bitterly as he said in astonishment. I also awakened a superhuman gene that increased my strength up by a little bit. There's nothing else to do. Daniel answered casually. Everyone mistakenly thought that Daniel's gene was just a normal superhuman gene. Since that was the case, Daniel thought that he might take advantage of that situation and keep his abilities low-key. After William heard the news, he rushed over again, seeing Steve's energetic look. William's usually solemn face suddenly revealed a look of shock. He did not expect this outcome either. Not only did Steve survive, but he had even successfully awakened with the help of the gene drug. God bless my royal mint. William closed his eyes and said a prayer. Within a short span of one day, two more awakened practitioners have actually appeared at the royal mint gathering ground. Even with William's usual composed self, he could not help but get a bit excited from such pleasant news. Captain Steve. Placing his hand on Steve's shoulder, he said with a trace of joy in his cold face, Welcome back. Commander, everything is thanks to Daniel. He was the one who used something as valuable as the gene drug to save my life and help me awaken my genes. Steve quickly added as a way of supporting Daniel. I know. To save you, Daniel even had to cripple Aaron's hand, William said. Huh? Steve was dumbfounded. After listening to the sequence of events, not only was Steve shocked, but a trace of emotion also flashed across his eyes. To save him, Daniel did not even hesitate to fight with an awakened practitioner who had awakened three gene chains. What was even more unexpected was that he actually won. Commander, since I have added an awakened practitioner to our camp, should you give me some sort of reward? How does a few hundred beast cores sound? Despite already making the bargain, Daniel still acted as if he was some sort of poor kid. Huh. I didn't come looking for you regarding the matter of you beating up your comrades. Yet, you still have the nerve to ask me for a reward. William snorted. I didn't beat him up. I was just defending myself. Daniel rolled his eyes. Episode 9 Expedition Despite further negotiations, Daniel only managed to bargain for a total of 10 beast cores from William. Angry at how he could not get more, Daniel secretly called him a cheapskate. Even so, the 10 beast cores turned into 1,000 energy points and entered Daniel's body. After accumulating the statistics, they realized that the Royal Mint was barely holding on in its current state. Not only did many people die or get injured, but the camp itself was in dire need of medicine. The next day, William gathered all the awakened practitioners and sent them on a mission. The main goal of this mission is to gather as much medicine as we can in this short time. Each person will be in charge of a small group of soldiers. William went straight to the point. I will give everyone the whole day to do so. No matter how much you end up finding, just make sure to return by the end of the day. William then took out a map that showed the surrounding areas of the camp, separated into four different sections, A, B, C, and D. There is a high probability of finding the specific type of medicine in each of the four areas marked. Each person will lead a small team and head to their assigned areas as to collect them. William pointed at the four areas on the map and said, Texas's replenishment rate for our camp is far too slow. If we sit still and do nothing, only death awaits us in the end. Furthermore, there are still a lot of injured people waiting to be treated. Area A is mine, 
Aaron spoke first with a vexed expression. At this moment, his hand was still wrapped in bandages. It was obvious that the injury caused by Daniel's counterattack yesterday was not light. I, Zeke, will not be picking. You guys choose first and leave me the rest. Zeke said in a low muffled voice. In addition to his tall burly figure, he gave off a great sense of security to the others around him. Oh, Daniel, you can pick first. Krista said with a charming voice. Heh, <laughs> since you just awakened and haven't used your gene drug yet, why don't you go to Area D? That place is much safer and more suitable for a coward like you. At this moment, a mocking voice sounded out. That voice belonged to Aaron, staring directly at Daniel. He did not seem to have any good intentions as his tone was full of ridicule. Hmm, I wonder who the one who got their ass kicked was. Daniel smiled faintly. Area D it is. Damn you. Aaron was just about to flare up until he felt William's gaze pointing directly at him like sharp daggers. Under such a ruthless stare, he could only remain silent and restrain his emotions. Since you picked Area D yourself, don't blame me if you end up dying. Having been to Area D before, Aaron knew of the dangers that came with that area as he barely managed to escape only after killing dozens of bloodthirsty furious ants. Furthermore, he also knew that the Ant Queen dwelled in that exact place, making that area even more threatening. If it wasn't for his wind elemental skills, which gave him a huge advantage in speed, he probably would not have been able to escape that place so easily. Thinking back to that time, Aaron could not help but feel a cold shiver down his spine. Thus, Daniel choosing to explore Area D was the equivalent to choosing death. As a result of his young age and lack of wisdom, Daniel ended up being affected by such an obvious provocation. Seeing how Daniel chose Area D after being provoked, they shook their heads as their opinions of him plummeted. Meanwhile, Krista chose Area C, while Zeke ended up with Area B. All right, now that all the areas have been assigned to each team, let's hurry up and prepare the equipment needed. We'll meet here again in half an hour before leaving. William slammed the meeting table and dismissed the group. Commander, Steve has requested to participate in the mission. At this time, a figure in the barracks suddenly spoke up. Steve, who was currently sitting in a wheelchair, looked at William with pure determination. Although he had lost his legs from his previous battle, he was nevertheless an awakened practitioner who possessed a certain level of fighting prowess in addition to his experience in battle. Stay in the camp and recuperate for now. Since your gene chain is still quite unstable, it will collapse easily if not looked after. Thus, you are in no condition to fight right now. William refused Steve's request but added, I have already requested a suitable weapon for you from Texas. When that weapon arrives, you can then go back to the battlefield. Thank you, Commander. Steve revealed a grateful expression. With that, the awakened practitioners quickly left the barracks and began to prepare for their mission. Daniel was also about to leave when he was suddenly stopped by Steve. What's wrong, Uncle Steve? Daniel asked. Aaron is a vengeful person. If he wants you to go to Area D, there will certainly be dangers waiting for you. Steve frowned and said with concern, It's fine, Uncle Steve. I'm just going to gather some medicine. Daniel laughed. Unbeknownst to the others, Daniel did not choose Area D because he fell for Aaron's provocations. Instead, he chose it since it was the furthest location away from the camp. With that in mind, there would surely be many bloodthirsty, furious ants there for him to fight. After all, Daniel urgently needed to extract the bloodthirsty, furious ants' genes to improve and complete his gene chain. If he manages to complete the gene chain, he would then be able to acquire his first skill, further enhancing his combat strength. Only by constantly increasing his strength could he survive in this hellish world. Daniel was well aware of that point. 
This bag contains all my beast cores. Since I'll remain in the camp, it'll be useless for me. Instead, I'll be giving it to you. Steve took out a small cloth bag, filled with the beast cores of varying sizes that he had previously saved up. Be careful, you must return alive. In this period, beast cores have already replaced the hard currency previously used by humans a few thousand years ago. Daniel kept the bag of beast cores and smiled at Steve. Don't worry, Uncle Steve. With more than 13 beast cores in the bag, Daniel proceeded to convert all of them into energy. Hmm, a total of 2,500 energy. Surely I wouldn't fail every single extraction, right? That would be far too absurd. Daniel took a quick glance at his total energy. 2,500 energy was enough for him to extract 25 times. Even with approximately a 20% success rate, it would certainly be enough for Daniel to complete his first gene chain. The team that followed Daniel was led by Dylan. Once the vice captain of Steve's exploration team, he was also familiar with Daniel. After their preparations, the four squads dispersed and headed in four directions from the campsite. A moment later, Dylan arrived in front of Daniel with a strange expression on his face. Lord Daniel, isn't our direction a bit off from the area we're heading towards? Following Daniel's lead, it didn't seem like they were heading towards Area D, although the pathing was not too far off. They were nevertheless straying further and further away from Area D. Can he really lead us? Why was I assigned to this brat's team? A middle-aged man in the group grumbled with disdain. To actually lead us in the wrong direction? Oh well, as long as you don't bring us to the lair of the bloodthirsty furious ants. Why do you say that? Dylan glared at the man and shouted angrily. If you don't like me, you may leave by yourself. I'll make sure that no one stops you. Daniel glanced at the middle-aged man and said without a care. Hearing those words, the middle-aged man immediately fell silent. Since he was not even an entry-level warrior, he'd surely die if he were to bump into any monsters alone. Without telling anyone in the group, Daniel purposely strayed from the original path to take a detour instead. After the previous meeting ended, Krista secretly slipped a piece of paper with a completely different route drawn on it into his hands as she left. Since Aaron wanted him to choose Area D, it meant that Area D was potentially filled with dangerous monsters. However, Daniel almost did not intend to completely trust Krista. God knows what that witch-like woman had up her sleeves. After trekking for about two hours, Daniel ordered his team to stop a short distance away from Area D. Take a short break here for half an hour, Daniel announced. Huh? Or Daniel, we have almost arrived at Area D, but you want us to rest now? Dylan scratched his head at a complete loss. We're almost there, so why are we stopping? Are you trying to slack off? The middle-aged man shouted irritatingly. Episode 10, Danger Zone Although the middle-aged man was the only one who complained, the other members of the squad agreed with him despite staying silent. From their perspectives, Daniel's previous two orders did not make much sense, making them believe he was not suited to be a leader. Instead of explaining his decisions, he simply ignored them and asked Dylan to look after the team while he scouted Area D alone. Analyzing the surroundings of Area D, he discovered it to be an abandoned makeshift medical facility that was about the size of two soccer fields. At this point, the dilapidated buildings were on the verge of crumbling. Countless potholes filled the ground and blood could be seen splattered everywhere. It could be surmised that this place had once been attacked by the bloodthirsty furious ants. As for the corpses, they had probably been devoured clean by the bloodthirsty furious ants. Taking each step stealthily, Daniel walked carefully towards Area D. Though there were not many valuable medicines remaining, everything he found would be invaluable to the camp. After all, many of the soldiers in Royal Mint were still wounded after the previous battle 
and could not be treated due to the lack of medicine. Now that they were in urgent need, every last bit of medicine left in this abandoned facility would count. After entering Area D, Daniel searched through the abandoned barracks and managed to find some medicine. He grabbed a nearby box and filled it up with all the drugs he could find. After continuously searching through rooms and sites, Daniel had a bountiful harvest and managed to fill the box to its brim. It seems like there are quite a few resources here, but... Daniel muttered to himself. Looking around his surroundings, he turned his gaze towards the pitch black holes in the ground, dug out by the bloodthirsty furious ants. He deduced there to be traces of activity in them. With their active presence here, Area D was definitely not a safe place to explore. Since it's not time for the ants to come out hunting yet, we should be fine as long as we don't alert them, Daniel thought, and started his journey back to his team's camp. No matter how much strength he possessed, he was a mere human who only had two hands to work with, so he required the help of others to move every medical resource back to camp. After returning to his team, Daniel placed the box on the ground and opened it for all of them to see. Even though there may still be a lot of medical resources ahead, there are nevertheless countless dangers in the area, so you have to be extremely careful with your steps and not make any noise, Daniel warned them. Understood. Everyone, get ready and set off immediately. Under Dylan's order, the team of ten or so people began moving carefully towards Area D. This was not the first time the party had gone out on a mission. After entering the designated area, they moved quickly and immediately began to search for useful materials. In just a little more than ten minutes, almost everyone had gotten something in their hands. Although they did not find a lot, it should still be enough to hit their original quota for this mission. Near the end of the mission, a loud noise suddenly sounded from the direction of the barracks. Give it back to me, I found it first. Cut the crap, I grabbed it first. Along with the noisy argument, they also heard the clanging of tools being knocked over. Daniel frowned. Even with the possibility of there being bloodthirsty furious ants here, there were still idiots who dared to fight in such a dangerous place. What's going on? Dylan immediately ran over to ask. Walking towards the barracks, he noticed the same middle-aged man who kept complaining about Daniel earlier, walking out of the room with a metallic ball-like object in his hand. Captain Moore, despite being the first person to discover this medical item, someone had actually dared to steal it from me. You should convict and punish him severely. The middle-aged man revealed a sinister smile. From the barracks, a thin man with wounds from the fight stumbled out and pointed at the middle-aged man as he yelled, Bullshit! I was clearly the one who discovered it first. You were the one who stole it from me. All right, we'll deal with this matter later. Now that we've gathered a decent amount of medical resources, it's time for us to evacuate, Dylan said with a frown. While he may not be fan of the middle-aged man, he had to focus on completing the mission first. Ha! <laughs> ha! Justice prevails for the righteous one. To think you still want to steal from my contribution, huh? <laughs> the middle-aged man sneered. At this moment, Daniel sensed an anomaly lingering through the air and turned his gaze towards the middle-aged man as he shouted in a low voice, Get out of the way! Bang! Suddenly, an enormous ant broke out from the ground under the middle-aged man's feet and sliced his body in half before he even had time to react. As the crimson blood shot out like a fountain in the room, the other men in the area stood in place, petrified by the horrific scene. Ah, it's a bloodthirsty, furious ant! There's a mutated beast here, run! I don't want to die! Seeing the bloodthirsty, furious ant, the members who usually worked in logistics and had never been to the battlefield before immediately lost their footing and composure. At this point, everything had fallen into utter chaos. Calm down, grab the supplies and evacuate quickly, Dylan shouted. Captain Moore, I'll leave the safety of our men to you. Meanwhile, I'll deal with the stupid ants. Daniel's heart trembled in the midst of the chaos. 
not out of fear, but joy. Going face to face with the bloodthirsty furious ants again, his blood boiled in excitement as he finally found the perfect opportunity to perfect his gene chain. Daniel took the initiative and dashed towards the bloodthirsty furious ant as he started to extract their genes. Extraction failed. Come on! The bloodthirsty furious ant let out a shrill screech and clasped their jaws down on Daniel. Although Daniel was indeed powerful, his body had not yet reached the level where he could withstand the attacks of the bloodthirsty furious ant. Perhaps only someone with a stronger body like Zeke could take on the attacks of the bloodthirsty furious ant. Daniel raised his fist and prepared his counterattack. Thump! When his fist collided heavily with the bloodthirsty furious ant's head, a massive shockwave reverberated through the air as its tough layer of armor exploded into pieces. It's Lord Wilson. Long live the awakened practitioner. We're saved. Grab the materials. There will be the spoils of this battle. Upon witnessing Daniel's marvelous performance, the morale of the team skyrocketed as the chaotic scene started to calm back down. Before they could finish rejoicing, however, a series of roars resounded from beneath them as more than ten bloodthirsty furious ants shot out from the holes in the ground. It's over. We're finished, Dylan said helplessly as his hand turned numb, almost losing the grip of his broadsword. With the appearance of a dozen bloodthirsty furious ants, they might not be able to escape unscathed, even with the presence of an awakened practitioner. Pack up the supplies and get the hell out of here. I'll stay behind you guys and cover your asses, Daniel exclaimed. At that instant, the horde of bloodthirsty furious ants rushed towards Daniel. Gene extraction. Extraction failed. Bang! Gene extraction. Extraction failed. Bang! Although the dozen bloodthirsty furious ants attacked ferociously, they were still unable to land even a scratch on Daniel's body. From this scene alone, Daniel fought like the god of war himself. Despite being surrounded by dozens of bloodthirsty furious ants, he appeared to be unscathed. One down. Two down. Three. With each swing he took, his fists were covered with even more blood. Since each attack consumed a rather large amount of energy, Daniel's movements gradually slowed down. Swoosh. From the corner of his eye, Daniel noticed a bloodthirsty furious ant pounce towards him from behind. However, it was too late for him to react as its large jaws pierced through his back. The burning pain seared through his flesh as his face boiled in rage. You fucking bastard! Daniel cursed as he turned around to punch the bloodthirsty furious ant in its head. Following that, he used gene extraction on the bloodthirsty furious ant next to him. If this attempt failed, he would soon run out of stamina and eventually die from fatigue. I will definitely succeed and survive. Extraction successful. Suddenly, a green light emitted from the body of the bloodthirsty furious ant and floated towards Daniel's body. Once again, the familiar sharp pain caused Daniel's entire body to tremble uncontrollably. However, a surge of power gushed through his veins and revitalized him. Episode 11 Encounter After dealing with the bloodthirsty furious ants, Daniel brought up his attribute panel in his mind to look at his improved sats. Daniel. Energy, 1,100 points. Stamina, 140 points. Strength, 305 points. Spiritual force, 38 points. Gene chain talent, strength of the ants. Complete ant gene chain, 100% complete. Innate skills, tenacity. Ants are well known as a species of insects that has lived since ancient times. Their tenacity and persistent nature allowed them to survive under any circumstances. No matter how much the odds were against them, they would always find a way to bounce back. Just like how you flick an ant away from your body, it will somehow find a way to get back on you. After successfully extracting the ant's gene, 
His prior fatigue had diminished as his entire body brimmed with energy. Touching his back, he realized that the wound caused by the bloodthirsty Furious Ant's sneak attack had mostly healed. Even Daniel was shocked by the speed of his recovery. To think that a complete gene chain would grant such a powerful skill. I wonder what Aaron's other skill is. It seems that I may have underestimated him. Having experienced the powerful skill brought about by his complete gene chain, he was overjoyed and worried at the same time. After all, Aaron possessed two different skills. Taking the level of his mastery in the wind element into account, Aaron's skills should not be underestimated. If he did not underestimate and insist on a close fight with Daniel, it probably would not have been that easy for Daniel to defeat him. After completing the bloodthirsty Furious Ant's gene chain, Chu Lin's physical strength had increased greatly. With his recovery type innate skill, tenacity, in mind, a dozen or so bloodthirsty Furious Ants would no longer pose a threat to him. On the other hand, it seemed that other members managed to escape from Area D under the cover of Daniel alone. Facing more than ten bloodthirsty Furious Ants, Lord Wilson must be in deep trouble. Since he had just awakened not too long ago, I'm afraid that the odds are against him. Let's retreat quickly. If the bloodthirsty furious ants catch up to us, we will all be done for. Let's hope Lord Wilson will be able to hold on for a bit longer. Yeah, Captain Moore, we should leave immediately. I'm afraid that Lord Wilson is… Having just barely escaped from their deaths, all the other men suggested out of fear for their lives. What are you guys talking about? Lord Wilson stayed behind and held back a dozen bloodthirsty furious ants to buy time for us to escape. Even then, you bunch of trash still want to abandon and leave our savior behind? Have your consciousness been eaten by dogs? When Dylan heard their suggestions, he roared in anger. Everyone, stand by. If Lord Wilson doesn't come back, don't even think of leaving your position. Despite putting on a domineering front, Dylan was nevertheless nervous for Daniel. After all, he was facing more than a dozen of the bloodthirsty furious ants by himself. Even for an experienced, awakened practitioner, it would surely not be an easy feat to pull off. Having just awakened, he would naturally still be unfamiliar with his abilities compared to the other awakened practitioners. It would not be realistic to expect him to hold back a dozen of the bloodthirsty furious ants by himself much less defeat them. God bless us. Lord Wilson must return safely. Dylan prayed sincerely in his heart. As time passed, there were neither signs of movement nor sound coming from the direction of Area D. The longer they waited in their temporary camp, the probability of Daniel surviving gradually decreased. With the existence of the bloodthirsty furious ants, ordinary soldiers like them did not dare to get close. No one knew what was going on with Daniel, as the only thing they could do was wait and hope for his return. Finally, as they were anxiously waiting, someone saw a figure slowly walking towards them from a distance. Look, there's someone over there! After a startled cry, everyone in the team woke up from their stupor and looked into the distance with their head raised. It's not just one person. It looks to be a team. It must be the other teams coming over to give us support. Signal our position with the flares and get their attention. Immediately, someone from the team lighted the red flare and shouted loudly, There is hope for Lord Wilson. Surely there must be an awakened practitioner among that group. Dylan shouted in agitation. Noticing their signal flare, the team from the distance quickly rushed over towards them. When the team got closer, however, Dylan frowned. Just from the attire of the small team, it did not look like they belonged to their gathering ground. When the two teams came into contact, a burly man with a hideous scar on his face walked in front of Dylan. Hello. We are one of the exploration teams from the Sandwolf's gathering ground. My name is Samuel Johnson, the leader of this team. The man named Samuel Johnson quickly introduced himself. I'm Dylan Moore from Royal Men's Gathering Ground. Dylan replied expressionlessly. Seeing how you lit your signal flare, did your team encounter any difficulties? 
Samuel asked as he swept his gaze across all the members of Dylan's team. Seeing how Dylan's team had collected so many resources, their pupils contracted slightly as a hint of greed flashed across their eyes. <laughs> Everything is fine. We mistook your team for another team from our gathering ground and ended up lighting our signal flare. Dylan smiled faintly. Before Dylan finished his sentence, however, one of the people from his team shouted, Our awakened practitioner is currently trapped in Area D with more than ten bloodthirsty furious ants surrounding him. Please, go and save him. Hearing this, Dylan and Samuel were both stunned. Dylan's expression sunk with a hint of caution in his eyes. Oh, your awakened practitioner is not currently in your team. A trace of surprise flashed through Samuel's eyes as he slowly opened his mouth. After being surrounded and attacked by more than ten bloodthirsty furious ant, he would have long broken out of the area if he had the strength to do so. Otherwise, he would most likely be dead by now. A thin man with a rather sinister expression walked out from behind Samuel and spoke. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I am the team's awakened practitioner, Scott Jones. Only then did the members of Dylan's team understand their current situation. Seeing the other party's actions, it was obvious they had ulterior motives to snatch away their medical supplies. Ugh. You dare to attack a fellow F-Class gathering ground? Are you not afraid of the punishments you'll receive from the Texas Command Center? Dylan bit his tongue and shouted as he tightened his grip on his broadsword. As an entry-level warrior, he knew that facing an awakened practitioner head-on was still an impossible feat for him. Texas Command Center. I don't think they would care what happened to a team that's completely wiped out by bloodthirsty furious ants, right, Captain Moore? Scott Jones licked his lips as a bloodthirsty look flashed across his eyes. Dylan's pupils constricted. Not only did the other party want to steal their medical supplies, but they also want to silence everyone. Take the supplies and run. I'll try to stop them. Dylan roared as he raised his broadsword and pointed it at Johnson, Jones, and the others. Ha <laughs> ha! You want to hold us back by yourself? We won't even need the assistance from our awakened practitioner then. After a series of mocking laughter, Samuel picked up a meteor hammer and smashed it towards Dylan. In response, Dylan blocked the attack with a slash of his blade. As the two weapons came into contact, a sharp sound of metal colliding reverberated through the air. His hands numb from the shock, Dylan took a few steps back and stared menacingly at Samuel, an intermediate warrior. From that single exchange, Dylan determined that Samuel possessed the strength of an intermediate warrior. Although the pressure he emitted was not as oppressive as Captain Stone's, Dylan clearly knew that he was still not a match for him. However, the vital supply of medical resources behind him, Dylan could not afford to retreat a single step. Absolutely not. You're courting death. Samuel roared and swung the meteor hammer towards Dylan. One hammer strike after another. At this point, Dylan could barely resist his attacks. Although blisters had formed in his hands, along with the searing pain in both arms, he still refused to let go of his weapon. Episode 12 Strength Through Adversity Two. Suffering a heavy blow to his abdomen, Dylan spurted a mouthful of blood and was sent flying away. What a piece of trash! Have the soldiers from Royal Mint Gathering Ground fallen to such low standards? Samuel sneered. Don't waste your time. Just hurry up and get the medical supplies. We'll leave the celebration for when we get back to camp tonight. Scott smiled sinisterly. He was naturally very happy to encounter such a great opportunity to reap such rewards without expending much time or effort. Our awakened practitioner will never let you guys off, he said bitterly while holding on to his wound despite being weak from the attack. 
Captain Moore, I'll give you the supplies, so please let us live. Don't kill us. We won't tell anyone about what happened here. Seeing Dylan had been severely injured and with no way of escape, they started to beg for mercy one by one. Having originally relied on Daniel, they could only beg for mercy now that he was no longer with them. <laughs> Look at this group of cowards. It is a pity that leaving you alive will only add to our troubles. After all, only dead people can keep secrets. As a hint of bloodlust flashed across Samuel's eyes, he dashed in front of one of Dylan's team members and lifted him up by his throat with one hand. Uh, uh, save, save me. Despite struggling madly and kicking his legs around, the man could not resist at all. The power of the awakened practitioner was certainly not something that ordinary people could match. Crack. At that instant, Scott crushed his throat with his bare hands. Ah, weaklings, shout in panic, cry in fear, allow me to become your most terrifying nightmare. Scott laughed and declared like some sort of lunatic. On the side, Dylan gasped for breath as he lay helplessly on the ground, unable to move. His eyes were filled with despair as he witnessed the death of each of his teammates. Within that short period of time, feelings of loss and despair lingered in the atmosphere. Instead of running for their lives, each of the Royal Mint members stood petrified in a state of hopelessness, unable to escape their imminent death. What they failed to realize was how their negative emotions actually ended up feeding Scott as some sort of food for his gene chain. This was exactly how his ability worked. Just when Dylan and the others had given up all hope, a figure suddenly jumped out from Area D and dashed before the group. That, that's... Seeing this figure, one of the Royal Mint team members cried out in alarm. Lord Wilson, he's not dead. It really is him. It's Lord Wilson. He came back to save us. Lord Wilson actually managed to kill those bloodthirsty furious ants? When the other members of the team saw the silhouette of the person clearly, their despair suddenly turned into a light of hope. Initially harvesting the energy from their negative emotions, a trace of killing intent flashed across Scott's eyes when the source suddenly stopped. Who dares disturb my meal for the day? I will kill you. Hmm, who the hell are you? Daniel frowned and asked coldly when he saw another group of people in front of the team. Lord Wilson, be careful. Dylan shouted with all his might. Before he could even finish his sentence, however, a figure rushed towards Daniel at an extremely fast speed. Shing! At that instant, Scott's claw tore through Daniel's chest and sent him flying. Huh, even for an awakened practitioners, there exist both the strong and the weak. It looks like yours leans more towards the latter. After Scott finished Daniel off with a single slash, he licked the blood on his finger as his face twisted with a rather wicked expression. Lord Wilson, he has defeated in one move? To think we expected him to save us, oh, such wishful thinking. Ha ha ha. What the hell? Why did I end up in the same team as this piece of trash? Seeing how Daniel was defeated by the opponent with a single move, the sliver of hope they had returned to despair. Their minds were undoubtedly on the verge of breaking down. You despicable little shits. Lord Wilson fought off a dozen bloodthirsty furious ants to buy us time for escape, yet you still want to curse at him? If it weren't for him, all of you would already be dead. Dylan was about to faint as he cursed. <laughs> How interesting. The sound of wails and howls is certainly beautiful music to my ears. Scott laughed crazily. Hmm. It seems that the Royal Mint Gathering Ground is a group of trash. To think that their awakened practitioner wouldn't even be able to withstand a single blow. Samuel mocked. At that moment, an unexpected voice sounded from behind them. Is that so? If I'm trash, then what are you? What? 
Samuel's pupils suddenly contracted as a fist pierced through his chest. You! Ow! Before Samuel could finish his words, however, his life force had already dispersed from his physical being. Slowly, his limbs turned numb as his entire body collapsed unwillingly, the look in his eyes resentful. Scott turned around and saw Daniel standing unscathed in front of him. His eyes revealed a look of disbelief as he exclaimed, How is this possible? How did you not die? Did you try to tickle me with your previous attack? Daniel sneered coldly. Then he taunted Scott and said proactively, Come on, let me see those skills of yours. Scott's expression twisted in anger. With a loud roar, his five fingers curved into a claw and slashed towards Daniel. Gene extraction. Extraction failed. At that moment, Daniel attempted to use gene extraction on Scott, but as expected, it failed. However, he still had more opportunities. Though he had already completed his first gene chain from battle with the bloodthirsty furious ants in Area D, he was still not satisfied with his results. He continued to lure more ants out to kill. After all, this was a rare opportunity he had to obtain more beast cores. While the level of those bloodthirsty furious ants may be rather low, they would nevertheless produce enough beast cores for him to use for now. In the end, the beast core was an essential item for Daniel to further improve his strength. That was the main reason why Daniel had arrived later than he had initially planned. Crash. Once again, Daniel was sent flying by Scott. Since his attacks were both quick and violent, it was difficult for Daniel to predict and catch his movements. With tenacity, however, Scott's attack did not pose much of a threat to Daniel, since he could recover quickly. You, just what kind of monster are you? After a few exchanges, Scott's gaze towards Daniel changed from deep hatred to pure shock. He did not see Daniel as a threat, but instead, more as an immortal cockroach. While Scott was still in a daze, Daniel once again used gene extraction on him. Extraction successful. Acquired new gene talent. Strength from distress. Fragment of the strength from distress gene chain, 24% complete. With the success of the gene extraction, all negative emotions being emitted from the surrounding people had turned into a source of energy that entered Daniel's body. While that stream of energy may have strengthened his body, the negative emotions within that stream caused his mind to tremble slightly. I see. So you possess a superhuman gene that absorbs the negative emotions from others and turns them into a source of energy. Daniel immediately understood his opponent's gene talent. Simply put, Scott had loose springs in his head and was mentally ill, also known as a lunatic. You probably wouldn't understand even if I explained it to you, imbecile. Daniel smiled faintly, his tone full of ridicule. You're courting death. Having been hit directly in his sore spot, Scott let out an excruciating scream and sent a series of slashes towards Daniel. Episode 13. Triumph. Looking at this battle, Daniel is clearly at a great disadvantage. Why was such a weak awakened practitioner assigned to our team? The opponent is far too strong. Since Daniel was just awakened not long ago, he surely must not be a match for the other awakened practitioner. Since Daniel had just taken a massive beating without any form of retaliation, the Royal Mint team felt extremely disappointed and helpless. Having suppressed Daniel the entire time in his battle, Scott clearly held the upper hand. At this moment, Scott seemed to be getting irritated and resorted to his trump card. I'll let you know the difference between our power, demonic slash, Scott shouted loudly. As a thin layer of dark aura surrounding his claws, he slashed down on Daniel's body. Since Daniel had not retaliated since the beginning, Scott began to let his guard down. He failed to realize that Daniel was simply biding his time. Using his newly extracted skill, tenacity, 
Daniel planned from the beginning of the battle to find an opening to extract genes from Scott. With Scott's genes successfully extracted, albeit incomplete, Daniel no longer saw any use for Scott and did not hold back his strength. This is bad. The opponent's awakened practitioner has activated his skill. It's all over. No matter how tough Daniel is, it will be impossible for him to resist even a single ability from an awakened practitioner who had completed his first gene chain. If Lord Smith was here, he would have definitely have been able to defeat this opponent, but it's a pity that trash like Daniel was assigned to our team instead. Once again, the cowards from Royal Mint wailed in hopelessness. Awakened practitioners who could activate their skills should have completed at least one gene chain. Comparing the two's strength would essentially be equivalent to comparing that of heaven and earth. In Royal Mint's previous fierce battle, if not for one of the awakened practitioners using his skill to kill three of the blood-devouring ants, Royal Mint would have suffered even greater losses. Now that Scott had cast his skill, Daniel's death would surely be imminent. Once Daniel suffered his defeat, what could ordinary soldiers like them do to defend themselves? Without any ability to fight back, they would be lambs waiting for slaughter. What? Are you jumping at me? I'll blow your head off. Daniel let out a cold snort. Though faced with a powerful attack, he had no intention of dodging it. Instead, he did the unthinkable and threw a normal punch in retaliation. Crash. At that instant, Scott's head exploded like a water balloon as blood spattered everywhere on the field. Scott was already dead before his skill had even landed on Daniel. It was just as Daniel said. He would blow up his head. Without any mercy, he killed Scott on the spot. Silence. Everyone, both Dylan and Samuel's team, witnessed this scene firsthand. They all gaped their mouths wide open and stood petrified in place. No one could have imagined Daniel, who seemed to be taking a massive beating, could turn the battle around and kill Scott with a single punch after Scott unleashed his strongest skill. This, this is impossible. Lord Jones, you actually dare kill our awakened practitioner? Texas Command Center will never forgive you. In a moment of shock and panic, the members of Sandwolf team shouted, Huh, have you ever heard of the saying? Daniel sneered with a sharp gaze. Dead men, don't talk. On the same night, the other teams from Royal Mint returned one after another from their designated areas. The first team to return was led by Aaron Smith. Although the drugs his team recovered were limited, they eased the urgency of their gathering grounds medical needs. Next to arrive were the teams led by Matthew Benton and Krista Russell. Each of the three small teams delivered their collected supplies, though it wasn't that much. Even with the medical resources of the three teams combined, it was still not enough to meet Royal Mint's medical demands. With additional supplies arriving from Texas Command Center, however, the mission could very well be considered a success. Why isn't Daniel back yet? Commander Rogers frowned and asked. Despite waiting at the entrance of the camp for a while, he had yet to see any signs of Daniel leading his team back. Who knows? He must have failed to collect any medicine and was too embarrassed to come back, Aaron said sarcastically. Commander, since Area D is the furthest from the camp, Daniel could very well be on his way, and there's no need for you to worry. Krista comforted him with a smile. Commander, do you want me to go out and assist Brother Daniel? Zeke offered. Daniel, you have to come back safely, Commander Stone declared anxiously. Just as everyone was discussing, a streak of fiery light appeared in front of them. It's Lord Wilson. He's back. The scouts in the camp shouted after seeing signal flares in the distance. Upon hearing the news, Commander Stone slowly loosened his grip. Feeling as if a mountain of burden had slipped off his back, his relieved heart rate returned to normal. Huh. So what if he's back? He probably didn't manage to find anything and wasted his time. 
Aaron sneered menacingly. You lucky bastard. How did you not die in Area D? It might sound negative, but it's unlikely Daniel could gather much medicine on his first mission, Zeke said truthfully. Since this was his first mission, it's already more than enough for him to return to us safely. In any case, the resources that our teams have gathered should be more than enough to fill the quota, Krista added, attempting to soften the atmosphere. Like the others, she did not think Daniel would be able to bring back many resources. After all, the three other teams combined were only able to find a small amount. With our meager troops, what's the point of keeping him in our camp if he doesn't find resources? Aaron sneered. His expression turned ugly when he caught sight of Daniel's team. Oh my god, so many supplies! Zeke cried, gaping, his eyes wide open in shock. He stared at the returning team in disbelief. Everyone in the team was carrying a large box, stuffed to the brim with all kinds of medical supplies. This… how is this possible? Aaron was so shocked that his jaws dropped to the floor. After looking through all the supplies, they calculated there to be more resources than all the other three teams combined. I'm sorry, Commander. We had too much to carry and ended up coming back a bit late. Daniel reported, still covered in blood. It's fine, as long as you've returned safely. Commander Roger's stern face could not help but reveal a hint of joy when he saw the bountiful supplies Daniel brought back. The heap of medical supplies would be more than enough for them to hold out for an extremely long time, even if the Texas Command Center wasn't able to send them more supplies. Hmm, Daniel, you… After analyzing the supplies carefully, Commander Rogers noticed something was off and took the initiative to ask. Commander, let's discuss this somewhere private. Daniel smiled faintly. All right. Commander Rogers replied. With that, the two of them walked into the barracks together. Those supplies weren't just the ones he found in Area D. Daniel seized half of them in the battle with the Sandwolf team. Episode 14 The Bionic Arm Samuel's team had collected a large amount of supplies nearby Area D. Daniel was not just some heartless executioner, but Samuel's team had intentions to harm him, and he definitely would not let that go unscathed. By removing Scott's skills, strength from distress, Daniel no longer saw any value or reason in keeping him alive. Even though the process of extracting the genes from an awakened practitioner may be similar to extracting genes from mutated beasts, Completing the entire gene chain was a whole different story. To complete the gene chain extracted from the mutated beast, Daniel would have to keep extracting from the same kind of beast until it reaches 100% completion. When trying to complete the gene chain extracted from an awakened practitioner, on the other hand, Daniel would need to cultivate the gene chain by continuously using it. Only then would he make progress with the specific gene chain. However, that cultivation process to complete a gene chain would take much longer. Daniel followed William into the barracks, holding a stuffed bag in his hand. Daniel, have you already completed your first gene chain? William asked. He could feel Daniel's excitement. I was just lucky, Daniel said. William looked at Daniel with a strange look in his eyes. William would usually not think too much of it. After all, most awakened practitioners would make quick progress with their first gene chain after taking the gene drug. But what surprised William was that Daniel did not use any gene drug at all. Without the gene drug, it was rather terrifying to know that he could improve his first gene chain at such a rapid rate. Placing the bag in his hands on the table, Daniel opened it and revealed the content inside. When William saw the contents of the bag, he looked at Daniel in shock. This… this is an awakened practitioner? William asked in a serious tone. Specifically Scott, an awakened practitioner from the F-Class Gathering Ground Sandwolf. 
Daniel nodded in response. He then told William everything in detail. I'm not sure whether you made the right decision. William remained silent for a long time after he finished listening to Daniel's explanation. But if it was me, I would have done the same thing. Daniel let out a sigh of relief after hearing William's words, implying that he supported Daniel's decision. However, don't tell anyone about this. Just pretend it never happened. William said to Daniel. Daniel nodded yes. No matter what, you have completed the mission perfectly. The supplies you brought back would be enough to supply the camp for a long time. William smiled and patted Daniel on the back. Since you completed your mission in such a magnificent fashion, allow me to award you with a small toy. Walking towards a cabinet in the barracks, William opened it and grabbed out a strange-looking item. It was a bionic arm. Looking at its crude appearance, it did not seem to be a complete product. Even so, the unique design and kinetic energy devices attached to it piqued Daniel's interest. This is a little toy made by an old friend of mine back in Texas. While it may only be a semi-finished product, you should not underestimate the force it's capable of exerting. Since I don't have a use for it, I will let you play around with it. William handed the bionic arm over to Daniel and said, I've only tried it once or twice. Aside from a slight enhancement in my strength, I haven't fully grasped the rest of its functions yet. So take it with you and study it. Many thanks, Commander. Daniel's face brimmed with joy as he received the bionic arm. If there's nothing else, I'll be leaving. Daniel could not wait to study the effects of this half-finished product since it was the first weapon he'd received after coming to this world. William nodded for him to leave. After Daniel left the barracks, William stared at Scott's shattered head for a long time before letting out a heavy sigh. I wonder if this boy will be a blessing or a curse. The next few days passed peacefully. Every day, other than talking to Steve, he would study the half-finished bionic arm in his own room. After a few days of research, Daniel finally found out a few other uses of the bionic arm. Since the bionic arm was run by gene energy, even an awakened practitioner who has yet to fully awaken his gene chain could activate the bionic arm as long as they possessed a sufficient amount of gene energy. Using this bionic arm could probably increase Daniel's strength by a few percent. With his strength value already as high as 300%, the small percentage increase would definitely be a great addition to him. Most importantly, Daniel found out that this bionic arm actually had a long-range attack. Of course, the long-range attack was also activated by gene energy. By compressing the gene energy into smaller particles of light waves, the bionic arm charges and emits the energy from its palm. The power exerted depends solely on the amount of gene energy its user possesses. After figuring out several of the bionic arm's functions, he went to look for Zeke excitedly. Since Zeke's ancestral genes belonged to that of the big yellow ape, he possessed great strength similar to the power Daniel received from the ants. Thus, Daniel wanted to see who was stronger, him or Zeke. After putting on the bionic arm, Daniel's strength had increased to 348%, almost double that of the initial amount. After finding Zeke and explaining his purpose for looking for him, Zeke burst into laughter. Little brother, are you sure you did not make a mistake? You actually want to compete with me in strength? Zeke asked him, wondering if he had mistaken his words. Yes, brother Zeke. Ignoring Zeke's laughter, Daniel replied in a serious manner. Yes, but what would be boring to compete like this, so let's raise the stakes, shall we? I will be using this bionic arm. Also, why don't we put in 100 beast cores each? Daniel said without any hesitation. 
Although he did not have a hundred beast cores in his pocket, Daniel believed he would definitely not lose. Bionic arm? That plastic toy on your arm? Zeke laughed. The news of their spar spread like wildfire across the entire Royal Mint camp. Everyone who heard the news thought it was unbelievable. Am I hearing things? Lord Daniel Wilson wants to compete with Lord Zeke in a battle of strength? It's absolutely true. I can't seem to understand what Lord Daniel Wilson is trying to achieve from it, though. Not only that, but they have even put 100 beast cores on each as a gamble. 100 beast cores? My god, I can't even make that many beast cores in a whole year. The duel was set to take place in the central plaza of the Royal Mint camp. To prevent any damages to the camp, they set up an arena within the plaza itself. When the time came, everyone rushed towards the central plaza to watch the show. The two figures stood confidently within the arena. Daniel stood on one side, while Zeke on the other. Compared to Zeke's sturdy build, Daniel looked like a dwarf. The difference in strength is too obvious. Can Lord Daniel Wilson even last longer than a minute? This battle is really just some wrestling match to test each other's strength. I'm guessing that Daniel won't even be able to last 10 seconds and will soon be thrown out of the arena by Lord Zeke Adams. You never know. Maybe Lord Daniel Wilson has some trick up his sleeves. Do you truly believe that? Episode 15 One Punch the duel between the two awakened practitioners was quite a grand event indeed. Not only did the soldiers of the Royal Mint camp run over to see the commotion, but even the other awakened practitioners, who had been waiting outside the arena for a long time, came to witness the competition. Suddenly, a beautiful, alluring woman wearing a dazzling scarlet dress appeared as all the men stared at her. Krista attracted the attention of countless men and caused them to succumb to their fantasies of her. Next to Krista stood a glum-looking man wearing a pair of glasses, Aaron. With the bandages on his hands now removed, it appeared that his injuries had fully recovered. This was expected since an awakened practitioner's physique allowed for a much faster recovery rate than ordinary people. Truly a newborn calf undaunted by the presence of a tiger. To think that little brother Daniel actually dares to compete with that big brute Zeke. Krista covered her lips and chuckled. As she looked at Daniel in the arena, a strange thought came over her. Huh, he's just a praying mantis trying to block a chariot. Even the commander has trouble beating Zeke in a battle of strength, not to mention that brat, said Aaron angrily. My strength may not compare to Zeke's, but Daniel might be able to win, said a low voice from behind the two of them. Shocked by the voice, Krista and Aaron turned around and saw William walking towards them. The commander is surely overestimating Daniel. He definitely is strong, but compared to Zeke, he's nothing, said Aaron angrily as he did not agree with William's words at all. Why is the commander so optimistic about Daniel's strength? Since Zeke has the strength of a big yellow ape, how could anyone in this camp, much less Daniel, compare to him? Krista chuckled. 100 beast cores that Daniel wins, William said expressionlessly. Since the commander is so intrigued by this, I will bet on Zeke winning. Aaron sneered. I don't have that many beast cores, so I won't be participating. Krista narrowed her seductive eyes and said with a smile. The duel would soon commence. Zeke stared at Daniel, who was wearing the bionic arm on his hand. He truly believed that if he used even a little bit of his strength, that he would be able to crush that toy into pieces. After all, it looked no different from the things you would usually find in a toy store. Daniel, since we'll only be competing in strength, I'll let you have the first move. Zeke said in a low, muffled voice. After switching into a horse stance, he patted his chest and signaled Daniel to take action. 
Daniel was not interested in fair competition. Since Zeke gave him the first move, then he would definitely not hold himself back. All right. When facing an opponent like Zeke, holding his strength back would be certainly be an act that he would end up regretting. Thus, he was going to give everything he had in his first strike. As the bionic arm extracted Daniel's gene energy, its entire frame trembled slightly. While charging all his energy into his fist, he roared like a tiger and threw a punch at Z. Oh, that punch is quite interesting. Krista's eyelashes fluttered in surprise. It's probably some sort of bluff. I'm afraid Zeke won't even... Aaron sneered. Boom. Before he could finish his sentence, however, Daniel's fist struck directly on Zeke's chest, producing a loud muffled sound that reverberated like a large bell. At that moment, Zeke screamed in pain and flew out of the arena like a shot put. Flying out of the arena, he landed on some sort of instrument at the side like a meteor crash, causing the area around him to be surrounded by dust and other broken fragments. Silence. Upon witnessing this absurd scene, everyone gaped their mouths wide open as their faces turned pale in shock. No one could believe what they were seeing. Zeke, the awakened practitioner known for his strength, was actually sent flying away with a single punch from Daniel. This... this should not be possible. Aaron, in a state of extreme shock, clenched his fist and stared menacingly at Daniel. Having completed three of his gene chains, Zeke's strength was certainly not less than Daniel's. Even then, he was still unable to withstand a single punch from him. Krista covered her mouth softly as a surprised expression appeared on her face. Suddenly, the entire crowd fell into an uproar. No one would have expected that Daniel, the underdog, would be able to settle this duel with a mere punch. Even with Zeke's strength, he was still overwhelmed by Daniel's attack. This is preposterous. To think that Lord Daniel Wilson is actually strong enough to defeat Lord Zeke Adams with one punch. Could it be that Lord Daniel Wilson is stronger than Lord Zeke Adams? The audience began to chatter amongst themselves, as no one had expected such an absurd outcome. Everyone originally thought that this would be a brilliant match, but no one expected it to end so soon. 100 Beast Corps. Remember to give them to me later. William said before he turned around and left. As the commander of Royal Mint, he naturally had many tasks to take care of in the camp. It was already difficult for him to find the time to come and watch the duel between Daniel and Zeke. The only reason William came here was to see what kind of skill Daniel's completed gene chain had given him. However, that was Daniel's private matter, and if he did not want to say anything, then William would not try to pry deeper. Daniel! Wearing an ugly expression, Aaron snorted angrily before turning around to leave. Big Brother Zeke, are you all right? Daniel immediately ran towards Zeke and pulled him up from the ground. Damn, brat, why didn't you tell me you were this strong? I couldn't even react to your attack, Zeke said with a joking smile. Since his ancestral gene gave him superhuman strength and a solid defense, Zeke did not suffer any injuries. However, the impact from Daniel's punch had caught him completely off guard. That punch was just a fluke. It's all thanks to this bionic arm that the commander gave me. Daniel smiled and blamed William. Well, the bionic arm did increase his strength. It was ultimately a result of his first complete gene chain. I admit defeat. I'll give you the 100 beast cores later. Zeke spoke straightforwardly. Much thanks, big brother Zeke. Daniel responded gratefully. At that moment, Steve arrived in a wheelchair. Daniel, your strength has improved once again. Steve looked surprisingly at Daniel, as if he looked at his child who had just grown up. I guess so, Uncle Steve. 
How much longer will it take for the equipment that the commander ordered for you to arrive? Daniel smiled and asked. The supplies from Texas will arrive this afternoon. My equipment should be in the same batch, Steve said. Not long after lunch, the supplies from Texas had indeed arrived. At that time, Daniel and Steve went together to the commander's living quarters. When they entered his room, William gave Daniel the 100 B scores that he previously won from Aaron. Daniel did not hesitate to accept his gift. After that, William brought the two of them to the warehouse in the camp. The warehouse served as a place to store the supplies sent from Texas. Steve, the equipment that I have ordered for you has arrived. Since you awakened with the injection of the gene drug, I will thus not be giving you another one. Without further hesitation, William opened the door and led them into the warehouse. Episode 16 Sand Wolves This warehouse serves as the main storage room for the entire Royal Mint camp. Everything they found outside or created would be stored in this exact location. It was considered the foundation of the Royal Mint camp. If it were to be destroyed, the entire camp would certainly fall into shambles. Every month, the commander would distribute supplies from the warehouse as well as beast cores that acted as the main currency, to each person living in the camp. Even though the warehouse was in need of repair, it was spacious and divided into several sections. Walking into the warehouse, William proceeded to lead both Daniel and Steve to the battle preparation section. In the midst of that section, a large mechanical crate stood two meters tall. Steve, although your gene chain is incomplete, I don't have any extra gene drugs to give you. On the other hand, I requested a weapon from Texas that would be compatible with your gene ability. After William entered a string of passwords into the mechanical crate, the carrier slowly opened as a shroud of mist dispersed from within, revealing the equipment inside. As for whether or not you can control the weapon, it all depends on you. Upon seeing this weapon, not only was Steve shocked, but even Daniel's eyes widened in surprise. Instead of calling it a weapon, perhaps it would be more suitable to describe it as some sort of armor. Instead, a set of grand yet sturdy armor was meticulously placed inside the mechanical crate. Awaken, practitioner armor, Steve exclaimed. As Daniel was analyzing the crisp black armor, he could not help but ask more questions about its design. Thus, William gave Daniel a simple explanation. This set of armor was specifically created for awakened practitioners who possessed special gene abilities but were still unable to unleash their full potential. From the perspectives of the truly powerful awakened practitioners, they abhorred and looked down on these types of supplementary armor. For someone such as Steve, on the other hand, this set of armor would surely be of great use to him, similar to giving wings to a tiger. With the armor's assistance, he would no longer have to remain as a cripple who could only wait helplessly in the camp. Instead, he could finally return back to the battlefield. After listening to William's explanation, Daniel finally understood the specific uses of the armor. While the Grand Armor may look enticing, it was nevertheless inferior to the gene drugs that could directly enhance one's gene chain. Furthermore, there were several limitations to the armor itself. Placing himself into the armor from his wheelchair, Steve verified his identity and started up the device powering the armor. Well, this armor can increase your gene abilities, you should still pay attention to its consumption of gene energy, as it will greatly increase depending on how much energy your ability consumes. Now, try it out yourself, William said to Steve. Steve nodded 
as a hint of gray flashed before his eyes. Standing at the side, Daniel was caught off guard by the tremendous pressure weighing him down and almost fell to his knees. Compared to when Steve first used his ability, the gravitational effect was definitely several times stronger now. William, on the contrary, did not move a single inch under the sudden change in gravity, even as his expression remained unfazed. How strong could the commander be? After adjusting his strength and adapting to the gravitational field, Daniel stared at William in admiration. A few minutes later, the gravitational field that was pressing on Daniel suddenly vanished. Panting heavily inside his armor, Steve seemed to have used up all of his strength. As William previously stated, the improvements in one's gene chain ability after wearing the armor naturally led to the increase in consumption of gene energy. It just so happens that the new batch of recruits would benefit from training under the effects of your gravitational field. Not only that, but it would also allow you to learn more about your gene ability, William said to Steve after thinking for a while. Thank you, Commander. Despite his fatigue, Steve could not help but reveal an expression of joy. Early morning on the next day, Steve appeared on the Royal Mint's morning practice grounds with his set of black armor. The stylish black armor, emitting a mysterious aura, attracted the attention of the new recruits who had participated in the training. Daniel had also arrived at the field early. He wanted to take this opportunity to familiarize himself with his own strength and abilities. Having relied on brute force to fight up until now, Daniel realized it would eventually serve as his shortcoming if he continued to fight without any sort of technique. Daniel believed if he could learn to use his strength skillfully, that he could unlock his new potential and improve his overall abilities drastically. I will be giving you a lot of special training sessions today. You also won't be needing to carry any of those weights anymore, Steve said to the recruits participating in the training. When the new recruits heard that they didn't need to use heavy training, they immediately burst into cheers. With their current physical abilities, they were curious as to the difference between the special training and the training without wearing any heavy weights. After Steve activated the gravity field, the recruits screeched in horror as they finally understood the true meaning of hell. With Steve's gravitational field enhanced by his armor, even Daniel was taken by surprise again and almost fell flat to the ground as he did yesterday. Plop. Thump. Once the gravity field was activated, the recruits plopped face first into the ground like lumps of slime. Now stuck onto the ground, unable to move, they were at the mercy of Steve. Unlike yesterday, Daniel was well prepared for the sudden change in gravity. Taking advantage of the effects of the gravity field, he switched into a fighting stance and began performing a set of fist techniques. His technique was just the most basic of all fist techniques that even new recruits could execute skillfully. However, performing those fist techniques under the pressure of such gravity is certainly not an easy feat. All the recruits, still stuck to the ground, looked at him like some sort of monster. What kind of demonic training is this? I can't even lift my fingers. It feels like I'm carrying a large mountain on my back. Dear God, I want my heavy weights back instead. What kind of monster is he? How can he still practice the fist techniques under such conditions? Though the recruits were unable to move, they still managed to squeeze out a few words from the gaps between their teeth. Despite their desperate attempts to resist Steve's terrifying gravitational force, none of them managed to succeed, and all of them failed the training. Even though Daniel possessed a lot of stamina and strength, he noticed the restraint in his movements when practicing in the gravitational field. While he was practicing his fist techniques, Daniel activated strength from distress and absorbed the negative emotions emanating from the recruits. 
With each passing day, Daniel would continue practicing the fist techniques under Steve's gravitational field. In just a few days, Daniel had already mastered the set of basic fist techniques and even adapted to the gravitational field. One morning, when Daniel was training, he was suddenly alarmed by the ear-piercing sirens around the camp. Everyone in the camp was shocked. Those sirens were sounded by the detection tower, indicating the presence of enemies approaching their camp. Without any hesitation, Daniel ran towards the camp's gate. In a few minutes, their whole camp immediately fell into a state of readiness. Apart from Zeke, who was currently out on a mission, all the other awakened practitioners, including Steve, rushed to the main gate of Royal Mint. Arriving at the main gate, everyone noticed a large group of people slowly appearing in the distance from the campsite. The group appeared to consist of several hundred troops, nearly half the number of people in Royal Mint. Several of those troops raised a flag with the head of a fierce-looking yellow wolf on it. Sand wolves. Upon seeing the symbol on the flag, Daniel remembered the team of sand wolves that he slaughtered earlier in his first mission. Daniel frowned. No matter how much he tried to recall, he could not remember leaving anyone alive or leaving any signs that he was there. Thus, why would the troops from the sand wolves suddenly show their faces here? Furthermore, it would have taken more than a whole day to travel to Royal Mint from their camp. The commander of the Sand Wolves, John, has graced all of you with his presence. Why aren't you opening the gate and welcoming him? Said a loud voice from afar. Episode 17 Three Moves William rushed to the entrance of the camp immediately upon hearing the sirens. When William saw a tall and sturdy man wearing strange clothes leading the incoming group, his eyes became wide with amazement. This person was the commander of the Sand Wolves, John. John, what are you doing here? William asked. John, with a head of a wolf tattooed on his exposed arm, was bigger than William. I'm here to retrieve my belongings. William, I believe that you know what I'm talking about, John said. Stop talking nonsense. How could we possibly have anything that belongs to you? Did you just come here to cause some trouble? William shouted as his eyes squinted, and he stared menacingly at John. Since both the Royal Mint and Sand Wolves were F-class gathering grounds that were located close to each other, they would often come into contact when gathering resources from the surrounding areas. As such, they harbored a great sense of hatred towards one another. Stop trying to act innocent. I know that brat standing behind you killed one of our awakened practitioners, John shouted. Upon hearing his accusations, everyone from the Royal Mint gasped and turned their gazes towards the person standing behind William. Who else could it be but Daniel? What? Lord Daniel killed an awakened practitioner from the Sandwolves camp? Surely not. Killing a fellow awakened practitioner is a serious crime. All of the awakened practitioners among the Sandwolves are experienced, so how could any of them be defeated by someone who had just awakened not long ago? Everyone in the Royal Mint began talking amongst themselves. In this period, awakened practitioners are seen as valuable resources since it was not easy for one to awaken their genes. According to the regulations set by Texas, an awakened practitioner who is found guilty of this murderous act could only be judged by the higher-ups from Texas. Since F-class gathering points would usually only have a few awakened practitioners, they could not afford to lose even a single one of them as it would greatly reduce the overall strength of their respective camps. 
This was another reason why the morale of the entire Royal Mint camp had been so low after one of their awakened practitioners fell in battle. Since John actually accused Daniel of killing one of their awakened practitioners, how could they not be shocked? Nonsense. Do you have any proof? William shouted angrily with an unyielding gaze. He did not hesitate to protect Daniel. William, has it been too long since you fought against me? Have you already forgotten about my genes? John revealed a sinister smile. At that moment, he indeed wore an expression of a vicious wolf. Ancestral gene of the sand wolves. John's unique gene was a symbol of their camp, the sand wolves. Since a sand wolf possessed a keen sense of smell, it gave John the ability to sniff out the scent of the person responsible for killing Scott and his group. Huh. You dare accuse my men of such horrendous acts in my presence? Come and try. William stomped hard on the ground, leaving behind a deep footprint. At the same time, a layer of dark green scales surrounded William's arm like some sort of armor. Ancestral gene, giant tusked alligator. If I remember correctly, John should be an awakened practitioner with five completed gene chains. He's even stronger than our commander, said someone from the crowd in a low voice. Hearing that, Daniel took a step forward and appeared in front of William. Daniel... William was slightly shocked. John, one should take responsibility for their actions. Since Scott had intentions to murder my entire group, I took the initiative to kill him first. So what are you going to do about it? Daniel said with a loud and clear voice. Their awakened practitioner was really killed by Lord Daniel Wilson? Why did Lord Daniel Wilson admit it? He should have just remained silent and acted innocent since they have no proof against him. Isn't his confession tantamount to admitting his guilt? Lord Daniel Wilson must have been confused. Seeing how Daniel confessed, the expressions of the people in Royal Mint changed drastically. On the other hand, Aaron looked at Daniel with a wicked expression, ecstatic to witness him voluntarily walking into a trap. To actually kill an awakened practitioner, he's dead for sure. Lord John... We are completely unaware of that fact. It was all done by Daniel himself. Aaron stood up and sneered. A debt has its owner. If you want to avenge your men, then just look for Daniel. This business of yours has nothing to do with us. William turned around and stared at Aaron, his eyes flaming with rage. No matter what, you are the one who killed the awakened practitioner of our camp. Now I will give you two choices. A bloodthirsty look flashed across John's eyes. First, cripple your own genes, kneel on the ground, and beg for mercy. Second, take on three of my moves, and that'll be the end of it. Hearing his two conditions, the people of the royal mint were worried. While John may have given Daniel two choices, in reality, he only wanted to kill him. Daniel, stay behind me. With me here, no one will dare touch you, William said angrily. Commander, this is a serious crime committed by Daniel himself. Even if you manage to fend off John this time, will you be able to do the same to the soldiers sent from Texas next time? Aaron asked. Could the commander be willing to drag the entire Royal Mint camp into the water just for the sake of Daniel alone? Though Aaron's words were harsh, he nevertheless spoke the truth. William's gaze flickered, but he could not say anything in response. In that case, I'll choose the second option, said Daniel as he walked in front of John. Lord Daniel Wilson, don't choose any of his options. You won't be able to hold on. John is a powerhouse with five awakened gene chains. You'll surely die after taking three of his moves. The soldiers from the Royal Mint tried their best to stop Daniel. At this moment, a person wearing a set of armor stepped forward and stood beside Daniel. I'm willing to take the first blow for Daniel, 
said Steve as he gritted his teeth. Uncle Steve, you can't, said Daniel, who was shocked by his response. Before he even finished his sentence, a large fist formed from the sand that pierced through Steve's armor and sent him flying. Good for nothing trash who relies on his turtle shell is not worthy to negotiate with me, John said. Daniel's expression sunk. John, don't go overboard, William shouted. John, I, Daniel, swear that I will one day take your life, Daniel shouted. His gaze was now fixed on John's eyes as he had a serious look that meant he was going to kill him. Ha! It's just a pity that you won't have the chance. John was so angry that he began laughing. While his words were still echoing in the air, John appeared in front of Daniel. So fast. Crash. John's attack landed on Daniel's stomach, which sent him flying away like a cannonball being shot as he fell heavily to the ground. As the heavy impact spread through Daniel's entire body, he felt a sudden surge in his vital force as he smelled the blood lingered around his wound. Mmm. John frowned slightly. Since he used 40% of his strength in that punch, he thought that he could have killed Daniel with that one punch. To his surprise, Daniel stood back up immediately and did not seem to suffer any injuries. Is that all you got? Were you trying to tickle me? Daniel laughed. Lord Daniel actually withstood that hit? Is that the best John could do? Lord Daniel isn't even injured. Lord Daniel Wilson, you can do it! When the soldiers of the Royal Mint noticed Daniel standing back up, unscathed, they began to cheer for Daniel. Episode 18 Soul Devouring Wolf Claw All the Royal Mint soldiers burst into excitement when they realized how useless John's attack was when facing the tough and tenacious Daniel. However, William, who was standing on the side, frowned slightly since he knew how much stronger John was compared to himself. With that in mind, he was shocked to see Daniel withstand John's attack, even though he may have held back his strength. However, receiving his attack and coming out unscathed would undoubtedly agitate John even more, making his next attack even more terrifying. Very good. It seems that you're a bit stronger than trash. Hearing the cheers of people in the Royal Mint made John's lips curve up into a wicked smile. Let's see if you can still be so relaxed after taking my next hit. Seeing how proud they were of their awakened practitioner, John wanted to see what kind of reaction they would have after he obliterates that same person with a single move. It would certainly be quite the sight, wouldn't it? Bring it on. Daniel's gaze turned serious. Although he guessed that John did not use his full strength in his previous attack, that strike really did cause him to feel a great sense of pain that he had never felt before. Although he activated tenacity when receiving the attack, he still felt the searing pain surging through his veins. John's gaze became focused on killing. His aura became even more domineering with each step he took. As he charged towards Daniel, he looked like an alpha wolf going straight for the kill on his prey. What a terrifying aura! Could this be the true strength of an awakened practitioner with five awakened gene chains? Does that mean he wasn't being serious until now? Lord Daniel Wilson might not be able to withstand this attack then. If the second move is already this terrifying... I wonder what the third move would look like. Sensing the ferocious aura emanating from John, the soldiers of the Royal Mint who were previously excited were now in shock. At this moment, John's presence felt even more intimidating and overwhelming than William's at his full strength. One could only imagine how destructive his next attack would be. Brat, eat this! John shouted, as he sent a punch towards Daniel. Accumulating more speed with each step, 
His fist whistled through the air and even exploded in a series of sonic booms. Daniel clenched his teeth and threw back a punch of his own. Boom! As the two fists collided with each other, a large crater formed below them as pieces of the earth shot in every direction. Feeling as if he was hit by an iron hammer, a slight crack sounded just as a sharp pain spread through Daniel's body from the knuckles of his fist. In that instant of excruciating pain, Daniel almost let out an ear-piercing scream before the aftershock of the impact forced him backward. Crashing into a wall, Daniel seemed to have suffered a severe blow this time. At the same time, John was also knocked back from the impact. One, two, three steps. Only after taking three steps back did John manage to regain his balance. Pachoo! This time, Daniel's internal organs seemed to have taken quite a large shock as he could not help but spit out a mouthful of blood. Lord Daniel Wilson! Shouts of worry sounded from behind him as they witnessed the brunt of that terrifying attack. Although Daniel could barely endure the pain, he forced himself to stand back up, his movements much slower than before. Hmm, interesting. John was surprised to see how Daniel still had the strength to stand back up, despite suffering such a heavy injury. All right, I will give you one last chance. If you join our Sandwolves camp, I would be willing to dismiss my third move. Realizing Daniel's potential, John took this opportunity to recruit him into his camp. Although he could feel that Daniel was not very strong, having yet to complete his second gene chain, he was nevertheless impressed with his tenacity and his ability to withstand two attacks from him. After all, John was an awakened practitioner with a total of five gene chains. To be able to withstand even a single one of his attacks as awakened practitioner with a single completed gene chain was certainly something to be proud of. Daniel actually took on two of his attacks, let alone one, and was still able to stand back up. Daniel, your life is more important. Although William was not happy to say it, he still tried to persuade him. John's third attack would definitely be filled with the intentions to kill. Since Daniel had already suffered from quite a few injuries, he definitely won't be able to withstand the third blow. Therefore, the better choice would be for Daniel to join the Sandwolf camp first and try to find a way to get back out later on. <sighs> Have you not gotten your fill yet? Why don't you even use more strength? Wiping off the blood from the corner of his mouth, Daniel mocked and pointed his middle finger at John. How dare you not appreciate Master's act of mercy? Master John Thompson, kill him! You damn brat, how dare you provoke us? When the people of the Sandwolves camp saw Daniel's response, they fumed in rage and began shouting in protest. <laughs> Since you want to die so badly, then don't blame me for whatever happens. Seeing how Daniel had no intentions to join his camp and would rather die, John boiled in anger. Roaring like a wolf, John's entire arm swelled up as sharp needle-like hair started growing on his arm. His hands transformed into the claws of a wolf, which terrified everyone in the royal mint. At that moment, a dark, menacing aura began surrounding his claw. You should be honored to die by my gene chain technique, soul-devouring wolf claw. In an instant, John's claw slashed down on Daniel. Slicing through the air, John's claw trailed with an intent to kill as it tore down on Daniel's body. It's his gene chain technique. It's all over. An awakened practitioner's gene chain technique usually acts as their killing blow. Lord Daniel Wilson is in danger. She. As his claw tore down on Daniel's body, it left behind countless trails of fatal wounds as the black aura surrounding his claws seeped into Daniel's body. Ugh! Daniel let out a dire screech as he crashed heavily on the ground. Unlike previous times, 
Daniel did not stand back up as he simply laid silently on the ground. That damn brat has finally been dealt with. Aaron was beyond ecstatic as he gazed towards Daniel's seemingly lifeless body. John! William roared fiercely as he rushed forward and crashed into John. A series of massive shock waves exploded upon the collision, setting off a huge cloud of dust that engulfed everyone present. After a long while, the dust finally settled. At that moment, William stared straight towards John with bloodshot eyes, like a wild beast ready to swallow his prey whole. This was the first time anyone had seen him enraged to such an extreme. Huh, William, I have lost an awakened practitioner. Now you have lost one too. If you have any other complaints, I will be willing to entertain you. John said coldly, before leading his group's departure from the Royal Mint. William did not attempt to intercept him. After all, Daniel had been killed by John. It would be unreasonable for William, as a commander, to risk the entire Royal Mint camp for the sake of Daniel alone. John, you old bastard. A very weak but ear-piercing voice shot past John's ears just as he was about to leave. John opened his eyes wide in absolute disbelief. Turning his head back in shock, he looked at Daniel, who was lying still in the shallow pool of crimson. Mark my words, there will be a day when I take your life. Blood drizzled out from the corner of Daniel's mouth as he said with a weak voice, Come at me if you have the ability, John said in disdain. However, a trace of fear and panic suddenly arose in his heart. That brat is actually not dead. Episode 19, Fusion Gene How is Daniel not dead yet? When Aaron heard Daniel's voice, his heart tightened as his face revealed a look of disgust. In addition to suffering many injuries all over his body, the black aura from the soul-devouring wolf claw had even invaded Daniel's body and drained away much of his life force. Even with tenacity activated, he was still barely able to recover most of his life force. Despite going through that experience, Daniel was pleasantly surprised. In fact, he was overjoyed. Looking at his attribute panel now, he seemed to have gained more than he lost. Daniel, energy, 16,800 points. Stamina, 154 points. Strength, 358 points. Spiritual force, 54 points. Gene chain talent, strength of the ants. Complete ant gene chain, 100% complete. Innate skills, tenacity. Gene chain talent, strength from distress. Broken strength from distress gene, 28% completeness. Gene chain talent, sand wolf gene. Broken sand wolf gene, 18% completeness. That's right. When he received the three attacks from John, Daniel took that opportunity to extract his sand wolf gene. It was unknown whether it was due to the invasion of the black aura from the soul devouring wolf claw or Daniel's luck. After all, he only managed to successfully extract the sand wolf gene from John's body at the very last moment. Due to the sheer amount of pain, however, Daniel fainted for a while before regaining consciousness. Even after suffering through those injuries, he woke up feeling as if nothing had happened to his body. Other than feeling weak due to excessive blood loss, Daniel fully recovered. Lord Daniel Wilson, you're awake? Noticing that Daniel had regained consciousness, the nurse immediately walked over and asked out of concern. Yeah, I I'm fine now. Daniel immediately got off the bed and stretched his body. The speed at which he made his full recovery left the nurse dumbfounded. After all, it was just two days ago when Daniel was sent to the medical center, having almost lost all signs of life. 
Everyone was sure that the injuries Daniel suffered would end up affecting his body and future as an awakened practitioner. Thus, no one expected him to be as lively as he was two days later. Upon analyzing his attribute panel again, however, he made an unexpected discovery. Aside from the gene extraction, there was an additional option that Daniel had never seen before. Gene fusion. Huh, what is this? Out of pure curiosity, Daniel clicked on the option for gene fusion. Please select two genes to fuse together. One, strength of an ant, 100% complete. Two, strength from distress, 27% complete. Three, sand wolf gene, 18% complete. Note, the two selected genes will fuse and transform into another gene. After the two genes successfully fuse as one, there will be a slight decrease in its completion. A decrease in its completion? When Daniel saw this side effect, he frowned in disappointment. Would that mean that all the progress he previously made not work after the gene fusion? When Daniel just extracted strength from distress, the gene's completion was 24%. Despite using it for so many days, it had only reached 27% completion. This showed just how much more difficult it was to complete a gene extracted from a fellow awakened practitioner. Since strength of ants serves as the foundation of my strength, I probably shouldn't be using it to test out the new function. Thus, I might as well use the other two genes to test it out. Daniel thought to himself before choosing to fuse strength from distress and sand wolf gene. Upon fusing the two genes, Daniel almost collapsed to the ground as he felt a sharp pain in his body, as if all of his internal organs were mixing together. Having suffered the same fate after his previous gene extractions, Daniel already prepared himself to receive the same amount of pain. Despite his preparations, he was in so much pain that his face turned pale as cold sweat began dripping down his forehead. The fusion process lasted for about 10 minutes, but Daniel felt as if it lasted for an eternity. Gene fusion complete. Obtained a new gene chain talent. Nether wolf gene. 25% completion. While trying to figure out what his newly fused gene could do, he suddenly realized that his spiritual force had increased by more than 100 points. At this moment, Daniel's spiritual force has now reached a total of 153 points. Does this gene have some sort of relation to spiritual force? Seeing how much his stats had increased, Daniel could not hold back the excitement in his voice. Ever since he obtained and completed Strength of the Ants, Daniel's stamina and strength had improved greatly. His spiritual force, however, did not show any signs of improvement. But now, Daniel finally discovered a gene that could enhance his spiritual force. He knew that the spiritual force from the memories of the original owner of this body was directly linked with the quality of one's gene energy. Awakened practitioners with tremendous stamina and strength would be treated as a strong warrior. For example, Zeke's big yellow ape. Ancestral gene raised his stamina and strength to a level that would literally be impossible for ordinary people to reach. However, facing an awakened practitioner with strong spiritual force, Zeke would be defeated in an instant. The more spiritual force one possesses, the better the quality of one's gene energy. Steve was training to raise his spiritual force with the assistance of the awakened practitioner armor. However, the effects of such training were limiting as it was not an efficient method to increase one's spiritual force. Now that Daniel found a way to increase his spiritual force through gene fusion, he would be extremely elated. Walking out of the medical center, the mellow yet radiant moonlight gleamed over Daniel's figure giving him a sense of comfort. Fuh. Suddenly, a rather weird voice sounded out of Daniel's throat, causing him to feel shocked. Only after a while did he finally realize that the moonlight could actually stimulate his netherwolf gene. 
Could this be the legendary ability capable of absorbing the very essence of the moon? Daniel wondered about that absurd possibility. With tenacity, constantly active, Daniel gradually recovered back to his peak state only after a mere few days. Furthermore, Daniel also discovered, with his newly fused netherwolf gene, that his mental state would not be affected even if he did not get enough sleep at night. This was the effect of his increased spiritual force, as well as from the netherwolf gene. That night, Daniel attached the bionic arm on his body. With swift yet silent movements, he managed to avoid alerting the scouts on the outskirts as he secretly left the Royal Mint camp by himself. Daniel's destination was Area D, the location of his first ever mission. Ever since his first mission there, he had always felt that the area was rather abnormal compared to the other hunting grounds. He found Area D to be rather strange as there were far too many bloodthirsty furious ants at that location. Even during the previous war against the E-class lair of the bloodthirsty furious ants, their team had encountered so many of those ants. Since Daniel's stamina was now greater than before, he sprinted all the way to Area D in only three hours, when it would usually take a day for the others from the Royal Mint to get there on foot. Under the dusk of the night sky, Area D appeared even more eerie as silence filled the atmosphere. Due to the freezing temperatures of the desert at night, a thin layer of frost had even formed above the sand. Daniel slowly stumbled into Area D. As expected, the place was still the same abandoned camp. What surprised Daniel, on the other hand, was how the corpses of the bloodthirsty furious ants that he killed previously had somehow vanished without a trace. Bloodthirsty furious ants had the habit of dragging their dead comrades back to their lair as food. But Daniel was sure that he had already killed all the bloodthirsty furious ants. Now that the corpses of the bloodthirsty furious ants had disappeared, that could only mean one thing. There were other bloodthirsty furious ants within caverns leading to their lair. Episode 20 Roar of the Nether After a moment of thought, Daniel jumped into the cave without any hesitation. Since Daniel now possessed the nether wolf's gene, he could still see clearly despite being surrounded by the darkness of the cave. It was like wearing night vision goggles. The length of the cave stretched longer than he expected. Walking among the moist and uneven surface, it took more than ten seconds before Daniel managed to reach the bottom section of the cave. The cave of the bloodthirsty furious ants. Daniel looked steadily and intently as he walked down the dark tunnel. At that moment, one of the bloodthirsty furious ants seemed to have noticed Daniel's presence and rushed over from the other end of the tunnel. Daniel remained unfazed as he killed the ant with a single punch. After extracting its beast core, he proceeded to walk forward like nothing happened. A bloodthirsty furious ant appeared with each step he took. Daniel continued walking down the cave. He carved out a path of corpses that were trailed with a stream of blood, which penetrated deep into the lair of the ants. About ten minutes later, he finally walked out of the tunneling cave and found himself in an open cavern. This large space underground was clearly dug out by the bloodthirsty furious ants. Looking around the cavern, it seemed that the cave that Daniel took was merely one of the hundreds of other paths leading to this place. In the midst of the spacious cavern, an enormous white ant, which seemed to be the queen, was surrounded by dozens of other bloodthirsty furious ants. Taking the other bloodthirsty furious ants he fought into account, Daniel estimated there to be hundreds of them, maybe even more, in this single lair. As the queen ant was feeding the bloodthirsty furious ants surrounding her, she wiggled around slightly as another bloodthirsty furious ant came out of her body. Compared to the other fully matured bloodthirsty furious ant, the newborn was not nearly as big in size. It did not pose much of a threat. It seems that I've discovered her majesty. Daniel, 
who was still hiding at the side of the cavern, looked at the entire underground kingdom of ants and let out a heavy sigh. Look at how many beast cores are moving around before me. I wonder how many beast cores I will get after killing all these ants. The queen's beast core will definitely be much more precious. Without much hesitation, Daniel proceeded to jump down. Landing on the ground of the cavern, his feet stomped heavily with a muffled sound that echoed through the area. This unexpected sound stunned all of the bloodthirsty furious ants in the cave. Roar! All the bloodthirsty furious ants roared and charged towards Daniel. It looks like I've angered the tempest. Daniel burst into laughter as he switched into a fighting stance. Taking the initiative in the battle, he dashed into the horde of bloodthirsty furious ants fearlessly. The descent of the fierce tiger, the elegance of the white crane, the ferocity of the sea hydra, the fearlessness of the yellow dragon. Like a god of war, Daniel charged into the horde of bloodthirsty furious ants and began slaughtering them. Instead of a battle between him and the ants, it felt more like a one-sided massacre in Daniel's favor. As he continued killing the bloodthirsty furious ants, he noticed that a trace of spiritual force would enter his body with each kill he performed. At the same time, the completion of the netherwolf gene gradually increased. To his surprise, the effects of strength from distress was still active despite having fused the gene. Due to the effect of strength from distress, the netherwolf gene was able to absorb the death aura from the corpses of the bloodthirsty furious ants to improve its gene chain. Realizing how the gene worked, Daniel became even more excited as he lost his mind in this massacre. John is indeed a strong awakened practitioner with five completed gene chains. Furthermore, he had more resources at his disposal since he is the commander of his camp. The only way for Daniel to catch up to him would be to take advantage of his new abilities and increase his strength as soon as possible. After all, there was no other method that would allow a person's strength to increase by leaps and bounds unlike the ones presented to him by the extraction system. Charge. In a moment of carelessness, Daniel left his back unguarded, which gave one of the bloodthirsty furious ants the opportunity to land a bite with his jaws. Well, it may have left behind a searing pain on his back. Not only did he not slow down, but he even increased the speed of his attacks like some sort of maniac. Die, die, die. Daniel roared as he went crazy. After killing who knows how many bloodthirsty furious ants, Daniel's entire body was covered in a thick layer of crimson. With most of the bloodthirsty furious ants now dead, the queen ant finally made her first move. Wiggling around like a derailed train, the queen ant opened her jaws and pounced towards Daniel. As she attempted to stomp down on him, Daniel shot up from his position and dodged the queen ant's attacks while landing a counterattack of his own on her body. Even though the queen ant was covered in a thick layer of mucus, Daniel's attack at its full strength was still unable to produce any sort of damage to her armor. It's no wonder that they say only the awakened practitioners are able to deal with this thing. Ordinary attacks are basically useless against it. Daniel frowned when he realized that his attack had failed. Daniel did not have any effective methods of attacking. His complete gene chain only gave him a strong self-healing ability and an increase in physical strength. What methods could he use that would be effective on the queen ant? Suddenly, Daniel's gaze fell on his half-finished bionic arm. Energy charging. Shot launched. At that instant, a bright ray of light shot out from the bionic arm, momentarily illuminating the entire cavern before piercing through the queen ant's body. The mucus on the queen ant's body could block physical attacks, but it could not block the attacks that utilized gene energy. The bionic arm's beam blasted a large hole open in the queen ant's body as green blood gushed out. Letting out a screech in pain after suffering a severe injury, she opened her mouth and sprayed out a stream of venom at Daniel. Luckily, Daniel immediately dodged the attack. 
As the venom landed on the ground, it produced a sizzling sound and melted the earth beneath. That was a close one. Daniel let out a sigh of relief as he looked at the terrifying effects of the venom. Even if Daniel did possess tenacity, it would be difficult for him to recover from a wound caused from the corrosion of the venom. Fortunately, the queen ant was enormous. While it may not be the slowest beast, its movements were limited due to the space available within the cavern. Thus, Daniel found it rather easy to land his attacks on the queen ant. With the spiritual force provided by the netherwolf gene, Daniel's gene energy was very strong indeed. Although the bionic arm's laser cannon consumed a decent amount of gene energy, it was nevertheless something that he could bear. After half an hour, Daniel was now exhausted as if he had already fired off dozens of lasers. Full of holes on her body, the queen ant was now on the verge of death. Seeing how the queen ant was unable to move, Daniel walked towards her and finished her off once and for all. After cutting open the queen ant's head, Daniel pulled out her beast core. The queen ant's beast core was completely different from that of the normal bloodthirsty furious ant. Not only was it the size of a palm, but it was also round-shaped. The commander once told me that a queen ant's beast core could be used to create gene drugs. I wonder what kind of effect it will have on my body after absorbing it. Daniel muttered to himself. Clenching tightly on his fists, he absorbed the queen ant's beast core. Then, Daniel looked through the value on his attribute panel. There was no change in the energy, but he noticed a new value in his panel. Intermediate energy, 100 points. Netherwolf gene, 100% complete. Innate skill, roar of the nether. Amidst the massacre of the ants, Daniel had absorbed a large amount of death aura from their corpses and had unknowingly completed the netherwolf gene in a single night. He had completed his second gene chain. Ecstatic by his achievements, he could not wait to try out Roar of the Nether. <sighs> With a single roar, the entire cavern trembled uncontrollably as if shaken by the voice of a demon. Episode 21 Challenge Today was scheduled as the day when the supplies would be distributed among the people in Wei Yang Royal Mint. The awakened practitioners, who were the pillars of strength and guardians of the camp, received more than the usual. Steve and Daniel woke up early in the morning and went to the warehouse to pick up the supplies. When they arrived, they noticed two figures who seemed to have already been waiting for a long time. One stood tall and sturdy, while the other leaned elegantly on the side. Those two were Zeke and Krista. After greeting Daniel, Krista walked in front of him and gently placed her delicate palm on his chest. Oh, how strong the youngsters' bodies are. To be able to recover from such severe injuries so quickly. Krista smiled as she teased him. Your physique is even sturdier than the body of this reckless man over here. What Krista said made Daniel feel a little awkward, so he took a step back and smiled. Sister Krista, I, surely I can't compare to Brother Zeke's physique. Amidst their laughter and conversation, William and Aaron slowly walked over from the side. William opened the door to the warehouse and started to distribute the supplies to everyone present. The amount of supplies they received each month included a month's worth of food, water, electricity, and other daily needs. It also included a certain amount of beast cores. As awakened practitioners, not only would they receive several times more supplies than the ordinary people in the camp, but they also received some equipment and resources that were specifically created for each of them. Zeke, here are your two bottles of strength-boosting pills. Krista, here is your 100 milliliters of venom directly extracted from the seventh stage withered leaf snake. Aaron, this should be your wind element aura sensor. Steve, here is a special bottle of spiritual force pills created by Texas. 
It can help increase the amount of spiritual force in your body. William said with a serious expression as he took out a bottle of blue pills and gave it to Steve. Zeke, Krista, and Aaron were all stunned when they saw the bottle of medicine. They all looked shocked as they turned to look at the spiritual force pills in Steve's hand. It seems that Texas values Brother Steve's gene chain talent quite a bit since they're actually willing to give you such a valuable resource. Krista said, smiling. Those spiritual force pills are extremely rare to come by. Old Steve, I'll trade you two bottles of strength boosting pills for it, Zeke said jokingly. Brother Zeke, just take a look at the state of my body. What can I even use those strength boosting pills for? Steve did not know whether to laugh or cry. He could only rely on his own gene chain talent as his main weapon. After all, he is now an awakened practitioner, not the fierce warrior that he once was. Focusing all his efforts on strengthening his gravitational field, Steve desperately needed to increase his spiritual force so that he can keep up with the others in critical moments. Commander, I remember that awakened practitioners have a chance to issue a challenge every month. Aaron stared at the spiritual force pills in Steve's hands. That's right. The rules of Texas state that there is an opportunity each month for awakened practitioners to challenge their fellow comrades. The victor of that challenge would be able to obtain the loser's monthly supplies, William said. The previous duel between Aaron and Daniel was simply a personal dispute. The monthly challenge between the awakened practitioners was similar to the battle between the two of them. The official battle, on the other hand, would take place at the teardrop arena at the center of their camp to make it seem more formal. They would need to have the commander on the side to act as the referee of the battle and ensure its fairness, even though there was no such thing as absolute fairness in this world. The reason why Texas allowed for such monthly challenges was to arouse the competitive spirits of the awakened practitioners. That way, the stronger awakened practitioner would be able to monopolize the resources for themselves. As for the weaker awakened practitioner, the valuable resources that they obtained would be useless if they could not protect it with their own abilities. Aaron, what are you trying to do? Zeke said in an irritated tone, Brother Steve awakened not long ago, yet you already want to challenge him? Having taken a fancy to the spiritual force potion in Steve's possession, Aaron wanted to use this method to obtain it for himself. Ugh, the spiritual force potion will definitely be a waste in his hands. He should be fine as long as he hides in his turtle shell anyway. Thus, there's no need for him to waste such precious resources, Aaron said arrogantly. Yeah, I think so too. Daniel agreed with a smile. Commander, I've decided to challenge Aaron. I feel that it would be a waste for him to have so many resources in his hands. It would be no different than flushing them down the toilet. His unexpected words caught everyone by surprise. Daniel, you have just recovered from your injuries yet. William frowned and said, Commander, I accept Daniel's challenge. Without waiting for William to finish, Aaron interrupted and immediately accepted his challenge. Your last victory was merely a fluke, since it will be an official challenge this time. Don't expect me to hold back. I will let you have a taste of true power. Aaron said fiercely. If Daniel was at his peak strength, Aaron might have hesitated. After all, who wouldn't be terrified of someone capable of withstanding three deadly strikes from John without dying? Daniel should still be recovering from the severe injuries he suffered, but he still dared to challenge Aaron to a fight. As for Aaron, he took advantage of this opportunity to regain the face he lost from their previous fight. He saw Daniel as a simple-minded brat who only knew how to think with his muscles, similar to Zeke. As long as he was careful, Daniel would not be a match for him. No matter how strong Daniel was, he was still an awakened practitioner with one gene chain. Having almost completed his third gene chain, 
Aaron believed comparing their strength would be like comparing heaven and earth. You better not say that I'm bullying you. I'll even be generous enough to give you three days to prepare yourself. Aaron sneered. You've gone too far. If you really have the ability, wait for Brother Daniel's injury to heal before you compete with him, you despicable scumbag. Zeke shouted as he could not bear to watch this any longer. He's the one who dared to challenge me in the first place. If he's really that afraid to lose, he should have kept quiet. Aaron said scornful. There's no need for any preparations. Since I'm in a hurry, we should fight it out now. Daniel said to Aaron with a faint smile. Aaron was like a fly that was circling around him, not posing much of a threat, but was indeed annoying. Therefore, Daniel wanted to use this chance to scare him away and deal with the annoyance once and for all. The group quickly arrived at the center of the camp. When the people in the camp heard news of their duel, they all rushed over to watch the battle. Duels between awakened practitioners were not a daily occurrence, much less a battle on Daniel and Aaron's level. For most of the normal people in the camp, they would never even as hope to cause a scratch on an awakened practitioner's body. No one expected Daniel to battle against other awakened practitioners in less than a month after awakening. As soon as the news of Daniel's battle spread, the people in the camp knew that something miraculous was about to take place. All right, you better not call me a bully now. You still have that bionic arm, right? Why don't you use it? Aaron looked at Daniel and said with a tone full of contempt. Episode 22 The Might of the Basic Fist Technique Lord Daniel Wilson's injuries haven't completely healed, right? Why would Lord Daniel accept Aaron's challenge? He surely won't stand a chance if he were to fight with his injuries. Don't you know? Lord Daniel Wilson was the one who issued the challenge. What? When the crowd found out that Daniel was the one who challenged Aaron, they could not believe their ears. Having received three of John's attacks, many people thought that Daniel would have died for sure. Who would have thought that Daniel would be able to survive by relying on his powerful recovery ability? Although he somehow managed to survive, many people still felt that Daniel needed to fully recover from the fatal injuries. After all, it was a miracle for Daniel to still be alive after withstanding three attacks from an awakened practitioner with five gene chains. To still be able to maintain his peak strength after that would surely be a pipe dream. Even during William's last battle against John, it was clear that William was at a disadvantage. This showed just how terrifying John's strength was. Even though Daniel's injury had yet to fully heal, he took the initiative to challenge Aaron. While his previous challenge with Zeke was only a friendly match, this challenge against Aaron was an official match. Only God knows how long had it had been since there was an official awakened practitioner challenge at the Royal Mint camp. He might have a chance against Aaron if he uses the bionic arm. Zeke said softly as he looked at Daniel and Aaron on the arena. Having personally experienced the capability of Daniel's bionic arm, he could not help but think that way. In his mind, Daniel was not only recovering from his previous injuries, but had yet to complete even one gene chain. No matter how weak or poor Aaron was, he would surely not lose to Daniel this time. Seeing how this was an official match, Daniel's chances of winning were low. Nonsense. Why would I need to use my bionic arm to beat up a dog? Daniel smiled and said casually. It was obvious he didn't think much of Aaron. Hmm, he's not going to use the bionic arm. Zeke looked at Daniel upon hearing his words. Since the bionic arm could send even Zeke flying, it must certainly be a strong weapon. Using it now would definitely increase Daniel's odds of victory. Just watch. William said quietly on the side. Since William was the one who gave him the bionic arm, he was certain that it could only give him little power since it was still a semi-finished product. 
To be able to send Zeke flying with a single punch, Daniel would have had to rely more on his own strength rather than a mere bionic arm. Thus, William knew Daniel was very strong and believed that he had yet to show his full strength. Since you want to die so much, I will grant you that wish. When Aaron heard Daniel's mockery, his entire body engulfed in rage. Looking back at his past achievements, Aaron was someone who had completed his first gene chain as fast as two days. Furthermore, his prestige in Royal Mint was second only to the commander, William. Ever since Daniel appeared before him, he had only caused Aaron further trouble, in addition to tarnishing his reputation in the camp. Now that he had the chance to fight Daniel again, Aaron wanted to let Daniel know the true difference between them as awakened practitioners. Last time, I was generous enough to let you win. This time, you won't have such a chance. Aaron shouted. Instead of charging towards Daniel recklessly like he did last time, he distanced himself and shot out in an invisible wind blade towards him. You're just some trash who hasn't even awakened a single gene chain talent. Allow me to show you what a real awakened practitioner is truly capable of doing. Aaron possessed a wind element gene chain, and the first ability he awakened was wind blade. Not only did the wind blade consume a very small amount of gene energy, but it could also be used frequently. In addition to its extraordinary firepower, it could even be used to attack from afar. This was Aaron's true strength. Aaron used his genetic ability the moment the match started. It seems like Aaron intends to end the battle quickly. How will the injured Lord Daniel Wilson react to this attack? This wind blade is well known as Aaron's ace since he once used it to kill dozens of bloodthirsty furious ants without suffering any injuries himself. That was when he began making a name for himself. Everyone cried out in alarm when they saw Aaron display the wind blade technique the moment the match began. Daniel will dodge it quickly, Steve said loudly when he saw this scene. After becoming an awakened practitioner, he understood the true power of an awakened practitioner. Just this single wind blade alone would be more terrifying than a full-powered attack from a high-level warrior. It did not appear that Daniel had any intentions to dodge it and simply let the wind blades fly at him. But suddenly, Daniel made his move. Clenching his fist tightly, he began shattering the barrage of wind blades flying towards him. Huh, what a joke. I want to see how many wind blades you can block. Aaron was not taken aback by Daniel's ability to shatter his wind blade. After all, the wind blade's strength did not lie in its single target power but instead in its persistence. Dance of the Wind Blades. Aaron did not hesitate to activate his second genetic ability. Aaron spread out his arms as the blades of wind swirled around his body like sighs of a reaper harvesting the souls of others. Does he want to kill Daniel? Commander, quickly tell Aaron to stop. Zeke said in a worried tone after seeing Aaron activate his second gene chain talent. The surrounding crowd also held their breath under the shocking scene. Under the overwhelming storm of the wind blades, how long could Daniel continue resisting? Die! With a single wave of his hand, Aaron sent the fury of wind blades towards Daniel in an attempt to kill him. However, Daniel remained unfazed. Compared to John's soul-devouring wolf claw, the fury of wind blades were like feathers tickling his body. Having already withstood the soul-devouring wolf claw, some sharp, concentrated air would not pose a threat to him. As Daniel switched into a familiar fighting stance, everyone's eyes became wide as they stared at him in utter disbelief. Wait, isn't that the stance of our basic fist technique? From the looks of it, that seems to be the case. But why would an awakened practitioner suddenly use the basic fist technique? There's no way that could be true. Isn't the basic fist technique used for training? Even normal warriors wouldn't use it when fighting against other enemies. Everyone began talking and asking questions. 
The fish techniques that Daniel was using were the lowest level fish techniques that every recruit would have learned in the Royal Mint camp. Not only would the normal soldiers be used to it, but even the other people from other positions could easily perform a few moves. <laughs> the basic fist technique. Daniel, did you resort to using that technique since you don't have any other skills? Seeing Daniel's stance, Aaron immediately burst into laughter. What followed, however, abruptly silenced his laughter. Under the stance of the basic fist technique, Daniel destroyed each and every wind blade coming his blade-like fierce tiger. Moves from the basic fist technique emerged one after another as each wind blade shattered. Swift dragon steps. Descent of the fierce tiger. Spirit of the serpent. Crash. Bang. One after another, each wind blade shattered in the air upon contact with Daniel's basic attacks. In contrary to the basic fist techniques, Daniel seemed to have improved the technique and made it his own. Each of his movements was swift, yet did not waste a single move, destroying every wind blade that came his way. He seemed like an impenetrable wall as he remained unfazed. This, this is impossible. Aaron's expression turned pale in pure shock. The killer move that he was so proud of his strongest gene chain technique was actually blocked by Daniel using his version of the basic fist techniques. Hmm, this gene chain technique of yours is only so-so, Daniel said with a mocking tone as he had shattered every wind blade that came his way. Episode 23, Utter Defeat Daniel's basic fist techniques actually managed to block Aaron's wind blade dance. Is this the true potential of the basic fist techniques? It's not that the basic fist technique is strong, it's that Lord Daniel Wilson is unbelievably strong. Even if he only uses the basic fist techniques, he can still resist Aaron's gene chain abilities. Everyone saw firsthand how Daniel managed to break the fury of wind blades using his basic fist techniques. The entire crowd of spectators erupted into a roar as their hearts pounded in suspense. This scene was far too shocking. They would have never thought that the basic fist techniques used by the recruits to train and strengthen their bodies could actually display such tremendous power. The reason why these fist techniques are known as the basics is because they are the foundation to every other fist techniques. Daniel exclaimed with a serious expression. All the other fist techniques that you know have all derived and evolved from these basic fist techniques. As long as you train long enough, you will still be able to beat your enemies to a pulp no matter what sort of advanced techniques they possess. Daniel's speech pierced directly through Aaron as a sharp dagger. At this point, Aaron had already used his ace, the Dance of the Wind Blades, and thrown out the rest of his trump cards in Daniel's face. However, he never expected Daniel to use the basic fist techniques that everyone knew to break Aaron's Dance of the Wind Blades. Does this mean that Aaron's wind blades are actually useless? If he could not even deal with an injured awakened practitioner, how could he possibly convince the others in the royal mint of his strength? Daniel! Roaring out furiously, Aaron's face boiled in rage as he stared at Daniel. How could Aaron, an elite awakened practitioner in the royal mint camp, endure such public humiliation? Since you've already used all your techniques, it should be my turn now, right? Daniel's eyes suddenly became bloodthirsty. Stomping his feet heavily on the ground, a large crater appeared on the hard stone floor as cracks spread across all around the impact. At that instance, Daniel exploded towards Aaron like a meteor. Surrounding his entire body with wind, Aaron began floating as he tried to dash away from Daniel. Knowing Daniel's combat strength, Aaron did not dare fight him head on. Dashing around with the speed of the wind, he hoped to outspeed Daniel 
and slowly wear him down using his wind blades. However, Aaron was immediately caught off guard. As a gray light flashed across Daniel's eyes, a dark aura began rising from his body. Instantly, Daniel's speed skyrocketed as he caught up to Aaron. What? How are you? Turning around and seeing Daniel right behind him, Aaron's eyes widened in pure disbelief. You're such an idiot. Daniel revealed a sinister smile as he looked towards Aaron. Descent of the fierce tiger. Crash. Receiving the blunt of Daniel's attack, Aaron's body crashed and landed fiercely onto the ground as a loud shockwave reverberated throughout the arena. Cold chills shivered down the spine of the spectators as if they were the ones receiving the punch. Dan... This... Daniel, when did you become so powerful? Seeing Daniel fiercely smashing Aaron to the ground, he could not help but scratch his head as he said in a confused manner. Although Aaron can't do much damage to me, he is still an extremely difficult opponent to deal with. How did he get knocked out by Daniel so easily? Said Zeke. As William listened to Zeke's words, his eyes flickered as he fell into a moment of deep thought. Then, Daniel stepped on Aaron's body. Weighted down by Daniel's feet, Aaron's weak little body was almost unable to withstand it anymore. Aaron's pale face revealed a pained expression. When he looked at Daniel again, there was no longer any hatred left in his eyes, as it was quickly replaced by terror. He did not understand how Daniel's strength had improved so fast within such a short period of time. In their first battle, Aaron underestimated Daniel, resulting in his defeat. Aaron clearly knew in his heart that Daniel had increased his strength by several folds since then. However, was his strength not growing a bit too fast? After all, he had only been staying in Royal Mint for less than a month. Will you admit defeat? Daniel asked Aaron as he was looking down at him with the intent of killing him. Ever since Daniel had become an awakened practitioner, Aaron had been targeting him whenever he got the chance. But now, he even wanted to target Steve. Daniel couldn't bear it any longer. If he swatted down this annoying past this time, Aaron would surely come up with something else to exact his revenge. I... I surrender, Aaron said hesitantly. He was completely frightened by Daniel. Daniel's body emitted an intimidating aura, and he knew Daniel intended to kill him. Aaron was convinced that Daniel would kill him on the spot if he dared to say the word. No! Having already killed one of the awakened practitioners from the Sandwolves camp, why would he not dare to kill another? Hand over your wind element aura sensor, Daniel said coldly as he stretched out his hand. Aaron did not hesitate in giving him the item. As long as he could keep his life, not to mention the wind element aura sensor, he would be willing to give Daniel everything that he had if not needed to. Aaron took out a bottle of light green misty substance from his pocket and handed it to Daniel. Daniel put away the test tube and lifted his foot from Aaron's body. All right, I declare that Daniel won this challenge. Now, everyone quickly return to your positions, said William in a deep commanding voice declaring that the duel was over. With that, the surrounding crowd left. While Daniel may have made a name for himself in the battle, he had unknowingly started to overshadow his two senior awakened practitioners, Zeke and Krista. The scene of Daniel using his basic fist techniques to overcome Aaron's dance of the wind blades was deeply imprinted into the minds of the spectators. Everyone now admires him as a mighty and extraordinary figure in the camp, befitting of the title God of War. Ever since the duel, the news of Daniel's basic fist techniques circulated and made its way into the warrior's usual training routine. 
other than the royal men's soldiers who had to train and improve their martial arts under the gravitational field every day. Some of the camp's non-combatants followed suit and started practicing their fist techniques as well. After losing to Daniel, Aaron left the arena in a dejected state and did not show his face ever since. Having lost all his face from that duel, he no longer had the courage to appear in front of the others again. Needless to say, Aaron had been beaten by Daniel. From that day forward, Aaron would avoid anything related to Daniel. After the challenge ended, William had summoned Daniel over to his barracks. When he arrived at William's room, the only one there was William. Commander, do you have something you need from me? Daniel went straight to the point. Episode 24, Trade Market Congratulations, Daniel. You have not only defeated Aaron, but you have even gained the recognition of everyone in Royal Mint. William praised Daniel for the first time. Ever since you displayed your prowess with the basic fist techniques, all the recruits and even the veterans have begun training 50% more than ever before. All of this was made possible from your hard work, William said while tapping his finger on the table. <laughs> Stop flattering me, Commander. I've always been someone who treats others how I want them to treat me. If anyone dares to offend me, I will only show them a certain degree of respect. Daniel smiled humbly. But if someone offends me again and again, I will simply have to end them once and for all. William rolled his eyes upon hearing those words. He has already beaten Aaron, yet he claims to still be showing him a bit of respect. But William did not call Daniel over just to ask about the matter between him and Aaron. Since his grudge against Aaron was a personal one, he did not believe that it would be a good idea to interfere, even though he was the commander. Daniel, listen to me for a moment. You should know that our F-Class gathering ground is ranked as the lowest and most basic unit among other camps. Above our gathering ground are the other superior camps, ranging from E, D, C, B, and A. The Texas subsidiary camp is a D-Class gathering ground, which is much more powerful than our small camp. William said to Daniel, in the center of the three F-class gathering grounds, which includes the Royal Mint, Sandwolves, and Zuri, there is an E-class gathering ground called the Roaring Tribe. In the next few days, there will be a magnificent trade in their gathering ground. At that time, there will be many exquisite and rare items up for trade there. Perhaps we might even be able to find some good items. You should go and take a look for yourself. However, you will have to be extremely careful of John. His most recent visit to Royal Mint might very well have something to do with that trade gathering. There is a very good chance that you'll bump into him there. William advised Daniel. Daniel's heart trembled slightly after hearing that. Although he had only completed two of his gene chains... Daniel's strength had already improved by leaps and bounds. If he really does end up meeting John, it would be one thing to make his move at that trade gathering. Whether he could pose a threat to that beast was another matter. Although Daniel may have only completed two of his gene chains and did not have much information regarding John's other abilities, he was still confident that he could successfully escape John's pursuit of him if that moment did come. Therefore, when Daniel heard the news that John might be going, he was not worried at all. On the contrary, there was even a trace of excitement on his face. Commander, I must go and take a look at this trade gathering, Daniel said to William excitedly. The trade gathering mainly uses beast cores to do business. I will give you some beast cores so that you can choose items that will help you increase your strength there, William said 
before taking out a leather bag and placing it on the table. This bag should contain 80 beast cores. I can only help you up to this point. If it's not enough, you are on your own. Thank you, Commander. A trace of gratitude flashed across Daniel's eyes as he thanked William and let out a sigh of relief. Fortunately for Daniel, he still had the beast cores that he earned from sweeping through the ant's lair that night. Instead of absorbing the near hundred ant beast cores, he had only absorbed the one he received from the corpse of the queen ant. Seeing Daniel's happy face, William coughed dryly and asked, Ahem. Can you tell me more about your second gene chain now? Oh, it seems that I have been caught red-handed by you, Commander. Daniel replied with a hearty laugh. I don't know how I have managed to awaken my second gene chain. I only realized the existence of it after I woke up from my coma due to severe injuries. Could the awakening of your second gene chain have something to do with John? William wondered. No, well... You can just consider it as a blessing in disguise. Many awakened practitioners would never have the chance to awaken their second gene chain, even in their dreams, said William as he patted Daniel's shoulder. At the time of the initial gene test, William remembered that Daniel's gene chain was the weakest of the superhuman gene and had no room for growth. However, he never expected that in this short period of a mere month, that the one with the fastest growth in strength was the gene they thought was the weakest. The growth and power of Daniel's superhuman gene was terrifying. As doubts began forming in William's mind, he wanted to test Daniel's genes again to see if there were any errors. After a few days, Daniel prepared himself to go to the trade gathering. After greeting the commander, he began his journey towards the Roaring Tribe. Originally, Daniel thought that he would go alone, but an unexpected companion joined him on his journey right before he left. Come, little brother Daniel. Help me lift my luggage. I'll give you ten beast cores as a tip. Krista threw the bag of luggage to Daniel without any hesitation. Wearing a dark crimson dress that resembled an evening gown, she walked slowly in front of him. Although the weight of the bag was nothing to Daniel, he was irritated by Krista's behavior. Since he received ten beast cores as a tip, however, he didn't mind it as much. Daniel walked behind and looked at Krista's elegant figure. Her seductive curves and slim waist agitated him. This evil succubus. Daniel cursed and quickly turned his gaze away, no longer looking at Krista. Little brother Daniel, why did you suddenly think of going to the trade market? Krista asked casually. Well, I've never been to such a place and I also wanted to explore more of the outside world. Daniel said casually so she wouldn't know his true motives. <laughs> Although there may be good items at that market, it's still filled with many scammers. When the time comes, you better take a good look at those items and not get scammed. Krista said with a chuckle. Sister Krista, what about you? Why are you going this time around? Daniel ignored her teases and changed the topic. Don't you know? I'm pretty much the treasurer of the Royal Mint. I often go to the trading market to purchase resources for our camp. Krista said, irritated that Daniel didn't know. Purchase resources? Don't we already have enough resources in the camp? And there's also the monthly supply of materials from Texas, right? Why do we need even more? Daniel was confused. The purpose of his previous mission was to gather materials, but this time, Krista came with him to the trade market to purchase more resources. Daniel felt that the camp did not need that many resources. Because... Krista turned her head gently as her scarlet hair brushed against Daniel's face, causing him to itch. War is about to start. Episode 25 
Are you a dog? As the name implies, the Beast Core is an energy crystal filled with unstable gene energy found in the body of the mutant beasts. Due to the unstable gene energy in the Beast Cores, awakened practitioners would rarely dare to consume it for fear of risking gene collapse. Although the gene energy in the Beast Core could not be directly absorbed by the awakened practitioners, it nevertheless served as the main ingredient to refine all kinds of gene drug, gene artifacts, and other supporting equipment for awakened practitioners. Only after going through a special development process by gene refining experts would the energy harvested from the Beast Cores be usable. One item resulting from that process is the gene drug, a special item people coveted. With its potential to cause an awakening in a normal person, its price skyrocketed as supply could not meet demand. Aside from making gene drugs, beast cores could also merge together or be equipped with certain weapons. By going through that process, the destructive power of those enhanced weapons would be much greater than normal weapons. Furthermore, they also possess a special amplifying effect on the gene energy of its user, making them sought after by many awakened practitioners. For example, the semi-finished bionic arm that Commander Rogers gifted to Daniel was created by one of the gene-refining experts. While it may only be half-finished, it did not fail to further enhance Daniel's strength. Very practical indeed. Those weapons would be known as gene artifacts. These are some of the reasons why Beast Cores are now being used as this world's main currency. Not only could the cores be used to purchase priceless treasures, but they could be used to buy anything you wanted or needed, assuming that you had enough in your possession. The value of beast cores naturally created a large number of mercenary groups specializing in hunting monsters. Even then, obtaining beast cores was not an easy matter. First of all, the mutated beasts were not only powerful, but also extremely cunning. Due to their vicious nature and enhanced abilities, as a result of the spiritual spirit, the mutated beasts were stronger than human soldiers of the same level. If normal soldiers wanted to hunt monsters of the same level alone, they would require extraordinary strength to do so. Otherwise, they would simply be wasting their time and effort. While beast cores may be extremely precious in their own respect, Different beast cores harvested from different mutated beasts would vary in size and quantity for unknown reasons. Even the most common mutated beast, like the bloodthirsty furious ant, could have different beast cores. An unlucky mercenary group could suffer heavy casualties to kill a strong monster and end up with a beast core that isn't worth the amount they lost. This sort of thing was quite common and was not considered strange at all. Thus, the higher quality of a beast core, the more valuable it would be on the market. Some higher quality beast cores would be considered precious treasures in high demand. Arriving at the Roaring Tribe with Krista, Daniel was astonished to find that the camp did not look one bit like a tribe, but more like a small village. After being inspected by the two Roaring Tribe warriors at the entrance to the camp, Daniel and Krista entered together, under the envious gaze of the crowd. They had finally arrived at the E-Class gathering ground. Already quite familiar with the place, Krista took a few turns on the wide street with Daniel, following behind and walked into a marketplace located at the northern side of the camp. There were a total of three marketplaces where smaller vendors could set up their stalls in the Roaring Tribe. The one on the northern end was the largest among the three. This E-class gathering ground is indeed enormous. Surely it would be at least three times the size of the Royal Mint camp, right? Daniel seemed like an old lady who had just entered a grand garden for the first time. Looking in every direction, he saved the vivid images he saw. Two warriors stood at the entrance of the marketplace. Since they were clearly familiar with Krista, they paused for a moment before welcoming her with friendly expressions. 
Lady Krista, are you here to make purchases again? How many supplies will you be buying this time? Do you need to rent a transport car from the market? The two warriors fixed their gazes on the beautiful Krista, not even trying to conceal their desire. <laughs> I'm not telling you guys. Krista pouted coquettishly and walked past the two towards the marketplace. After entering the marketplace, Daniel could not help but smack his lips looking at the endless stream of people. No wonder the commander called this a grand gathering. Setting up a business in such a bustling place would definitely result in a large amount of profit for the Roaring Tribe. The difference between an E-class and an F-class gathering ground was great. Hey, isn't that Krista? A mocking voice suddenly sounded from behind. Hearing that voice, the two of them turned their heads. At that moment, they saw seven or eight soldiers dressed in uniform of the Roaring Tribe standing behind them. The one who spoke was a sturdy middle-aged man who wore a badge with a gold crest of a roaring lion on his chest. Judging from his attire, this man's status could not be underestimated. Krista glanced lazily at the person and said with a faint smile, Awakened practitioner of the Roaring Tribe, Lord Jack Hawkins. Heh <laughs> long time no see. You are still as breathtaking as ever. The man who was called Jack chuckled. Eyeing Krista from head to toe, he continued praising her without even trying to hold his desires back. Lord Hawkins is too kind. Anyway, I have things I need to do, so I won't be disturbing you, Lord Jack. Krista smiled and nodded slightly at Jack. She suddenly grabbed Daniel's hand and turned to leave. Feeling the sudden warmth in his palm, Daniel shifted his gaze and seemed to be at a loss for what to do. Wait, did I let you go? Jack gave them a playful look as he stretched out his arms to stop Krista and Daniel from leaving. Stopping in her tracks... Krista unveiled her long, narrow eyes and looked towards Jack as her hands trembled slightly. Is there anything you need from me? Krista did not lose her composure as she asked with a smile. <laughs> Krista, come with me for a stroll. Jack spoke calmly. Though his words sounded like an invitation, it carried a commanding tone that felt rather unpleasant. Taking a deep breath, Krista smiled awkwardly. No matter who saw this scene, they would surely take pity on her. My apologies, Lord Hawkins. I still have many things to do. Krista's tone remained soft and gentle. Why don't we save this matter for after I finish purchasing all the materials? Jack narrowed his eyes and stared at Krista for a while. At that instance, Jack swept his gaze from Krista to Daniel. Unable to tolerate her constant evasion, he quickly responded in a displeased tone. Let your servant handle the tasks. You should accompany me instead. Daniel's body stiffened. Turning his head, he ignored the hint Krista signaled with her palm and asked with a forced smile, Who are you calling servant? If Krista had not held his hand and constantly hinted patience... Daniel would have long since exploded in rage. What is it? You think you're stronger than a servant? How about a dog instead? Jack asked mockingly after hearing Daniel's words. Episode 26 Soul Devouring Flame Gene I don't know about dogs, but what I do know is... Daniel smiled as he looked at Jack's face that lacked any sort of masculinity and slowly said, You'll be beaten into a dog. Upon hearing Daniel's words, Krista's entire body froze, and her palms started to twitch as if she was cramping up. When Jack and the Roaring Tribe warriors behind him heard this, they were actually a little dazed for a moment following which the warriors of Roaring Tribe burst into wild laughter. <laughs> Where did this kid come from? 
Oh, interesting. He actually wants to provoke Lord Hawkins? Do you know Lord Hawkins' status? This is the biggest joke I've ever heard. The warriors from Roaring Tribe all pointed at Daniel and laughed. They had never seen anyone who dared be so impudent. It was no different from courting death. <laughs> With you alone? Jack sneered with absolute disdain. Facing the provocation and insults of a mere ant in his eyes, Jack, as a person of his status, did not care one bit. He did not even need to act personally to punish anyone who dared to insult him. Sure enough, after the Roaring Tribe warriors behind him mocked him, one of them walked in front of Daniel and looked down at him from above. You lowly peon. I will give you a chance to spare your worthless knife right now. If you kneel down and lick Lord Hawkins' shoes clean, then we might be willing to let you go. The warriors of the Roaring Tribe looked at him with contempt. Lifting his head slightly, Daniel did not see the need to waste a single breath on such trash as he immediately lunged out his fist. You still dare to attack? You're courting death. Seeing how Daniel actually dared to attack him, the Roaring Tribe warrior burst into laughter and threw back a fierce attack of his own. This punch of his would probably be able to cripple the arm of this lowly servant and give him a taste of true strength. When the people in the market saw this scene, they took joy in Daniel's misfortune and saw the battle as a form of entertainment. Which kind of idiot would dare fight the warriors of the Roaring Tribe, especially in their own territory? That idiot must think that his life is too long. Bang. At that moment, a loud thud resounded through the air. Instead of Daniel being crippled by the Roaring Tribe warrior, Daniel smashed his fist into the warrior's body and sent him flying. The warrior crashed into his comrades behind him as if they were bowling pins. The impact was so powerful that the other warriors were also forced backward. What? Who is this person? How could he be so strong? Could he possibly be an awakened practitioner? Even if he is, sending a dozen roaring tribe warriors flying with a single punch is far too terrifying. When the onlookers saw this scene, they stood petrified in place, their expressions revealing astonishment. In this market, most of the people were either residents of the Roaring Tribe or other mercenary groups that hunted monsters for a living. It was rare for an awakened practitioner to appear. With the warriors of the Roaring Tribe acting like law enforcers in the marketplace, no one dared to go against them. What's more, Jack, one of the awakened practitioners of the Roaring Tribe was also present. No one expected Daniel to be an awakened practitioner. The way he sent a dozen Roaring Tribe warriors flying with a single punch, he must have some sort of gene that strengthened his physical power. However, no one knew whether he awakened some sort of superhuman gene or ancestral gene. Daniel's actions finally attracted Jack's attention. Surprised by his strength, he proceeded to size Daniel up. Of course, he was surprised. His attitude towards Daniel did not change just because he was an awakened practitioner. After all, this is the territory of the Roaring Tribe. It seems that I made a slight mistake in my judgment. Who knew that you were an awakened practitioner? Jack chuckled as he revealed a hint of arrogance in his eyes. Unfortunately, in my eyes, you are still a piece of trash. This is the territory of the Roaring Tribe. It's a place built for us by the greatest of dragons and was once nestled by the fiercest of tigers. That doesn't change the fact that I'm going to beat you into a pulp, Daniel said with an unfazed expression as he stepped towards Jack. Daniel. Krista tried to reach out her hands to stop Daniel, but failed to do so. Not only was Daniel fearless, but he also displayed absolute decisiveness and ruthlessness. While the nether wolf genes did affect Daniel's personality, 
His competence ultimately derived from his own strength. So what if he was in the territory of the Roaring Tribe? Once Daniel made his decision to beat someone up, he would not stop until he finished the job. Even if his opponent ended up retreating into its shell, Daniel would destroy the shell too. How amusing. I'll let you know that the last awakened practitioner who dared to provoke me in our territory ended up as food for the mutated beasts. Jack said coldly as he watched Daniel walk slowly towards him. Surely this person would not dare attack Lord Hawkins. He had already committed a taboo act by attacking the warriors of the Roaring Tribe in their own gathering ground. Ugh, how can that be? Lord Hawkins is an awakened practitioner of the Roaring Tribe who's completed three gene chains. Ordinary awakened practitioners would be no different from ants in the presence of Lord Hawkins. This guy just ran out of luck. Anyone who dared to offend the awakened practitioners of the Roaring Tribe has suffered a fate worse than death itself. The surrounding crowd quickly moved away. Seeing how a battle between Daniel and Jack was inevitable, a wide open space was cleared out in an instant. Battles between awakened practitioners were extremely intense. Knowing how destructive the aftermath would be, no one dared interrupt or interfere with the fight. You're courting death. Daniel had no intention of stopping and Jack's expression sank as he became more alert. As an awakened practitioner of the Roaring Tribe, not only did he possess the powerful strength of three gene chains, but he was also in an extremely prominent position in the Roaring Tribe. If he allowed a foreign awakened practitioner to provoke him, he would lose his reputation and dignity. At that instant, Jack shaped his hand into a blade and slashed it towards Daniel. As he slashed down on Daniel, a burst of purple flames ignited on the surface of his blade. Unlike normal flames, the purple flames did not have a burning hot feeling as it got closer to Daniel. Instead, it felt more like a bone-piercing chill that could corrode a person's soul upon contact. Daniel, be careful. His gene is known as the soul-devouring flame. Physical bodies aren't capable of withstanding even a single attack from the flame as it corrodes one's mind. Krista quickly warned Daniel the moment she saw Jack make his move. Since Krista was familiar with Jack, she knew what abilities he possessed. Daniel's inhuman strength and strong recovery abilities enabled him to survive three moves from Commander Thompson, and he was able to recover his strength in just a few days. However, the injuries he suffered were all physical ones. At this point, who knew whether he could withstand attacks that targeted his mind? One reason why this specific gathering ground managed to reach E-Class was due to Jack's special ability. After all, he possessed an ability seemingly impossible for one to guard against, a direct attack against one's mind. Episode 27 Beaten to a Pulp While the fact that his opponent's ability to attack his mind was unexpected, Daniel remained unfazed and focused his attention on the fight at hand. After Daniel had completed the Netherwolf gene chain, his mental strength had increased greatly along with his spiritual force. Not only did Daniel possess a strong physique now, but his mental strength had also increased by leaps and bounds. He was not the least bit afraid of Jack's mental attack. Swoosh! As Jack slashed down at Daniel's body, the purple flames seeped into his body like hungry wolves that caught a hint of blood. It's over. When Krista saw this, her body went limp, as she fell to her knees. The soul-devouring flame was able to attack one's mind and destroy their mental state. No matter how strong one's physical body was, they would not be able to withstand the attack from the soul-devouring flame. With this slash from Jack, Daniel would surely lose his mind and sanity. At the very least, 
it would cause irreparable damage to his mental state. Unable to stop this exact scene from happening, Krista stared blankly at Daniel as if she had lost a part of herself at that moment. This brat is dead for sure. The power of the soul-devouring flame is not to be underestimated. The ability to direct attack the mind is so terrifying. Even the awakened practitioners with four gene chains would not want to face such an opponent. Even awakened practitioners with five gene chains, but a slightly weaker spiritual force would be afraid of Jack. This should be enough to show just how terrifying his ability is. The surrounding spectators watched as the purple flames from Jack's slash seeped further into Daniel's body. At that instant, the onlookers felt their scalps go numb. They had all seen before how Jack executed a prisoner using his soul-devouring flame to burn the prisoner's spirit and mind. Only after the prisoner howled in agony for an entire day was he released from his hell. It was certainly a pain worse than death, the greatest torment in the world. Is that all? Suddenly, an unfazed voice sounded as Krista jolted back from her dazed state. It also stunned the other onlookers around. What? You're fine? Jack stared at Daniel's indifferent expression and could not help but gawk, dumbfounded. This was the first time Jack had ever seen such a situation. The soul-devouring flame that he was so proud of, the skill that can intimidate everyone in the Roaring Tribe, was useless against this awakened practitioner? Against others, your soul-devouring flame might be an excellent tool for torturing and killing. Daniel sneered as he flicked away Jack's blade like it was a toothpick. However, your soul-devouring flame is nothing in my eyes. Daniel's spiritual force had already reached 200 points. After perfecting the nether wolf gene, Daniel's spiritual force increased several folds, along with his mental strength. When Jack's soul-devouring flame entered Daniel's body, it attempted to directly attack his mind. However, the flames did not have any effect against Daniel's vast spiritual force. Not only did the flame fail to damage Daniel's mind, but they were extinguished as if put out by water. At first, Daniel thought that this move would at least have some sort of minor effect on him. How? How is this possible? Jack stood petrified before him. Even if he was facing someone with great spiritual force, his soul-devouring flames should cause trouble for them. So how could this happen? Daniel did not seem to be the least bit effective. Jack's soul-devouring flame is ineffective? Impossible. Just what kind of monster is he for the soul-devouring flame to be useless against him? Could his spiritual force be that much greater than Jack's? But that doesn't make any sense. Even if that is the case, that brat should still be affected by the soul-devouring flame somehow, right? Upon witnessing the absurd scene, the onlookers stood dumbfounded. This was the first time they had encountered someone who was not affected by Jack's soul-devouring flame. After all, that was a special gene, even rarer than any ancestral genes, that could directly attack one's mind. I suppose it's my turn now? Grabbing Jack's wrist with one hand, Daniel's face was fierce. Jack was still shocked and could not believe that his soul-devouring flames did not have any effect on Daniel. At that instant, Jack felt a sudden force dragging his body forward and everything became a blur. Crash! Grabbing Jack by his arm, Daniel threw him into the air and slammed him to the ground. Don't you have three gene chains? Why don't you show me more of your skills? Daniel sneered as he proceeded to throw Jack around like a rag doll. He continued until the ground around him was filled with large craters. Jack was an awakened practitioner similar to Aaron Smith. While both of them had powerful gene change skills, they were not high-level warriors in terms of their physique and strength. In the face of Daniel's incomparable strength, Jack did not stand a chance. Thump. Slamming into the ground for the final time, 
Jack's whole body was embedded deep like a shot put, creating a large, human-shaped crater. Jack fainted on the spot. Daniel finished the job, landing a fatal blow. Under Daniel's fearsome attacks, Jack did not have a chance to release his other skills. Even if Jack used all three of his skills, Daniel would remain unfazed. The nether wolf gene not only gave Daniel an increased spiritual force, but also strong resistance against mental attacks. Without Daniel's spiritual force over 200 points, he would not have been as relaxed as he was after suffering a mental attack. The marketplace fell into a strange silence. Seeing how Jack had lost the ability to fight back, they felt as if their hearts had been petrified and struck by a tsunami. They all stared at Daniel, as if he was the reincarnation of a demon. Jack was a powerful awakened practitioner with three completed gene chains, a powerful existence that could kill any ordinary person on the spot with a flick of his finger. How could anyone not revere and fear him? Now, he was beaten to a pulp by some nameless newbie. When Daniel said he would beat Jack to a pulp, no one took it seriously. Most people thought Daniel would lose his life because of his reckless words. However, the person lying on the ground like a dead dog was Jack. The person who said he would beat Jack to a pulp really did it. Krista, who regained her senses, resisted the urge to scream out loud. Instead, she grabbed a hold of Daniel's hand and ran out of the marketplace. Daniel had not only made a move against an awakened practitioner of the wild lion family in the Roaring Tribe, but he had beaten him senseless. If they did not escape now, it would be too late. Episode 28 Princess Nala at this moment, rumbling noises sounded from the entrance of the market. Krista lifted her gaze and looked forward. Suddenly, roughly a dozen tall, strong warriors wearing armor appeared and blocked the entrance to the marketplace. From a single glance, you could tell that these men were at a completely different level than the ones following Jack earlier. Furthermore, the golden crest of a lion was clearly attached to their armor. These people were indeed the elite warriors of the Wild Lion family. It's too late now. Daniel, you were too rash. Krista said to Daniel with a wry smile, looking at the group of well-equipped elite soldiers at the entrance of the market. Although there was hidden bitterness in her tone, it held no resentment. No matter what happens now, the past is already in the past, so there was no point in blaming Daniel. <laughs> Different situations call for different actions. We just have to fight our way out of here. Daniel said without a care, staring at the group of elite warriors surrounding them. Krista let out a heavy sigh. Since she could not hold Daniel back, she could only take it one step at a time. In the middle of the dozen or so elite wild lion family warriors stood an especially eye-catching figure of a slender and fair girl wearing a golden cloak along with a strange-looking headdress. With each delicate step, she walked towards the two of them. Wait, isn't that... Ah, she's the wild lion family's Princess Nala. Why did she come here? It's said that Princess Nala is the number one beauty in the entire Roaring Tribe. Now that I've seen her with my own eyes, that title is certainly well-deserved. When everyone in the market realized who that person was, they all gasped in awe. That person was not a roaring tribe warrior, nor was she a gifted awakened practitioner. Instead, they got to witness the appearance of a great figure like Princess Nala. Now that they had seen her in person, the onlookers were naturally quite excited. They would even get the opportunity to brag about how they saw the princess with their own eyes. It's actually the little princess of Wild Lion family, huh? This is going to be quite troublesome. Krista was shocked, realizing the girl's identity, and she knitted her brows tightly. 
Jack is an awakened practitioner who has been working under the Wild Lion family for a long time. Defeating him in a battle is essentially the same as insulting the Wild Lion family. So what? If worse comes to worse, we'll just have to tie the princess up and run. Daniel said without any hesitation. Even Krista was shocked by those words. She could tell that Daniel was serious when he said this. At the same time, Krista felt a warmth in her heart. After all, this happened because he wanted to protect her. Daniel went through all these troubles just to get Krista out of her initial tough situation. This was certainly not a pleasant trip. Krista sighed helplessly and said to Daniel mockingly. At this moment, Daniel's hand slowly clenched into a fist. Up until now, he had never activated his netherwolf gene. Strictly speaking, the netherwolf gene could also be considered an ancestral gene. Not only did the netherwolf gene gift Daniel with an explosive speed, but it has also increased his attack power several folds. Furthermore, the skill, Roar of the Nether, derived from the Netherwolf gene, could disrupt the minds of everyone in the vicinity in an instant. Even if the effects of the skill only lasted a split second, it would be more than enough time for Daniel to catch Princess Nala. However, surrounded by more than a dozen elite warriors of the Wild Lion family, Princess Nala slowly walked in front of Daniel and Krista. Just when everyone thought that Princess Nala was about to attack the two of them, she moved slightly and bowed politely to Daniel. Warriors of Royal Mint, please forgive my wild lion family, for we have offended you greatly. A genuine trace of apology appeared on Princess Nala's delicate and pretty face. I wonder if I might invite you brave warriors to join my wild lion family. We value your expertise. Princess Nala demurred as she swept her gaze towards Daniel. What? Are my eyes deceiving me? Princess Nala is bowing to that person? Since even Princess Nala is bowing to him, does that mean he's some sort of big shot? An awakened practitioner capable of defeating Jack must have extraordinary strength. Princess Nala must be representing her wild lion family and trying to make peace with them while she can. I'm so jealous of him. He actually received Princess Nala's attention. Everyone in the marketplace stared at Daniel with looks of envy. If mere stares could cause damage, Daniel would have been stabbed to death by their jealous gazes. Hmm, you want to invite me to the Wild Lion family? Daniel was slightly surprised when he heard Princess Nala's words. To think that she wanted to invite him into her Wild Lion family instead of making things difficult for him. Standing at his side, Krista too gawked with her eyes wide open. Although Daniel was powerful, he was still an awakened practitioner with a single gene chain. That would surely not be enough for someone like Princess Nala from the Wild Lion family to personally come and invite him, right? However, Krista seemed to have recalled an important piece of information at that exact moment. Princess Nala, could it be? Krista glanced at Princess Nala with an inquiring look as she asked cautiously. That's right, Lady Krista. The gladiator tournament of Roaring Tribe is about to begin. Princess Nala nodded slightly, as if she immediately knew what Krista was about to ask. Gladiator tournament? What's that? Daniel asked curiously. The gladiator tournament is a tradition of the Roaring Tribe. It's an event that takes place once every three years. But I never thought it would be held at the same time as the trade gathering this time around. Shaking her head with a wry smile, Krista's expression turned awkward. Warriors of the Royal Mint, the gladiator tournament is a tradition of the Roaring Tribe that serves as a competition between the three great families of the Roaring Tribe. Princess Nala explained slowly. There are three great families in Roaring Tribe, including the Crimson Dragon, Fierce Tiger, 
and wild lion. Since the difference in strength between the three great families is not that great, the gladiator tournament is held to compete for the distribution of the resources for the next three years. Both the Crimson Dragon and Fierce Tiger family have managed to produce powerful awakened practitioners this generation. I have only awakened a single gene chain so far, so I'm not even close to matching up against them. For the sake of our wild lion family's future development, we look for promising new awakened practitioners to serve as representatives for our wild lion family in that coming tournament. Even after hearing her out, Daniel barely understood what was going on. He then turned around and looked at Jack, who was lying unconscious on the ground like a dead dog. Could that be the help you're looking for? Daniel pointed at Jack on the ground in disdain, not knowing whether to laugh or cry. From Daniel's perspective, he was immune to Jack's ability due to his nether wolf genes, and defeating that idiot would be easier than stepping on an ant, even if he did not have those genes to help him. Episode 29 Wild Lion Family Jack possesses the soul-devouring flame and serves as a guest awakened practitioner in the Wild Lion family. For this reason, he is able to represent as the awakened practitioner for the Wild Lion family in the Gladiator Tournament. Princess Nala did not seem to catch the hint of disdain in Daniel's words. Instead, she simply explained her reasons for selecting Jack with a calm expression. Now that Lord Hawkins was defeated by you with such ease, however, our wild lion family would like to invite you to represent us in the gladiator tournament. Sensing the determined resolve in her tone, Daniel was worried that if he refused, she would run her head into a wall and kill herself on the spot. If a great family wanted to maintain its supremacy, it was important to constantly replenish and produce fresh blood. The fresh blood would be the younger generation of the family who would inevitably carry the burden of their family's hopes. Only with the constant influx of fresh blood would the great families be able to continue operating for years to come. Therefore, the gladiator tournament of the Roaring Tribe was a big event to which each family attached utmost importance. The results of this tournament would ultimately decide the resources each family would receive for the next three years. The families would need sufficient resources to maintain their power in the Roaring Tribe. If any of the families ran out of supplies, how would they be able to nurture their elite soldiers and increase the strength of their families' awakened practitioners? As one of the three great families of the Roaring Tribe, the Wild Lion family would naturally not be willing to keep falling behind in the Gladiator Tournament. But unfortunately, the only descendant of this generation in Wild Lion family was a girl who did not possess the talent necessary to compete with the other two families. No matter how hard Princess Nala tried or how much she trained, she would never have any hope of catching up to the elite juniors of the other two families. In order for their clan to persist, the Wild Lion family had no other choice but to ask awakened practitioners outside their family to represent them in the coming gladiator tournament. With that, Daniel and Krista followed Princess Nala to the territory of the Wild Lion family. Upon entering the territory of the Wild Lion family, Daniel narrowed his eyes as he stared at the huge golden statue of a fierce lion. The statue was made of pure gold and stood as the crest and symbol of the wild lion family. Of course, there were also their family's genes. Daniel's gaze swept across wild lion family's territory before locking on to a rather conspicuous crowd under the golden lion statue. Daniel sighed helplessly and said, What am I getting myself into this time? Looking at Daniel's gloomy expression, Krista covered her mouth with her hand as she began laughing out loud. Little brother Daniel 
The harvest from your first trip to Roaring Tribe was pretty good. You already found yourself a young woman as soon as we arrived. Feeling the daggers pointing at her from Daniel's menacing gaze, she quickly shut up. However, a trace of gratitude still appeared in her charming eyes as she secretly revealed a smile. It was true that Princess Nala had invited Daniel into the Wild Lion family to represent them in the coming tournament. However, Daniel's identity was different from Jack's. Jack had long been a guest awakened practitioner of the Wild Lion family, so he already had the label of Wild Lion family all over his body. On the other hand, Daniel was a newcomer who had not declared as a guest awakened practitioner. He could not serve as the representative for the Wild Lion family in the Gladiator Tournament. It would be a clear violation of the rules to ask for foreign aid in such a way. Princess Nala had arranged for a new identity to be given to him. And that was as the Wild Lion family's prince consort, Princess Nala's fiancé. Analyzing Daniel from head to toe, Krista looked at him with squinted eyes and a peculiar expression. Little brother Daniel, what exactly is your gene ability? Daniel had already proven himself to be strong. Krista found it strange that, other than his basic fist techniques, there was nothing else he could do. Now that she thought about it, Krista had never seen Daniel use his gene abilities. Daniel glanced quickly at Krista when he heard her question. It wasn't that Daniel did not want to use his genetic ability, but rather that his ability was his rapid rate of recovery. How was Daniel supposed to cast a passive skill? As for the skill Roar of the Nether, given by the Nether Wolf gene, Daniel wanted to use it as his trump card and did not want to expose it in front of others yet. My gene ability allows me, Daniel said casually. Walking beside them, Princess Nala twitched slightly and leaned closer to Daniel to hear his words. She was too curious about Daniel's gene abilities. After all, Daniel defeated Jack with three completed gene chains and caused him to be severe injured without using any of his gene abilities. What kind of gene ability did he have? To utterly destroy any of my opponents. Daniel's lips curved into a sly smile as he winked and said, Tsk, ready, brat. Krista rolled her eyes at Daniel. Princess Nala, who was leading the way, coughed lightly and almost choked on her own saliva. Very quickly, they arrived in front of the statue of the Golden Wild Lion, surrounded by the elite warriors of the Wild Lion family. There was also a group of people waiting for them. The leader of the group was a burly man with golden fur all over his face, giving him a rough appearance. <laughs> it seems that the main protagonist has finally arrived. My name is Samson Leon, the patriarch of Wild Lion family, and also Nala's father. Upon seeing Daniel and Krista, Samson laughed heartedly and greeted them warmly. Patriarch Samson. Krista bowed to Samson respectively. Lady Krista is even more beautiful than the rumors say. Samson laughed. Surely you jest, Patriarch. I only came here with the task to purchase goods. I hope to be able to trade with the Wild Lion family for more supplies. Krista took the opportunity to explain her intentions clearly. That is not a problem. If our Wild Lion family does well in this gladiator tournament, then I would be more than willing to present you with some resources. Samson waved his hand and declared. Of course, there was a prerequisite for this deal. Only after Daniel managed to obtain a good ranking in the upcoming tournament, would the Wild Lion family be willing to do so. Father, this is the brave warrior from Royal Mint I brought back. Princess Nala bowed slightly to Samson and said respectfully, It is him. He defeated Lord Hawkins before he even had a chance to retaliate. Oh, young man, you must be quite strong. I wonder how many gene chains you've completed. 
Samson's gaze fell on Daniel as he began sizing him up with scrutiny. One. Daniel replied without hesitation. Hearing Daniel's words, the surrounding elite warriors from the Wild Lion family looked puzzled. They would have never thought that the foreign aid Princess Nala found this time would have only completed a single gene chain. After all, even Princess Nala was close to completing two gene chains. Awakened practitioners who have completed at least one of their gene chains are common in the Roaring Tribe. Why would the Wild Lion family select one to participate in the Gladiator Tournament? Episode 30 Probing <clears throat> One gene chain? Since the Gladiator Tournament will mostly be based on one's combat strength... A single gene chain should be sufficient, Samson said, slightly embarrassed. He sounded as if he was trying to console himself. Awakened practitioners with one gene chain might have a relatively high position in the F-class gathering grounds. In terms of the E-class roaring tribe, however, they were not really considered a rare talent. You really only have one gene chain? When the calm and composed Princess Nala heard this news, she was astonished. She did not ask this question before, since Daniel was able to beat the three gene chain so easily. No matter how much she thought about it, it was simply impossible for him to only have one gene chain. But if you only have a single gene chain, then you will be overwhelmed by the other contestants who have two or more skills than you. It will definitely be a huge loss. Samson frowned slightly. His gaze swept over Princess Nala before finally looking at Daniel. To Samson's surprise, Daniel remained unfazed despite his previous words. With a resolute gaze, he could feel a strong fighting spirit rising from Daniel's body. This made Samson very happy. While one's fighting strength was more important to the Roaring Tribe... The Wild Lion family was well known for their warriors' bravery and high spirits. Thus, the Wild Lion family had always been very welcoming of courageous people, even if that person only had a single gene chain. Lord Chief, please forgive me for speaking bluntly. An awakened practitioner with one gene chain will not pose much of a threat to the other contestants in the Gladiator Tournament no matter how strong they are in actual combat, said a burly man behind Samson who stepped forward. Dressed in the elite armor of the Wild Lion family, the man stood out among the other soldiers and emitted a heroic presence. Uncle Larry? Princess Nala was startled when she saw the man that stepped forward. Larry was an awakened practitioner of the Wild Lion family, in addition to being an expert with three gene chains, he served as the backbone of the family. Being only second to Patriarch Samson in terms of status, his words nevertheless held a great amount of weight and power within the Wild Lion family. Hmm, the two brats from the Crimson Dragon and Fierce Tiger family are both talented individuals who have awakened three gene chains. In addition to the support they receive from their families, I'm afraid that even awakened practitioners with four gene chains would have trouble dealing with them, much less defeat them. Samson said with a profound tone, So what if they have three gene chains? As long as they don't possess five or more gene chains, I'm confident that I can handle every single one of them. Daniel said, knowing his own strength. You surely know how to boast, brat. Larry shouted coldly and reached out his hand towards Daniel. Do you think this is some sort of a game? The rise and fall of our wild lion family will all depend on this one gladiator tournament. Since Princess Nala isn't very good at fighting, our wild lion family must obtain the next three years worth of resources no matter what. If we don't have the people that are strong enough to support our family in the future... Our wild lion family's position will inevitably plummet. In the worst-case scenario, we might even be forced out of the Roaring Tribe. 
just when Larry's huge hand was about to grab hold of Daniel's body. Daniel quickly raised his hand and grabbed Larry by the wrist. Old man, talk all you want, but do not try to make a move. Daniel said calmly while smiling. Larry frowned as he focused, putting his strength into his hands. Not only was he an awakened practitioner with three gene chains, but he was also one of the dignified elders of the wild lion family. Thus, how could he simply be restrained by a mere brat with only a single gene chain? However, no matter how hard Larry tried to pull himself away, he could not move a single inch. It was as if his wrist had been restrained by several iron chains. Hmm, not bad, brat. It seems you have quite the strength. Realizing how strong Daniel was, Larry began to laugh before activating his gene energy and slamming his other hand down on Daniel's palm. Having been forced to activate his gene energy against this brat with a single gene chain, Larry could not help but feel slightly embarrassed. Larry's genes were the ancestral wild lion gene of the wild lion family. Whenever the wild lion gene is activated, its user's strength would increase exponentially as they become as fierce as an actual lion. At this moment, he decided to show this brat the true strength of their family's awakened practitioner. Boom! As a surge of energy burst from Larry's body, his muscles started to swell up into sturdy, large masses. With his entire body swelled up, his veins were bulging out as he carried the appearance of a wild lion. It's the wild lion gene. Really, since Elder Larry actually resorted to using his wild lion gene, that brat is definitely in trouble. Not only can the wild lion gene strengthen all aspects of the awakened practitioner's attributes, it also possesses a ferocious aura similar to that of a berserk lion. An awakened practitioner that has only completed a single gene chain simply cannot withstand the pressure of the wild lion gene. Just when the wild lion family warriors looked forward to see how their elder family would deal with Daniel, Larry's face turned red as the veins throughout his body bulged out like little green snakes. On the other hand, Daniel looked rather unfazed as he remained relaxed, without any intentions of preparing himself for the worst. He simply stood in place with his hands in his pocket, unaffected by the pressure from the wild lion gene. Samson began to twitch as he looked at Larry. In the presence of Elder Larry's gene energy, even he found it difficult to resist the pressure emitted from Larry's body. Crack! As Elder Larry continued to emit his pressure, the ground beneath the two of them began to crack, as it would not withstand the sheer amount of force being pressed down. What's going on? Is Elder Larry actually unable to do anything to that brat? Surely that's not possible, right? How could an awakened practitioner with only a single gene chain be this strong? His strength is far too terrifying. When the elite wild lion family warriors witnessed such an absurd scene, they sucked in a breath of cold air and took a few steps backward. To be able to withstand the pressure of someone who completed three gene chains with just a single gene chain, no one would believe such a preposterous feat if they had not seen it for themselves. Brat! Just what kind of gene do you possess? Gritting his teeth, Larry stared at Daniel and asked with a serious tone. It's just some low-level superhuman gene, nothing compared to Elder Larry's gene, Daniel said with a smile. Daniel was actually quite intrigued with this gladiator tournament. After all, he could have the opportunity to exchange blows with the descendants of the great families in the Roaring Tribe. Other than tempering his skills and increasing his combat experience in the intense battles, Daniel was looking forward to seeing what kind of powerful genes he would come across in the gladiator tournament. As the two continued to remain in a stalemate, the cracks beneath the soles of their feet kept growing larger and larger. Larry! Samson could not watch it any longer. For Elder Larry to activate his gene energy 
and still be in a stalemate for this long was simply a disgrace to the wild lion family. Thus, he muttered Larry's name. Only then did the two of them let each other's hands go. As Larry's bulging muscles slowly shrank back to normal, Daniel gently stretched his wrist, as if he had just warmed up. Krista did not know whether to laugh or cry upon witnessing such a ludicrous scene. At the same time, she was also a little shocked. Having seen Daniel's strength firsthand back when he sent Zeke flying with a single hit, she never expected his strength to be even greater than she initially thought. Episode 31 Inheritance Armor the reason the Wild Lion family was able to become one of the three great families within the Roaring Tribe in the first place was greatly because of their Wild Lion gene. The Wild Lion gene is a highly acclaimed gene even amongst the countless ancestral genes. Once activated, one's power would increase exponentially. It is certainly not inferior to Zeke's big yellow ape gene in any way. Even then, Larry was still unable to beat Daniel in terms of strength despite activating his wild lion gene. His extraordinary strength not only startled everyone in the wild lion family, but even shocked Krista, who had previously witnessed his strength in battle before. When Princess Nala saw Larry lose to Daniel, she became very curious. Daniel's performance was completely unexpected. After realizing how Daniel had only completed a single gene chain, she thought that perhaps she had made a mistake in finding a suitable candidate. <laughs> a young hero indeed. May I have the honor of knowing your name, young man, Samson said with a smile. After Larry's defeat, Samson began to doubt Daniel's previous claim that he only possessed a single gene chain. Not only was he able to withstand the pressure of the wild lion gene, but he was also able to do it without activating any of his gene abilities. That was enough for Samson to put his trust in Daniel and show him respect. I'm Daniel. Daniel said in neither humble nor arrogant tone. Under the invitation of Patriarch Samson, Daniel and Krista quickly entered the living quarters of the wild lion family. Although they called this place their living quarters, the center of the wild lion family was basically the same as a huge mansion. After entering the mansion, Daniel and Krista were each assigned their respective rooms under the arrangements of the wild lion family warriors. Since the Roaring Tribe's gladiator tournament would take place very soon, Daniel did not have much time left to prepare himself. After Daniel had settled down in his room, he remained inside for the time being, but was surprised to have a guest. Princess Nala knocked on the door and slowly walked in with Daniel's permission. She was dressed in a military uniform with the crest of a golden lion embroidered on it, which gave her a dignified appearance. Mr. Wilson, how is your stay here so far? If you need anything, please don't hesitate to let me know. Nala said softly as she proceeded to carry out her duties. In the upcoming gladiator tournament, you will be facing elite disciples from the Crimson Dragon and Fierce Tiger family. Their disciples will definitely be equipped with plenty of items given to them by their families. If you require any sort of equipment, our wild lion family will be more than willing to meet your demands. Nala thought Daniel was a rather mysterious person. When Daniel defeated Jack, he overwhelmed him with his physical attacks, not revealing any of his gene abilities. Furthermore, he did not seem to be afraid of his mental attacks either. When Daniel was undergoing Larry's test, Nala realized at that moment just how incredible Daniel's physical strength was. After all, even when Larry, an awakened practitioner with three gene chains, activated his wild lion gene, he was still unable to surpass Daniel's physical strength. However, the gladiator tournament was not some sort of wrestling match. 
It is not something that one could win just by relying on their overwhelming physical strength. Regardless of whether it was the Crimson Dragon family or the Fierce Tiger family, both of them managed to produce elite disciples who possess exceptionally strong genes as well. To put it bluntly, the power of an awakened practitioner was directly linked to the quality of their gene chain and the number of gene abilities they had. Since Daniel only had one gene chain, he would definitely be at a disadvantage when compared to the family's elite disciples, whether in terms of gene energy or gene abilities. Thus, the most that Nala could do to help Daniel was by giving him external equipment that would increase his strength, thereby increasing his chances of winning. In that case, uh, a set of light armor that allows for nimble movements should be sufficient. Daniel said after thinking for a while. Since Daniel did not have many flashy skills or abilities, he could only rely on his strong physique and strength to win the tournament. Therefore, he believed that a set of armor, in addition to his bionic arm, would be more than enough. A set of armor? Nala whispered to herself. Suddenly, she thought of something and became excited as she said to Daniel, Oh, right. If I remember correctly, our wild lion family possesses a set of inheritance armor. However, it has been a long time since anyone was able to activate it. Would you like to try it on? Inheritance armor? Surprised, Daniel looked at Princess Nala and nodded his head. Unlike the gathering ground of the Royal Mint, where the commander controlled the entire gathering ground, the E-Class Roaring Tribe did not have an absolute leader. Instead, the power was spread between the council members and elders of the gathering ground. The ones with the most power included the patriarchs of the three great families, as the three of them jointly controlled most of the resources and supplies in the Roaring Tribe. Thus, the warehouses of the three great clans were places that held the best quality resources and treasures among the gathering ground. Soon, Nala found Samson and brought Daniel to their family warehouse. Since the inheritance armor hasn't been used for the longest time now, I have long since forgotten the effects that came with it. After opening the door to the family warehouse, Samson led the way and said to the two others following him from behind, If I remember correctly, only descendants who possess the wild lion gene are qualified to activate the effects of the inheritance armor. Unfortunately for us, not a single person in the family has been able to activate it so far. After passing through the section where all the resources are kept, Sanson led the two of them to the deepest part of the warehouse. Hanging on the wall was an ancient and dull-looking set of armor. From a quick glance, it did not seem to possess any sort of special characteristics. Contrary to its name, it looked like some sort of fake, second-hand product you usually find in those shady workshops. Even the standard armor worn by ordinary warriors from the Wild Lion family appeared grander than this one. Are you sure this is your family's inheritance armor and not some antique from the basement? Daniel could not help but complain about the appearance and craftsmanship of this inheritance armor. It's just a rumor from our family. Since I haven't seen anyone activate the inheritance armor before, it serves more like the very spirit of our wild lion family. With a shrug of his shoulders, one could clearly see that Samson did not place too much importance on this so-called inheritance armor. Perhaps he also thought that the set of armor was merely an antique that was passed down as a family heirloom with no actual combat use. How about I give you our wild lion family's newly developed set of golden lion armor instead? Although it is not classified as a piece of equipment for awakened practitioners, it does have application effects of one's strength, speed, and resistance to attacks, Samson suggested. Let's try this one first. Daniel looked at the inheritance armor on the wall and grabbed it down with his hands. Neither Samson nor Nala tried to stop him from doing so. Since the armor was not some sort of rare treasure, they did not pay too much attention to it. Putting on the inheritance armor, Daniel tried moving around in it 
and found that the armor actually suited him pretty well. However, it did not serve any purpose and was useless. Episode 32 Pole Technique Believing the inheritance armor could only be activated by someone with the wild lion gene, the wild lion family made it sound like some sort of god tier armor. According to what Patriarch Samson said, none of the awakened practitioners of the wild lion family had been able to activate this ancient armor, let alone someone outside the family. The armor seemed to be a perfect fit for Daniel. When taking the armor down from the wall, Daniel did not notice anything strange about it. The moment he put it on, however, he could feel a gradual increase in the weight of the armor. It was as if he was carrying an empty backpack suddenly stuffed with a huge rock. If Daniel had not trained in Captain Stone's gravity field, he might have been humiliated. However, Daniel became certain of a single fact. The inheritance armor was definitely not ordinary equipment. Recalling what Patriarch Samson said earlier, Daniel proceeded to extract the wild lion gene from Samson and Nala. The two of them looked at Daniel, who was wearing the armor and gesturing wildly in the air. Confused, they stared at one another and were at a loss for words trying to understand what Daniel was up to. After a dozen or so attempts, Daniel finally succeeded in extracting the wild lion gene. Daniel's gaze flickered as the corner of his mouth curled up into a slight smile. Hmm, this armor is not bad and quite suitable for my build. It seems that turning back to the ancient ways is the right decision to make. I'll keep this armor with me. Daniel said to the two of them as he performed a set of basic fist techniques. But this armor does not have any uses whatsoever, Nala said hesitantly. I really like the style of this armor. Don't you want to let the Wild Lion family's inheritance armor shine at such a grand occasion? Daniel smiled. <laughs> if little brother Daniel likes it, then wear it. If you ever change your mind and want to switch to the Golden Lion armor instead, please don't hesitate to ask. Anyway, I hope you do your best in the Gladiator tournament. Samson chuckled. Daniel proceeded to select more equipment from the warehouse. Looking through the assortment of equipment, Daniel found a golden banded staff that seemed to be just an ordinary weapon and not gene enhanced. But as the old saying goes, the staff may take a month to learn, the sword will take a year, and shooting may take an eternity. The staff is known as one of the easiest weapons to use. Since the gladiator tournament would soon take place, it would be too late for Daniel to learn how to use other weapons. He decided to choose the staff as his main weapon, as it would take the least amount of time to learn. There was also a blade-wielding expert in the wild lion family, who was also quite adept at pole arts. Daniel had fought this expert, Larry Black, before. When Daniel met up with Krista, he was holding on to his golden-banded staff and equipped with the ancient armor. Krista's mesmerizing and beautiful face suddenly revealed an astonished expression. She looked as if she had just seen a ghost. Then she laughed and asked, Daniel, what are you wearing? <laughs> this is too funny. Krista could not stop herself from laughing. Daniel predicted that Krista would react this way, so he simply shrugged and replied, This is exactly what a king would wear. Over the next few days, Daniel kept in touch with Larry. This wild lion family elder was quite dissatisfied with how Daniel suppressed his strength previously. No matter how he looked at Daniel, he did not like him one bit. He decided to put Daniel through hell with ruthless training. However, he did not expect Daniel to improve and adapt so quickly. With the gladiator tournament coming up in the next few days, the fact that Daniel managed to grasp the basics of the pole technique so quickly was quite a feat. However, on the third day of learning pole techniques, Larry discovered, to his astonishment, that he could no longer defend himself against Daniel's pole techniques. As the saying goes, the most dangerous person on the battlefield 
is either the youth with limitless potential or the veteran with vast experience. Although the basics of the staff techniques were easy to learn, it was difficult to master technique in such a short period of time. The experienced veteran could no longer beat the young cub. Other than the fact that Daniel's strength was overwhelming, Daniel was also extremely precise in each of his attacks, wasting none of his movements as he served a purpose. Every one of his attacks was delicate yet swift. Constantly lying in wait for the right moment to strike, each attack he threw landed a fatal blow. It was as if he was possessed in the eyes of a bloodthirsty wolf. On this day, Larry wielded his golden staff and fought against Daniel. The sound of the clashing metals reverberated through the air incessantly, attracting the warriors of the wild lion family in the surrounding area. Larry not only served as an elder of the wild lion family, but also acted as the chief instructor, training the wild lion family warriors. The elite warriors of the wild lion family were all raised by Larry and became a well-known force among the Roaring Tribe. Comparing the Roaring Tribe's warriors to the Wild Lion family's elite warriors would be the same as comparing the logistics unit to the military forces. The difference in strength was as large as the gap between heaven and earth. Though learning the basic pole techniques may be quite easy, the mastery of such techniques required hard work and natural talent. In all his years alive, Larry had never seen anyone with such strong comprehension ability. Horizontal Nimbus Strike, Sweeping of the Thousand Army, Cyclone of Destruction. As Daniel threw out a barrage of pole strikes, Larry could barely keep up with his attacks. Staff techniques were originally created to be a balance between offense and defense. With most of its techniques being rather intermediate, it did not possess a sharp killing intent. When Daniel used those techniques, however, the complete opposite occurred as each of his strikes lingered killing intent. Thrust of the Iron Pillar. Thump. Unable to keep up with Daniel's attacks any longer, Larry's hands turned numb and his golden staff was knocked away by Daniel's fierce strike. At that instant, Daniel thrust his staff towards Larry, stopping an inch away from his face. You brat. As the sweat dripped down from his forehead, Larry lifted his arms and surrendered. He did not understand what kind of monster Daniel was, never using his gene energy nor activating his gene abilities. In contrast to the usual awakened practitioner, Daniel's style of fighting was more similar to a god of war. Although Larry possessed three gene chains, Daniel managed to defeat him with ease. Even when Larry activated his wild lion gene, he could not defeat Daniel. Larry acknowledged Daniel's strength for these reasons alone. If Daniel's genes improved, it certainly would not be a bad idea to tell the Patriarch to recruit him into the Wild Lion family. After battling for days with Daniel, Larry saw endless potential in his strength and talent. Furthermore, his discipline in learning and never-ending thirst to get stronger added a positive note to his temperament. If not for his lack of gene talents, he would definitely be the best candidate as the Wild Lion family's next heir. Daniel is fierce, and Larry has met his match. At this point, there's a good chance that Daniel might do well for the Wild Lion family in the upcoming Gladiator tournament. But only life gene energy is not being used. The elite disciples from the Crimson Dragon and Fierce Tiger family will not hesitate to use their gene abilities in the Gladiator tournament and some of them have completed their third gene chain. Episode 33, At the Market The elite warriors of the Wild Lion family would constantly come over to watch Daniel practice with Larry. After all, it is not an everyday occurrence for an awakened practitioner, who relied on his gene abilities, to learn the staff techniques used by ordinary warriors. After two days of observation, the elite warriors of the Wild Lion family were completely mesmerized by Daniel's talent and effort. 
On the first day, Daniel continued to undergo training, but was still not a match for Larry. On the second day, Daniel was improving and able to keep up with Larry, which shocked everyone. By that time, Daniel's training had become intense, and he fought as if he was in actual combat. Not only were his attacks as fierce as a tiger, but they were intended to kill. His skills improved so much that he was able to defeat Larry. Seeing such persistence and talent, the elite warriors of the Wild Lion family could not help but be amazed. Thank you for your guidance, Larry, Daniel said and bowed in respect. Even though Larry had a large temper, he was a good teacher. Just from the few days of practicing and learning from Larry, Daniel had learned a lot about the staff techniques. Just then, a slim figure appeared at the edge of the training area. All the warriors stared at this beautiful figure, including Larry. Who else could the figure belong to other than Princess Nala? Princess Nala walked straight towards Daniel. Well, the gladiator tournament will be held in two days. The trading market will be going on until the day of the tournament. You should go to the trading market and see whether or not there is any suitable equipment for you. Princess Nala said calmly. As the day of the gladiator tournament got closer, her calm composure started to waver. The trading market was a grand gathering that was held once a year in the Roaring Tribe. The nearby three F-class gathering grounds, as well as the other people from the other camps, would all come to the Roaring Tribe to trade and do business. With the large number of people attending the annual event, there would be many exquisite and rare items sold at this trading fair. Even awakened practitioners would want some of the items sold in this event. Most of the items in the fair were ones that normal people would find useful. The nearby warriors of the Wild Lion family looked at the two of them with envy. To be able to go to the trading market with Princess Nala, how wonderful would that be? This was simply the dream of all those warriors of the Wild Lion family. Sure, why not? Daniel nodded. After all, his main purpose for visiting the Roaring Tribe was to see what the trading market looked like that William constantly talked about. After making some preparations within the Wild Lion family, Nala didn't want the protection of the warriors and walked out together with Daniel. I'll take you to a nice place. After Nala walked out of the family mansion, she seemed happier without the warriors of the family following her. Daniel realized that Nala was still that of a young lady. The trading market of the Roaring Tribe lived up to its reputation indeed. When Daniel saw the bustling crowds, he immediately felt a great sense of familiarity. The items sold here were much more expensive than the ones sold in the markets that he had previously visited. The uh, thrusting war blade allows its wielder to slice down their opponents as if they were chopping tofu. It will allow you to experience firsthand the power of an awakened practitioner. It's on sale for only 320 beast cores. Grass of Wisdom, a precious herb that contains a trace of gene energy. When brewed into a medicinal soup, it can strengthen one's body and soul. 100 beast cores for one plant. Buy two, get one free. This medicinal wine contains the gene of the bloodthirsty furious ants. Not only does it have the effect of keeping your body warm, it can even increase one's stamina and spiritual force. It's a cheap product with no side effects whatsoever. All kinds of weird items being sold and advertised in the market caused Daniel to feel dizzy. Although Daniel had been to trading markets, some of the items here intrigued his curiosity and piqued his interest as he had never seen such unique items before. When Nala saw the strange looking items being sold all around the trading market, her face became red as she lowered her head without saying anything. Perhaps, it was because this was the first time she left the mansion without wearing anything related to the Wild Lion family and without the warriors of the Wild Lion family protecting her. Casually walking alongside Daniel, no one paid much attention to her. Even after strolling in the market for such a long time, no one recognized her. If anyone in the market would have recognized her, the entire market would have become excited 
After all, she is widely known as the beloved princess who held the title for most beautiful in all of the Roaring Tribe. Let's go. There's nothing worth paying attention to here. I'll bring you somewhere more interesting. Nala said to Daniel, leading the way. Just then, Daniel noticed a special item at a booth that was selling many different things. The owner of the booth was a burly man who appeared to be quite old. Wearing a stern and solemn expression, his exposed arms and legs were covered with long, hideous centipede-like scars. He carried a rather intimidating steel machete on his back. Judging from his appearance, he seemed to be a veteran mercenary. Only the mercenaries who had gone through many horrific battles would carry such a thing. With various items placed all over his booth without any form of organization, many people who walked up to his stall shook their heads before leaving. Seeing the unorganized state of his stall, very few people would take the initiative to ask about his items. Even the occasional few who would ask about the items would immediately shake their heads and leave after hearing the ridiculous prices that the man had set for them. This man's booth did not attract the attention of many customers. Even so, Daniel walked over slowly and analyzed the stall carefully. With the Netherwolf gene, Daniel's perception had greatly improved along with the sharp increase in his spiritual force. Thus, he could feel the strong vibrations of gene energy in the items being sold at this stall. Daniel could tell that item being sold in his booth were extraordinary. Big brother, what are you selling? I haven't seen these items before. Daniel asked as he walked in front of the stall and looked around for a while. Just some junk. The man spoke in a cold tone, not intending to talk about the items in his stall whatsoever. Compared to the other enthusiastic businessmen in the other booths, the burly man seemed extremely out of place. Hearing his response, Daniel did not bother asking anything else. After looking through the items at the stall for a while, he stared at a strange item. The item looked dim and lifeless, just like a rusty old bronze bracelet, but the gene energy from within it seemed to be speaking to Daniel. I am who I am, fireworks of a different color. Episode 34, Scent Flying This ring has piqued my interest. What's the price? Daniel picked up the ring and started playing around with it. Fifty beast cores. The middle-aged man said coldly, All right, I'll buy it. Daniel smiled as he gave him a bag of beast cores. Lifting up the bag of beast cores, the burly man wanted to make sure that Daniel gave him the right amount. Well, there's a fat sheep you can slaughter at any time. You could tell he's from an F-class gathering ground who has never experienced the real world. How could such a small trinket be worth so many beast cores? Not only is he a country bumpkin, but he's also a fool. The merchants could not help but mock and insult Daniel, seeing him spend 50 beast cores to buy such a useless ring. They stared at Daniel with a look of ridicule and disdain. Daniel was not aware of them staring at him. Even if he did notice, he would not care one bit, as he was focusing all his attention on the ring. He could feel the constant fluctuation of the gene energy in the ring. Although it was not easy to detect, the fluctuations were very obvious. Daniel would not use his abilities to test the effects of the ring while he was amongst the crowd. He continued playing around with it for a while before putting it away. When he came back to his senses, however, he was shocked to find that Nala, who was ahead of him, had disappeared from his sights. As Nala was walking alone, a figure suddenly appeared in front of her. The figure belonged to a tall, fierce-looking man. From a glance, one could tell that he was not someone to be trifled with. Hey, little sister, you look really cute. Have you come to the trading market all by yourself? If so, why don't I show you around the place? The man said with a smile as he revealed his yellow teeth. He had been watching Nala for a while, waiting to make a move when she was alone. While the man was talking, two more men came up behind her, 
forming a triangle with the other man. Scram! Nala shouted in an expressionless voice. Since her identity would cause a scene, she did not want to reveal herself just because of these hooligans. Hmm, acting like a hot little chili, eh? I like it. Amused by her reaction, the man standing in front stretched out his hand and attempted to grab Nala. I originally wanted to settle this with some beast cores, but this is no longer a problem that can be solved by beast cores alone. As Nala looked at the man, she was able to ignite her wild lion gene to make these hooligans pay for what they were about to do to her. At that moment, an arm suddenly flew past Nala. Pow! Accompanied by the sound of a sharp slap, the hooligan was sent spinning in circles into the air before landing heavily on the ground. This attracted the attention of everyone in the market. The strong slap caused the onlookers to gasp in surprise. Even though the hooligan was tall and sturdy, he was spinning in the air with a mere slap in his face. Just how much strength was used in that one slap? Nala turned around and saw Daniel standing behind her with a smile on his face. You were walking too fast. Didn't you notice me falling behind? Daniel said. Damn it. Who are you? How dare you interfere with my business? The man got up from the ground. His face was red and swollen. I'm someone you can never beat, said Daniel, as he rolled his eyes, not letting him know who he was. Nala could not help but laugh when she heard Daniel's words, but then quickly regained her composure. Do you not know whose territory you're in? You dare to provoke me? You will die, the man said fiercely. When the man announced his name, the merchants were shocked. That man is Michael? The underground boss of the Roaring Tribe's marketplace? Well, it's over for those two. Not only are Michael's forces everywhere in these three markets of the Roaring Tribe, but his men are also very strong. I heard that he has three great families backing him up. The entire training market is basically his territory. When the merchants heard the name Michael, their expressions changed. In the circle of merchants with the Roaring Tribe, the gap between the great families and the ordinary people was like the gap between heaven and earth. They did not have any sort of connections to the families. Michael's name was widely known amongst the merchants in the market. His men were everywhere in all three marketplaces in the Roaring Tribe, which affected their businesses. In some ways, Michael's fame had even surpassed that of the three great families especially in the marketplace. Because of this, the merchants did not want to offend Michael as they would be out of business. Whoever dares to offend me, Michael, of the Roaring Tribe, will end up suffering a dire fate. Now go and kill that brat! Michael yelled while covering his burning cheeks. The two people behind Daniel immediately unsheathed their daggers and stabbing him in his back as they wanted to kill him. Letting out a snort, Daniel used a fist technique known as the Twin Pearl Dragon Strike and sent the two men who snuck up on him flying into the distance as they spit out a mouthful of blood. This so powerful. What? Michael's men are trained to be violent and fierce. Just who is this person? Could he be a warrior from a wild roaring tribe? Warriors of the roaring tribe are not that strong. So could he be a guard from the three great families? Daniel didn't even have a scratch on him, and Michael's two men had given up. The merchants were shocked. None of the warriors of the Roaring Tribe possessed such strength. Even the fully trained men under Michael, who were proficient in various fighting techniques, would not be able to withstand a single punch from their opponent. Such an absurd scene shocked Michael. It seems that his initial plans backfired on him. Just who are you? As Daniel was slowly walking towards him, the hatred in Michael's eyes was replaced by terror. Haven't I told you? Daniel looked at Michael. His eyes remained unfazed. I'm someone you can never beat. As Daniel walked up to Michael, he smiled devilishly and repeated himself. My, my lord, I was blind and failed to recognize your greatness. Please show mercy and let me go. Michael immediately kneeled down and begged Daniel for mercy. Daniel was not a saint 
and would not show mercy. If he did not have that kind of power, Michael would never have let him go. Just as Daniel was about to lay down his hammer, a voice suddenly sounded from behind him. Spare our men, someone ordered, a tone that Daniel hated. Episode 35, Tiger Master Crack. Concentrating all his strength into his palm, Daniel hit Michael's chest. The power of his blow pierced through Michael's chest. If an awakened practitioner were to receive such a heavy blow, he might not be able to survive, not to mention Michael, who was just the leader of a group of rogues with a slightly stronger physique. Michael started bleeding heavily and died. As he was dying, he couldn't believe that his life was coming to an end. How dare you! shouted the person that warned Daniel, even though Daniel simply ignored his words and killed Michael anyway. With an outraged roar, the person charged straight towards Daniel. As the voice echoed through the marketplace, a gush of wind suddenly rushed in in Daniel's direction. That strike was definitely a killing move. Letting out a sneer, Daniel stood in place and threw a punch back without even turning around. Bang. The two of them were immediately pushed away from each other upon collision, which caught Daniel by surprise. The person who attacked him was a young man in white. Possessing some rather handsome features, one could not help but notice the faint imprint of the word king on his forehead. The young man was staring at Daniel in anger as the muscles on his arms began to bulge. Obviously, an awakened practitioner with an ancestral gene. Daniel remembered the three great families in the Roaring Tribe, the Crimson Dragon, the Wild Lion, and the Fierce Tiger. He knew this young man was most likely from the Fierce Tiger family. This, this is the young master of the Fierce Tiger family, Ed. Ah! Oh the genius disciple of the fierce tiger family who has awakened three gene chains. It's actually him. Not only did that person dare disobey the young master of the fierce tiger family, but he even offended the three great families at the same time. Even if he has the strength to back himself up this time, it would be utterly useless. When the merchants noticed the king symbol on Ed's forehead, they were shocked and started whispering to one another. No one had expected such a big shot to suddenly appear in the trading market. I told you to stop. Why did you still kill him? Ed shouted angrily and pointed to Michael, who was now a corpse. Daniel raised his eyebrows and replied, Who do you think you are? If I stop when I'm told to, wouldn't I look like some sort of wimp? Daniel's bold reply only stunned Ed, but it caught everybody by surprise gasp. The onlookers were shocked. He actually dares to provoke the young master of the fierce tiger family? That brat must be tired of living. Ed is the most recent talented awakened practitioner, completing three Jane chains at just 21 years of age. His strength is even comparable to many of the elders in the three great families. Offending Ed is tantamount to offending the entire fierce tiger family. That kid certainly won't have long to live. The surrounding spectators all let on a heavy sigh. Ed had a better reputation than Michael. Normal merchants would rarely encounter awakened practitioners. Therefore, Daniel's disrespect towards Ed was unbelievable to them. In the Roaring Tribe, the three great families were the ones that everyone should avoid offending at all costs. Since this person had offended the young master of the Fierce Tiger family, it would be impossible for him to continue staying in the Roaring Tribe. Good. Very good. Ed, fuming in rage, began laughing and gritting his teeth, stared at Daniel as if he was a predator that was about to pounce on his prey. Today, I will let you know that the dignity of the fierce tiger family cannot be violated. However, just when Ed was about to attack Daniel... Princess Nala, who was watching from the side, could not take it anymore. Slowly, walking forward with delicate steps, she stood in front of Daniel and shouted coldly, Ed, 
This person here is one of the men from our wild lion family. Do you really want to commit such a serious taboo? Though her voice was not very loud, it was nevertheless filled with the utmost confidence. Ed was taken aback when he realized that the girl in front of him was Princess Nala. Little sister Nala, you... why are you here? The expression on Ed's face immediately changed as he no longer intended to kill Daniel. I do not know who this bastard belongs to, but he was going to hurt me. Daniel helped me to take care of this trash. Princess Nala said as she stared at Ed. Also, Daniel will be representing the Wild Lion family in the Gladiator Tournament. Since all participants must not have any conflicts before the tournament, both our families will be disqualified if we continue to fight. Ed, do you really want the Crimson Dragon family to seize the throne? Princess Nala continued stating facts that no one could refute. He was being disrespectful to my fierce tiger family. Ed's face turned red as he sneered angrily. You brought this upon yourself. If you have any sort of grievances, tell your father to come to our wild lion family and reason with us instead of causing a ruckus here. Nala said and left with Daniel. Ed, frozen in a state of confusion, did not know how to react to her words. He did not try to cause any trouble with the wild lion family since he had to focus all his attention on the gladiator tournament. His father had even reminded him not to make a ruckus outside the family during this period. Daniel, right? Ed turned around and left. I will show you just how cruel I can be in the gladiator tournament. On the other hand, why did you act so recklessly? She asked Daniel after they were some distance away. Ed is the person you need to pay the most attention to in the Fierce Tiger family. Possessing the Fierce Tiger gene and having completed three gene chains, he's an opponent you must not look down on. Don't worry, he can't defeat me. Daniel smiled. At a loss for words, Nala glared menacingly at Daniel as if she was about to gouge out his eyes. She did not know where this person with a single gene chain got his confidence from. But Daniel somehow gave her a sense of relief. Perhaps she truly believed in Daniel's strength deep down in her heart. Under Nala's lead, they quickly arrived in front of a tall building that looked like a church. This place is specially created for awakened practitioners to sell and auction their items at. No one else besides awakened practitioners are allowed to enter as all the items in the auction are meant for them. Nala gave Daniel a brief introduction of the place. There's actually such a place? Daniel became excited as he carefully sized up this magnificent building. His mind filled with curiosity. Go in and see if there's anything that can enhance your fighting strength. Princess Nala stepped into the building. Before walking past the entrance, Nala took out two large cloaks for the both of them to keep their identities hidden while two guards stood at the door and swept a hexagonal crystal over everyone who entered. This was a procedure to tell whether the people who entered were awakened practitioners or not. After all, this auction place was allowed only for awakened practitioners. In addition to the dim lighting inside, everyone's faces were hidden behind their cloaks making it impossible to distinguish anyone's identities. Episode 36 Impulse Since everyone who came to this place were all awakened practitioners, no one revealed their true identity. After all, there would be a high chance that rare items would appear in the auction. If the buyers were to reveal their identities after winning their bid for such items, it would definitely attract the attention of bad people. Walking down the hall, the entire place lacked any sort of lighting, resulting in a dark atmosphere. As such, it made it difficult for anyone to see clearly. Daniel's eyes flashed in excitement as he observed and analyzed the entire hall. Possessing the Netherwolf gene, Daniel had a unique advantage in such a dimly lit place. On the sides of the hall stood many transparent display cabinets, supposedly the items from the trading market. 
Each case had a detailed description and prices of the items. Awakened practitioners who were interested in those items could directly purchase them without any discussion. Daniel and Nala looked at each other. Several cloaked awakened practitioners passed by the area while inspecting the items in the display cases. Gene burst pill, an item that increases one's gene energy for a short period of time upon consumption. While the user may experience the full effects of their gene chain, the side effects of the pill include destruction of that entire gene chain. This pill is extremely useful for awakened practitioners in life and death situations. Bloodthirsty Berserk Potion An item that will greatly increase one's strength and speed for a short period of time. During this period, the user will experience less pain. Side effects include feeling extremely weak for a period of time. Gene Condensate Potion An item that solidifies one's gene energy, leading to the increase in strength. A myriad of gene-related items flashed across Daniel's eyes, but none of them particularly caught his attention. Although these items could strengthen the user for a short period of time, they were nevertheless high-risk products that were filled with countless negative side effects. Daniel did not see a need for these sorts of things. He looked at each item, spending no more than three seconds on each one. Going past the section for the gene medicine, he found himself in the section related to gene artifacts. This specific section contained many rare items. Gene artifacts could only be created by gene refining experts, but the success rate for each creation was not very high. Not only that, but the design for each gene artifact was extremely detailed and much harder to replicate compared to gene pills and medicine. The gene artifacts being auctioned here were not considered to be very exquisite, as most of them were embedded with certain beast cores, known to be lower-tier gene artifacts. Even so, the section for gene artifacts attracted the most attention. Every awakened practitioner has one thing in common, and that is their interests in gene artifacts. Should I get a gene artifact for you? The gold band that you are currently using looks rather fragile. Princess Nala looked through the row of gene artifacts and whispered to Daniel. Daniel shook his head and slowly walked past the section for gene artifacts. These crude, so-called gene artifacts were not as impressive as Daniel's semi-finished bionic arm. Daniel had no interest in those pieces of junk. The next section ahead was the one auctioning raw materials and resources. Although some may have rare materials, not many awakened practitioners held interest in that subject due to the scarcity of gene refining experts. The insect powder from the gale butterfly has the ability to weaken one's gene energy and can be used to create a defensive gene artifact. The shell of the thunder turtle inhibits its strong defense attributes and affinity for the lightning element gene energy. In addition to its impenetrable defense, it can be used to further enhance an awakened practitioner's lightning element. The dragon horn of the dragon bone sheep is incomparably sharp. Any contact with its sharp edge will surely leave behind an open wound. The raw materials dropped by certain mutated beasts caught Daniel's interest and piqued his curiosity. Since the raw materials found in this section were discovered by awakened practitioners from all around the world, there would be many strange materials that he had never ever heard of. Most of the raw materials still needed to be processed by experts before they can even display their full power. There were a few raw materials that could be used, but their effect would be greatly reduced. Therefore, the prices of each material in this section were lower than gene medicine and gene artifacts sold in the previous two sections. Even so, there were a few people who were still interested in the raw materials. The reason why gene medicine and gene artifacts were so much more expensive than raw materials was not because of their inferiority. Instead, it was because gene refining experts were difficult to come by. Even amongst the Roaring Tribe, there was not a single gene refining expert. 
After all, gene refining experts were in high demand, even in D ranked gathering grounds. Thus, how could there be a gene refining expert stationed in a mere E class tribe? Daniel continued to look through the different raw materials. There's no need for you to keep looking in this section. Since our family does not have a gene refining expert, buying these raw materials would be a waste of money. Nala reminded Daniel when she saw how mesmerized he was at the raw materials. All of a sudden, Daniel suddenly had an idea. Other than gene extraction, he also had the ability to fuse two genes into a stronger one. If so, could he possibly be able to fuse materials? I'll just buy some as a souvenir. Daniel proceeded to choose from the array of raw materials auctioned in the materials section. While most of the other awakened practitioners were bidding for the medicine and artifacts in the other sections, not many seemed to be interested in the raw materials in this section. Daniel chose a few materials that seemed quite useful and bid on them. Since no one else wanted to bid on the raw materials, he managed to get all of his selections at the starting price. Demonic spider's blood, black grass snake skin, gale butterflies insect powder. These materials did not cost Daniel many beast cores, and he successfully purchased them on his first try. Baffled by Daniel's decision, Nala had no idea what Daniel was doing. The reason why she brought him to the auction house for awakened practitioners was so that he could buy a few items that would further increase his strength. Instead, Daniel ended up choosing a bunch of useless raw materials. If the Roaring Tribe did have a gene refining expert, he could have possibly turned those raw materials into powerful gene artifacts or useful gene medicine. Since there were no gene refining experts in the Roaring Tribe, however, the raw materials he bought would simply end up as decorations at best, no matter how expensive or valuable they may be. After returning to the Wild Lion family's territory, Daniel did not even pay attention to Nala as he ran back to his room and closed the door. Can we really depend on that boy? Nala shook her head and sighed. Although she did not know whether her decision was right or wrong, she no longer had the time to think about her decision. All she could do now is hope for good luck. In his room, Daniel took out the materials he bought and neatly arranged them. Then, he took out this semi-finished bionic arm. Gene Fusion. Daniel opens his attribute panel and tentatively clicked on the Fusion button. Episode 37 Tournament During the fusion process, two new choices appeared before Daniel. Beginner Fusion. Cost 100 energy points. Intermediate Fusion. Cost 100 intermediate energy points. Daniel frowned, thinking of the low success rate of his previous gene extractions. Don't tell me this gene fusion also has a low success rate. Daniel thought hard about it and decided to choose intermediate fusion. While the raw materials could be repurchased, the bionic arm was one of a kind. After finalizing his decision, both the raw materials and the bionic arm disappeared. At the same time, the option for Gene Fusion turned gray. The countdown for the fusion began ticking down from 600 seconds. Intermediate fusions required 10 minutes to complete, making them more time-consuming than normal fusions. 10 minutes passed in the blink of an eye. During this time, Daniel played around with the ring he bought earlier from the trading market. After activating the Gene Energy, the ring emitted a buzzing sound and shone with a dazzling light. A layer of golden barrier began forming around Daniel. Interesting, is this defensive gene artifact? Daniel was pretty sure it was when the barrier surrounded him. Defensive gene artifacts usually became large-scale shields created from the raw materials of certain monsters. The artifacts that formed a barrier around its users, on the other hand, were relatively rare. More importantly, the barrier did not have a single blind spot. Ding! Gene fusion successful. Demonic gauntlet. 
A crisp sound rang in Daniel's ears as the bionic arm reappeared. The bionic arm looked different from the original, though. It had turned into a crimson gauntlet that looked like the claws of a demonic beast. Flushed with excitement, Daniel immediately attached the gauntlet to his arm. Compared to the semi-finished bionic arm he had before, Daniel found the demonic gauntlet easier to control, and it felt as if it had merged with his arm. The gladiator tournament is held once every three years. In size and importance, the tournament was a much larger event than the annual trading market. The tournament was divided into two parts. The first part of the tournament included duels between ordinary warriors, used to select the most elite warriors of the Roaring Tribe. The second part of the tournament included the long-awaited battles between the Awakened Practitioners. During the battles, the young Awakened Practitioners of the three great families displayed their combat prowess and strength. This part of the tournament ultimately served to decide the distribution of resources among the three great families. This was the main reason why the three great families valued the gladiator tournament so much. Because of its importance, they would pour all their resources into the most outstanding junior disciples in order to increase their strength. The gladiator tournament was held on the last day of the trade gathering. By that time, the Roaring Tribe crowd would have reached its peak. Even the merchants who had been working their hardest to sell off their products would be gathered to watch the grand event taking place right in front of them. In the center of the Roaring Tribe, a grandiose coliseum, built together with the cooperation of the three great families, stood magnificently in the midst of the smaller buildings surrounding it. Occasionally, there would be friendly duels taking place in that coliseum, which were extremely popular among the people of the Roaring Tribe who enjoyed viewing the battles as a form of entertainment. Now it would be used as the main arena for the gladiator tournament. When Daniel followed the Wild Lion family to their exclusive seats, he felt as if he had traveled back in time to the Roman Empire. The outer ring of the Colosseum included the stands for the audience to watch the match from above. Although the gladiator tournament served mainly as a competition between the three great families, there would still be many other foreign awakened practitioners who signed up to test their strength against each other. The awakened practitioners who performed well would receive the favor of the three great families. The gladiator tournament was a good opportunity for the ordinary awakened practitioners to show off their abilities and make a name for themselves. Above the outer ring stood three different platforms, viewing locations for the members of the three great families. The members of the three great families had arrived. Everyone from the Wild Lion family was dressed in their golden military uniforms, transforming their viewing platform into a pond of gold. Krista and Daniel were no exceptions as they sat there dressed in lavish gold. Gold was the signature color of the Wild Lion family. The members of the Crimson Dragon family were all dressed in scarlet robes with their figures and facial features concealed so no one could differentiate between them. Everyone in the Fierce Tiger family was covered in pure white with the faint word King imprinted on their foreheads. When Ed Norton arrived at the field, his gaze immediately fell on Princess Nala. As he headed over to greet her, he noticed Daniel sitting next to Nala. His gentle expression immediately twisted into disgust as he stared menacingly at Daniel. Noticing the daggers pointing towards him, Daniel turned his gaze over and looked back at Ed with a smile. From Ed's perspective, Daniel's expression was certainly an undisguised provocation, making him fume with utter rage. I will definitely make you pay a heavy price in the gladiator tournament, Ed thought fiercely to himself. When most of the participants and spectators had arrived, the gladiator tournament commenced without further delay. Joe Smith, Tom Miller, come up to the arena and fight. In the center of the arena stood a burly man who served as the referee. With a furious roar, he called up the names of two ordinary warriors of Roaring Tribe. Although the battle between the normal warriors was mundane, the audience cheered with enthusiasm. 
After all, the fighters were still warriors of Roaring Tribe, and the common people revered them. The battle between normal warriors was fierce. Since they only had their close combat skills to show off, they usually chose weapons like sabers, spears, and shields. After many bloodthirsty roars and the clanging of steel weapons, the first part of the tournament came to an end. Finally, only the ten strongest warriors remained, and they each received their respective rewards according to their ranking. The top warriors were selected by the three great families to become elite warriors of their family. Next was the main event everyone had been waiting for. The duels between the awakened practitioners. The awakened practitioners stood up one after another from all sides of the Colosseum, prepared to battle. The length and ferocity of each battle varied. Most of the awakened practitioners participating in the tournament possessed a single gene chain. The awakened practitioners with two gene chains were classified as rare talents. Awakened practitioners who possessed three gene chains were qualified to establish their own sect, and there was no need for them to depend on a family. It seems that the quality of the battles between the foreign awakened practitioners aren't very high this time. We haven't seen a single one of them with three awakened gene chains. Samson looked at the fighting awakened practitioners and could not help but yawn. The reason we recruited Jack Hawkins into our family in the previous gladiator tournament was because he possessed three gene chains, but his combat strength is far too weak and... Only one of his gene abilities is even worth mentioning. Larry said indifferently from the side. Just when everyone was bored out of their minds, the crowd suddenly erupted into a burst of cheers and everyone turned their heads to look. In the center of the battle stadium stood a well-built man emanating a ferocious aura. Daniel's pupils constricted in anger as he stared menacingly at that figure. Sand Wolf Camp, Commander John Thompson. Episode 38, Ambition. As if they had detected the superior aura of the person stepping into the arena, Samuel and Larry's eyes flashed in shock, looking at John in surprise. The two other great families were also gazing at John. After all, John was an awakened practitioner with five gene chains. Who is this man? His aura is so overwhelming. He must have awakened more than three gene chains. Larry squinted his eyes as he sized John up. Since John's aura worried Larry this much, it meant John was much stronger than he. However, Larry was currently on the verge of awakening his fourth gene chain. If that man was stronger than Larry, he would certainly be an expert with at least four gene chains. Hello, everyone from the Roaring Tribe. John stood at the center of the arena with his arms wide open as he exclaimed in a hoarse voice. I am the commander of the Sand Wolf Camp, John Thompson. John stated his identity without any hesitation. It is widely known that there were at least three F-Class camps stationed near the Roaring Tribe. Only few commanders came out personally due to their busy schedules. Therefore, it was normal for most people to not hear or know about John. Regardless of his stature, he is a participant in the Gladiator Tournament, one of the judges in the Coliseum said in a light tone. Since the Gladiator Tournament was an important and valued competition to the three great families, their advisors and security would never allow anyone to cause trouble in it. Of course, I'm just a participant. However, I've heard that if a foreign awakened practitioner manages to obtain first place in the Gladiator Tournament, they may make a request of the three great families. Is that true? John asked loudly in a cold tone. The judges present did not dare to casually answer his question. After all, the patriarchs of the three great families were all present, so they would decide amongst themselves. Samuel narrowed his eyes and carefully examined John for a while. Then, 
He looked towards the Crimson Dragon family and the Fierce Tiger family, exchanging glances with the patriarchs of the two great families. This is certainly one of the conditions. However, the other condition is that you'll have to defeat all the participants, Samuel said lightly. Although John was powerful and had wakened more than three gene chains, the geniuses from the Crimson Dragon and Fierce Tiger family would be equally strong. Some of those elite disciples had already awakened their fourth gene chain with constant support of their families. They were confident they could win. They estimated John's strength as the commander of a camp would range from somewhere around the peak of the third gene chain to the fourth gene chain. For me, that feat. The insolent smile on John's face gradually twisted into a menacing expression as he revealed a trace of malevolence. Will be easy to accomplish. Suddenly, an extremely powerful fluctuation of gene energy exploded from John's body, imprinting his might deep into the minds of everyone. It was as if an alpha wolf was howling and asserting his dominance in the center of the arena. Immediately after sensing his strong presence, everyone in the audience gasped in shock. Similarly, the patriarch of the Crimson Dragon, Wild Lion, and Fierce Tiger family all rose to their feet at the same time and looked towards John, who stood confidently in the center of the arena with a serious expression. Daniel, on the other hand, remained unfazed as he experienced John's aura before. Judging from the powerful aura that John had just emitted, he must have completed at least five gene chains. Who would think the commander of an F-Class camp would be a powerful awakened practitioner with five gene chains? One must know that after the initial awakening, the process of completing a gene chain was an arduous and difficult task to accomplish. As a matter of fact, newly awakened practitioners could feel a change in their abilities despite not completing a single gene chain yet. Since there are also differences in strength between genes, awakened practitioners with superior gene chains could rely on their own strength to overwhelm an opponent with an inferior gene chain. This kind of situation would often occur among the talented disciples of the three great families in the Roaring Tribe. In fact, Daniel was someone who embodied that exact quality. By completing the gene he obtained from the bloodthirsty furious ants, he also gained an inhuman strength and a sturdy physique. Although this kind of strength did not result from an increase in gene energy, Daniel was nonetheless an almost invincible state among the low-level awakened practitioners. However, this advantage would be ineffective when facing a stronger awakened practitioner with multiple gene chains. The awakened practitioners who did not possess many gene chains would have to rely on their strong physique and brute force gained from their initial awakening to do any damage to their opponents. Talented, awakened practitioners who managed to awaken multiple gene chains would need to learn how to utilize their gene energy efficiently, in addition to their abundant gene abilities. The more gene chains an awakened practitioner has, the more advantages they have in battle as long as they manage their gene energy well. While the awakened practitioners who specialize in strengthening their bodies may have the greater advantage at first, the ones who have potential to awaken more gene chains and gene abilities would in theory be stronger in the long run. At this moment, John displayed the true strength of someone with five gene chains, which agitated even the patriarchs of the three great families. For someone to become a commander of an F-class camp, they would have to complete at least three gene chains. In the E-grade camp's patriarchs, the awakened practitioner would need to complete at least five gene chains. John was capable of establishing his own family or clan within the Roaring Tribe. Thinking back to John's previous question, his true purpose for joining the Gladiator Tournament was obvious. It seems like Commander Roger's prediction was wrong. John's goal was not to infiltrate the trading market, but instead 
to promote his F-Class camp to an E-Class camp by dominating the Gladiator tournament. When Krista saw John, her eyebrows furrowed and a trace of worry flashed across her face. John's ambition is greater than we could ever have imagined. Daniel, the two of us better not be seen in the arena. If you have to face him, he will definitely seize the opportunity to kill you. Daniel analyzed the situation quietly and didn't reply. Such, such an imposing manner. He's an awakened practitioner with five gene chains. Oh my God, his strength is comparable to the patriarchs of the three great families. The commander of the F-Class camp does not seem to have good intentions. He must be trying to use the gladiator tournament to trample on the descendants of the three great families. It looks like there will soon be major changes in the power structure of the Roaring Tribe. Everyone who came to watch the gladiator competition was shocked by John's strength. All eyes were focused on him alone. If John was an awakened practitioner with four gene chains, then there might be a chance for some of the genius disciples of the three great families, who have consistently received support from their respective families, to defeat him. But with five gene chains, the result of the gladiator tournament this time could be predicted. Episode 39 Fierce Tiger Gene An awakened practitioner with five gene chains is comparable in strength to the patriarchs of the three great families. No matter how strong the talents of the three great families were, it would be impossible for them to rival a powerhouse with five gene chains. They were not on the same level at all. If you want to claim the throne, you will have to give past my fierce tiger family set a figure in white rushing onto the battlefield. The person, clad in white, held the white tiger sky saber in his grasp, and his handsome appearance hid a trace of brutality. That man was Ed Norton. Ed was the disciple with the most natural talent in the fierce tiger family. Among the younger generation, he was widely known as the strongest. He was also one of the most popular contestants favored to win in this year's gladiator tournament. Despite his youth, he had already completed three gene chains. Even when facing awakened practitioners who possessed four gene chains, his fierce tiger family lineage could give him the strength to defeat his opponent. As expected of the young master of the fierce tiger family, not only does he have the courage, but he also wears the confidence and demeanor of a king. When Larry saw Ed charge into the arena, his eyes sparkled as he threw praises at the young man. Patriarch, if we lose the gladiator tournament this time, marrying into the fierce tiger family would not be a bad idea. After all, Ed is quite interested in a little princess. Larry whispered in Samson's ears. Nala didn't hear those words, but Daniel did. What? You want to marry Princess Nala to Ed? Daniel immediately shouted out. Her expression darkened as Princess Nala turned around and glared menacingly at Larry. No, no, what kind of nonsense are you spouting? Larry panicked a little but pretended to be calm as he glared fiercely at Daniel. Daniel chuckled pleased that he decided to snitch on that old man. In the arena, Ed charged forward with the white tiger sky saber in his hand. The saber was peerless among all weapons. Brave, fierce, mighty, bloodthirsty. Possessing the fierce tiger gene combined with the strength of the vicious blade, Ed's each move was full of vigor and ferocity. Slashing down on Commander Stone, Ed forced him back one step at a time. The young master is invincible. Fierce tiger family, invincible. The young master is impressive indeed. He forced back an expert warrior with five gene chains when he only possesses three gene chains himself. When the people of fierce tiger family saw their young master's ferocity, they all burst into cheers. However, Anyone with a discerning eye could tell that John Stone had not bothered to counterattack. At that moment, 
he was easily dodging each of Ed's tyrannical attacks by relying solely on movement techniques. The differences between them were obvious at a quick glance. <sighs> Stop dodging like a coward and face my gene ability head on. Ed quickly grew impatient and irritated. With a fierce roar, he leaped into the air and slashed down at John. White tiger sword slash! Suddenly, a strong layer of gene energy surged through the sword and a blade of light shot out from Ed's blade, transforming into a white striped tiger. The blade of light flew towards John. As the effect of the gene artifact merged with Ed's gene ability, the spectators in the audience felt killing intent leap from the blade. Old shivers shivered down the spectators' spines. The powerful aura emanating from the blade of light terrified all of the spectators. Just when the blade of light was about to hit its target, John, who had yet to fight back, finally made his first move. Suddenly, John's arm muscles swelled huge and solid and thick. Dark blue hair covered them. He had activated his ancestral gene, the Sand Wolf gene. When his arm had fully transformed, John swiped his wolf claws into the air and tore down everything before him. The tyrannical slash Ed released with all his might was easily crushed in the air by John's steel-like claws. The giant blade of light shattered into specks of dust and vanished into the air like fireworks. Ed was taken aback witnessing the magnificent feat. After all, he was using his gene ability at full strength. In the blink of an eye, his opponent destroyed his attack, activating only his genes, not even bothering to activate his gene abilities. Not only was the seated audience deeply shocked by the scene, but even the members of the Fierce Tiger family, who were cheering for Ed earlier, turned completely silent. John, on the other hand, stood still, without moving an inch, as if he had just swatted away a mosquito. Looking down at the stunned Ed, his face revealed a hint of ridicule. Have you had enough yet? Is it my turn now? John's figure turned into an after image of himself, and he flashed behind Ed in an instant. His movements were so quick that no one could see what he did. How dare you? From the spectating platform where the fierce tiger was seated, an old man with white hair and a beard stood and flew towards the fighting platform, shouting anger. His enraged roar was like a white tiger howling through the sky. As the arena trembled under his voice, some of the spectators in the front row passed out from the pressure. Some of the spectators seated behind him had difficulty regaining consciousness. As ordinary people, it was painful to feel the waves of gene energy reverberating through the air. People covered their ears and twisted in agony. Standing on the wild lion family's platform, Nala frowned, feeling the pressure of the roar. While she may have only awakened a single, weak gene chain, she was nevertheless an official awakened practitioner. Even she could feel the discomfort from the old man's loud roar showing just how powerful he was. It was obvious the old man was the patriarch of the fierce tiger family. Judging from his roar alone, he had completed at least five gene chains as an awakened practitioner. However, John's strength was not inferior in the slightest. His sand wolf gene gave him speed that surpassed even that of the fierce tiger gene, which was ranked among the top three families. Despite dashing towards Ed at his fastest speed, the old man still could not make it in time to defend Ed from John's attack. Sensing the oncoming danger, Ed was scared witless and his entire body tensed up. Instinctively placing the white tiger sky saber horizontally in front of him, he stared helplessly at the dark blue shadow slowly charging towards him and it seemed as if time slowed down. White tiger shield! Letting out a ferocious roar, Ed felt the gene energy surge through his body as a faint golden light surrounded him. This seemed to be yet another defensive gene ability. 
With the enhancement from the White Tiger Sky Saber, Ed's entire body seemed to have turned into a golden statue as his defense reached its peak. The fierce tiger gene, balancing between offense and defense, sent out vicious attacks and remained impervious to others. At that instance, the White Tiger Sky Saber collided ferociously with John's steel-like wolf claws. Crash! A loud sound wave shocked the air. Ugh! Letting out a dire screech, Ed spurted out mouthfuls of blood as he shot through the air like a cannonball. Shooting in a straight line across the entire arena, Ed crashed heavily like a meteor, his body embedded deep into the wall. The impact was so powerful, it caused the seats above to tremble like an earthquake. From this explosive impact, one could see just how much stronger John was compared to Ed. Episode 40 Ruthlessness Villain! Taken aback by Ed's severe injuries, the old man, roaring like a fierce tiger, bared his teeth and slammed his fist down on John. Pay with your life! At that moment, the old man transformed into a tiger, opened his ferocious jaws, and attempted to tear away at John with his bare teeth. Instead of dodging, John turned around and counterattacked without hesitation. As the two fists collided, a violent wave of gene energy fluctuated through the air, forming a raging tempest that rippled through the arena. What powerful gene energy! That man's strength is comparable to the old monster from the Fierce Tiger family. Larry squinted his eyes and exclaimed in shock as he waved his hand to disperse the incoming storm. Although Ed possesses great talent and a natural strong physique, he couldn't take one move from that man and didn't use any of his gene abilities to counterattack. Hearing Larry's words, Daniel's gaze turned serious. John's strength had already reached the same level as the three family heads. That was unexpected. Daniel would not waver in his conviction that John must die. After exchanging their first blows, the patriarch of the fierce tiger family and John both retreated a few steps. It was clear to everyone that their strength was equal. What's this? Are the patriarchs allowed to participate in the gladiator tournament? John said with a mocking expression on his face as he brushed the dust off his body. Unable to control his anger, the patriarch took another step, preparing to make John pay the price for provoking his fierce tiger family. However, the fierce tiger family is not the only great family in the Roaring Tribe. Timothy Fine, this is the gladiator tournament. Are you going to interfere with it? A deep voice, thick and powerful, resounded from one of the platforms above. It felt as if it could pierce through a person's soul. The fierce tiger family's patriarch, Timothy, turned his head to look. From a distance, he saw a figure wearing a red robe. The figure was the patriarch of the Crimson Dragon family. As a way for maintaining a delicate balance of power in the Roaring Tribe, the three great families were responsible for restricting and keeping one another in check. If my warrior suffers some unexpected misfortune, don't expect to leave this place alive. Timothy stated in a deep voice as he stared menacingly at John. John simply sneered and did not reply. Timothy helped the seriously injured Ed down from the arena. Standing alone in the middle of the arena, John looked rather lonely but emitted a domineering presence. He seemed to possess the aura of a one-man army, capable of taking down 10,000 men. Is anyone else gonna come up? John cheered and said in a mocking tone as he stood proudly in the arena. Sweeping his gaze around the Colosseum, no one dared make a sound. Not the foreign awakened practitioners or the disciples from the three great families of the Roaring Tribe. 
Since Ed was known as the strongest of his peers, the younger generation of other families, slightly weaker than him, did not dare make a move. If Ed was unable to withstand a single attack from John, who in their right mind would dare step forth and throw away their life voluntarily? After all, their opponent was an awakened practitioner with five gene chains, comparable in strength to the patriarchs of the three great families in the Roaring Tribe. Since Timothy, the patriarch of the fierce tiger family, couldn't do anything to him, who among the younger generation would dare go up? That's all the Roaring Tribe has? What a bunch of useless trash! <laughs> John revealed a hint of arrogance as he burst into gales of laughter. Who's next? Although many of the awakened practitioners in the audience twisted their faces in disgust and rage, they did not dare to say anything after witnessing John's overwhelming strength. The other powerful figures, including the patriarchs of the three great families, were bound by the rules of the gladiator tournament and could do nothing about the situation. The other weaker contestants weren't worth mentioning. John would eat them like a snack if they entered the arena. One of them challenging John would be like an ant trying to shake a tree. Just when everyone thought that the gladiator tournament would end dominated by an awakened practitioner from the outside, a golden light rushed into the arena. Do you really think that my wild lion family will stay silent? With a shout, a golden ripple exploded from the palm of the golden figure, heading straight towards John. When the audience realized the identity of the golden figure, all of them, including John, were dumbfounded. The slim, delicate figure, dressed in a golden military uniform, looked determined. Nola! Samson roared loudly. He was anxious and conflicted about whether or not to rush the arena. Nala, stirred by her emotions and unable to stand John's taunts and humiliating words any longer, rushed recklessly down the platform. Princess Nala! If a delicate lady like Princess Nala has the courage to act, how can the men of the Roaring Tribe call themselves men but keep their heads tucked in their turtle shell? Charge! Stand up with Princess Nala and let the bastard know our strength! Everyone was stunned for a moment before their morale was boosted by the princess's courageous act. One figure after another rushed out from the audience like raindrops. Awakened practitioners with one, two, or even three gene chains, everyone rushed towards the arena with a strong resolve. A series of heaven-shaking roars burst out and the crowd charged John from all directions. No one had expected the situation to escalate to such a degree. Regaining his composure, John stared at Nala curiously, not seeing her as a great threat. <laughs> I didn't expect such courage and command from a young lady like you. A hint of coldness flashed in John's eyes. But I guess I'll have to destroy you all the same. At that instance... John's figure once again turned into an afterimage as he dashed towards Nala. However, John was not facing a single awakened practitioner this time, as dozens of others began surrounding him. If John wanted to make his move on Nala, he had to deal with these pests first. Although these awakened practitioners were much weaker than he, they outnumbered him. They were like a horde of annoying flies waiting to be swatted in John's eyes. Since there were only a few awakened practitioners with three gene chains, John didn't see a need to worry. You bunch of trash, get lost. Letting out a ferocious roar, the gene energy in his body exploded forth and formed an image of a giant sand wolf. Boom, bang, crash. Activating only his genes and not his abilities, John charged directly through the horde of awakened practitioners. Those awakened practitioners were flicked away like ants before they managed to land their attacks on John. The battle arena turned into a massacre filled with blood-curdling screeches. Dozens of awakened practitioners were unable to defeat John's absolute strength. 
As John got closer, Nala, with only a single gene chain, felt the enormous pressure emanating from him. Nala stood petrified in place and stared dumbfounded at John's wolf claw ready to tear her to shreds. Nala! Samson roared as he stared helplessly at the situation and filled with rage. Episode 41, An Even Battle As John's aura pressed down on Nala's body, she could feel the Grim Reaper's scythe around her neck, waiting to slash down at any moment. Nala, her heart filled with despair and regret, shut her eyes and waited for her inevitable death. Just when John's wolf claw was about to tear apart Nala's body, a golden banded staff suddenly collided fiercely with John's claws. Crash! Upon impact, a gigantic wave of gene energy in the form of a gust of wind erupted before Nala. Flying into the air from the explosion, Nala lost her balance and braced for impact as she was about to land heavily on the ground. However, Nala did not feel any pain as she landed into the arms of a person. It seems that you're sleeping rather well, princess. Now hurry and get back up. Nala heard a familiar voice coming from the person that caught her. As she opened her eyes, she saw Daniel rolling his eyes at her as she was lying in his arms. Regaining her senses, she was surprised and quickly slipped out of Daniel's embrace. Her beautiful face flushed like a cherry. Who dares to interrupt me? John was angry as no one was supposed to be able to stop him. He now felt as though he wasted all his efforts trying to kill her and allowed Nala to escape. Huh, <laughs> stupid dog, do you remember me? Daniel said to John with a slight smile on his face. When Jaws saw the face of the person standing in front of him, he couldn't believe it. <laughs> it's you! How are you not dead yet? John pointed at Daniel in disbelief. Not only had John used three direct moves on Daniel, but he hadn't even used the soul-devouring wolf claw on him. Even though Daniel managed to survive the initial damage, he thought that the effects from the soul-devouring wolf claw would have surely killed him. Even if he did miraculously survive, his mind should have been injured. John never thought that he would meet Daniel once again in the Roaring Tribes Gladiator Tournament. What he failed to understand was how his soul-devouring wolf claw had actually benefited Daniel instead, making the fusion of the netherwolf gene successful. Daniel's spiritual force had increased dramatically, allowing him to disregard most mental or spiritual attacks. Daniel could actually thank him for giving him such a great opportunity. Daniel looked like some sort of a golden terracotta soldier wearing the inheritance armor of the wild lion family and holding a diamond staff in his hand. Who is this person? How did he manage to block an attack from a powerhouse with five gene chains? It seems to be an awakened practitioner from the wild lion family. That golden banded staff seems to be some kind of extraordinary gene artifact that helped him block the fatal strike. Did he come here as some sort of joke? Why is he dressed in such a comical fashion? The people thought Daniel's appearance was ridiculous, and they were somewhat disgusted. The audience wanted the person who beat John to be a genius disciple from the three great families who represented the Roaring Tribe, not a stranger who dressed like a clown. If I had died, how could I still be walking in front of you now? asked Daniel. Since you want to die, I will be more than willing to grant you that wish. Letting out a fierce growl, the gene energy in John's body erupted as he tore his claws down on Daniel. An attack from awakened practitioner with five gene chains was so powerful that even the young master Ed could not withstand it and was heavily injured by a single strike of his claws. When everyone saw John's claw strike towards Daniel, they thought Daniel would be sent flying. This foreign awakened practitioner they had never seen before could not possibly be stronger than the genius awakened practitioner that was accepted in their roaring tribe, right? Only the patriarchs of the three great families would be able to keep that man in check. However, 
that did not happen. Instead, Daniel held his staff horizontally in front of his chest and blocked John's attack. Steel blocked defense. The audience could see that his move was one of the defensive stances of the basic staff technique. As the huge force crashed into the golden banded staff, it only bent slightly. Daniel's leg bore the brunt of the attack as they dug deeper into the ground of the battle arena. How is this possible? That person actually withstood it. Isn't that technique the steel lock defense? How could a basic staff technique possibly block an attack from an awakened practitioner with five gene chains? A move that even the young master of the fierce tiger family could not endure was actually blocked by him? The audience cried out in surprise. This brand has a lot of potential. Even now, he has yet to use any gene energy and is only using his physical strength to fight back," said Larry in disbelief as he saw Daniel's muscles tighten. I've never seen a freak like him before. Even ancestral genes don't have such strength. Ancestral genes would basically provide the awakened practitioner with a certain amount of increased strength. Daniel, on the other hand, was able to unleash a power that was even more terrifying than any ancestral gene. Even with Larry's previous combat experiences, he reinforced the fact that Daniel's strength was indisputable. <laughs> Phew. It's all thanks to Daniel that Nala didn't get hurt. If Daniel gets injured today, I will definitely make that man pay for his actions. Samson let out a deep sigh of relief when he saw Nala walking back unharmed. After all, Nala was Samson's beloved daughter and also the sole successor to the entire wild lion family. If something were to happen to Nala, even if the participants of the other two families tried to stop him, Samson would do whatever it takes to hunt John down. Larry's eyebrows twitched when he heard the words of the patriarch Samson. This statement showed that Samson saw Daniel as someone affiliated to the wild lion family. When Daniel dove in to save Nala, he had won Samson's recognition. So what if you have five gene chains? Is that really that impressive? Daniel said as he slowly raised his head and looked at John, who was just inches away from him. A bloodthirsty look flashed across both of their eyes. I had never expected you to grow so fast. If I were to let you live now, you might be able to get strong enough to kill me in the future. John laughed sinisterly. <laughs> what a shame. Since you came before me today, you will not leave this place alive. What are you talking about, stupid dog? Do you really believe that I'm not strong enough to beat you into a pulp? Daniel said to him. Daniel continued to insult him. And no matter how good of a person John was, he was fuming with anger and said, Go to hell. Roaring like a crazy dog, John transformed his other hand into a huge wolf claw and tore down on Daniel's body. Holding a mere staff in his hands, Daniel would surely not be able to defend this attack. Episode 42 Incoming danger. This is bad. Larry cried out when he saw John's attack. Since Daniel was using a staff as his weapon, he could only block one of John's claws and could not defend himself against the others. Even if he were able to block both claws with his staff, it would shatter into pieces under the pressure exerted from John's claws. This was a very dangerous situation for Daniel. Unless Daniel could somehow block both of John's claws with his hands, it would be impossible to defend himself against his attack. Aware of the danger, Daniel decided it was time to use the ace up his sleeves. With a loud roar, he lifted one of his hands and blocked John's attack. Ed was sent flying by John's wolf claws and was vomiting in blood. It was likely that Daniel's body would be torn apart. Everyone was imagining Daniel's body being torn apart by John's claws, and they closed their eyes in frustration. Suddenly, a loud thud sounded through the Colosseum. Despite what everyone imagined, they saw one of Daniel's arms holding on to John's claw tightly. 
both sides were actually in a deadlock. John's attack didn't do any damage. How is this possible? John looked at Daniel, who remained unfazed and uninjured under the attack of his fierce wolf claws. His gaze fell on Daniel's arm that collided with his claw. Daniel seemed to have something that looked like the claw of a beast wrapped around his arm. It was this strange item that allowed this weak trash to block John's attack. He actually blocked the wolf claw? Just who is this kid? He's even stronger than that young master of the fierce tiger family. What's that in his hand? It seems to be some kind of gene artifact. Well, I heard this person is the representative for the wild lion family in the gladiator tournament this year. Daniel had miraculously blocked John's violent attack, and everyone in the audience cheered and wondered about Daniel's true identity. The armor that Daniel had was amusing, but he represented the wild lion family. As their discussions continued, more people from the Roaring Tribe were on Daniel's side. They saw Daniel as the only person capable of resisting John's ferocious attacks. Everyone thought Daniel would win the battle. As the most talented awakened practitioner in the Roaring Tribe's younger generation, Ed had already left the arena after being heavily injured by John's wolf claw. The other awakened practitioners, with their strength combined, would not dream of trying to take John down even if they attacked him together. In the entire Roaring Tribe, there was not a single awakened practitioner who could stop John's rampage. Since Daniel had stepped forth, not only was he the hope for the wild lion family, but he also stood as the final pillar of hope for the entire Roaring Tribe. Is that all you got? Daniel held John's wolf claws tightly and slowly raised his head. The corner of his mouth lifted into a cunning smile as he spoke. The gauntlet was none other than the gene artifact that Daniel created by fusing his semi-finished bionic arm with some raw materials harvested from the corpses of various mutated beasts. After equipping the gauntlet, Daniel's strength had increased by several folds. After the fusion of this gene artifact, Daniel gained some new abilities that he did not have before. Brat, since you don't care about dying, don't blame me for not showing mercy. John said to Daniel. Forcing his wolf claw back, the two of them separated from each other. John took three steps back, but Daniel, on the other hand, remained in the same position. In terms of strength, it seemed that the awakened practitioner with five gene chains had nothing on Daniel. Despite possessing the sand wolf gene, which drastically increased his speed and strength, John was still not as powerful as Daniel. I was unable to kill you last time with my gene abilities, but this time I won't be holding back. Suddenly, John's muscles bulged as his entire body trembled with a surge of gene energy. To actually force me into using my gene ability, you should be honored to die by my hands. If I let you go now, you will surely pose a great threat to me in the future," John said furiously. Ah, that is the transformation technique of the ancestral gene. Rumors have it that after an awakened practitioner with an ancestral gene awakens five gene chains or more, they would be able to activate their transformation technique. This is bad. After the transformation, some of the more powerful aspects of the ancestral gene will be revealed. We're afraid this situation is not looking good for Daniel, they exclaimed several people in the audience who knew about the ancestral genes. The ancestral gene has the potential to rank at the top of the other types of genes. After an awakened practitioner who possesses an ancestral gene reaches a certain level of strength, they would be able to use their transformation technique. After the transformation, not only would the awakened practitioner have the strength comparable to their respective ancestral beast, but they would also have the intelligence of their human mind. That is the scariest part of such a skill. 
Daniel, on the other hand, remained unfazed as he equipped his steel gauntlet on one hand while holding the golden banded staff on the other. The process of John's transformation took just over 10 seconds. During this period, Daniel took the opportunity to land a few attacks of his own. After the transformation, John's appearance could no longer be seen as human. His physical body had changed into a hybrid form of a human and a wolf. Upon his successful transformation, all the muscles in his body surged with gene energy. With a loud howl, he left behind a gust of wind as he pounced towards Daniel. Soul-devouring wolf claw. As John began slashing his wolf claws, a black aura began surrounding him. This was the gene ability that he previously used to injure Daniel. The black aura had a corrosive effect that could drain away one's life force. Had it not been for Daniel's skill, he would have lost his life. Daniel was once again faced with the familiar attack, but even more powerful than the previous one. A stupid dog will always remain a stupid dog, so what if he turns into a beast? Holding the gold-banded staff in his hand, Daniel struck it directly on John's skull. John's strength had greatly increased after he transformed into his hybrid form. Daniel felt the same strengthening effect after putting on his steel gauntlet. The instant the two sides collided, a powerful shockwave exploded in all directions as a series of ripples erupted upon impact. Although both of them remain unharmed, the black aura from John's wolf claws seemed to have seeped into Daniel's body through the gold-banded staff. Smiling, Daniel dispersed the black aura into the air with a light wave of his steel gauntlet. What? Episode 43 Wounded Although the audience may not have seen it, John witnessed the results of Daniel's attack. His gene ability disappeared by the strange steel gauntlet in Daniel's hand. The black aura was created using gene energy and it possessed a strong corrosion ability. If an ordinary person were to come into contact with even a hint of the black aura, their skin and flesh would decay rapidly, leading to their inevitable death. Even if a gene artifact was used, they would not be able to do anything to the Black Aura. What John did not know was that Daniel had utilized his ability to fuse materials to get rid of the Black Aura. Thus, the Black Aura made out of gene energy was of no threat to Daniel. Do you think I'm afraid of you because of that gene artifact in your hands? Is that metal toy the trump card that you're so proud of? John looked at Daniel menacingly and said with a sneer, I'm not sure whether you're courageous or stupid. You actually dared to throw your life away just because you have a small gene artifact with you? You sure are full of crap. Daniel let out with a cold snort. Tired of waiting for John to finish speaking, he immediately attacked him with his gold-banded staff. Tensing his muscles up, Daniel concentrated all of his strength into his staff and thrust it towards John. Soul-devouring wolf roar! John opened his mouth wide as a wave of gene energy coalesced in his mouth. That gene ability must be a type of spiritual attack using sound waves. Princess, please be careful. Realizing what John was going to do, Larry immediately warned the princess next to him. As the gene energy in his body fluctuated, he prepared himself to receive the spiritual attack. Seeing how a spiritual attack was about to be used, even the other awakened practitioners with three gene chains prepared themselves in advance. This power of this spiritual attack was not to be underestimated. As the ear-piercing howls sounded from John's mouth, the sound waves reverberated and resulted in a series of ripples in the air. What are you howling like a dog for? Just shut up. Instead of dodging the deadly spiritual attack, Daniel rushed fearlessly into the sound wave directed at him. The sound waves from the howl swept past Daniel as he frowned 
but was unharmed. As he became closer to John, Daniel charged up the steel gauntlet in his hand and smashed it down on his chest. John began to howl, but Daniel forced him back with his brutal attack. John collapsed heavily to the ground with a loud thump as his chest was bleeding and churned in pain. Looking at Daniel with a dumbfounded expression, John could not understand how or why his spiritual attack was ineffective against him. He had even charged past the sound waves and counterattacked. It was as if Daniel had already seen through his gene abilities. Taking advantage of John's confusion, Daniel stared at him as a dark presence lingered. I'll show you the true strength of a spiritual attack. Daniel let out a head-splitting roar as a surge of gene energy emerged from the depths of his throat like a volcanic eruption. Roar of the nether. At that moment, a sound like a demon's voice came out from Daniel's mouth. John, yet to come back to his senses, felt like his head was struck by lightning after being hit by the sound wave from Daniel's roar. He felt as if someone was drilling something into his head as the excruciating pain shocked through the rest of his body. As the sound waves caused by the gene energy reverberated through John's body, it even caused magnitude among his internal organs. With blood gushing out from his mouth, John looked shocked as he looked at Daniel in absolute disbelief. Although the power was different, John could feel that Daniel's gene ability was similar to his soul-devouring wolf roar. Perhaps it could even be considered as an enhanced version of his original gene ability. More importantly, John finally noticed the bloodlust in Daniel's eyes. The audience then erupted into an uproar, shocked by the scene before them. The expert with five gene chains was spitting out blood after taking a hit from Daniel. However, they failed to notice how Daniel's roar of the nether had severely injured John's spiritual state. Despite suffering from the spiritual attack, John's injuries did not pose a threat since he had five gene chains. Relying on the quick recovery of the sandwolf gene, John only needed to rest for a while before recovering most of his strength. The severe injuries to his spiritual state were insignificant to him, but Daniel's power was something that really surprised John. This brat cannot be allowed to live, John thought to himself. Meanwhile, on the spectating platform of the Wild Lion family, both Larry and Princess Nala were in shock. Didn't that brat say he only had one gene chain? From the looks of the situation now, he should have at least two complete gene chains. Daniel, he's actually that strong? Regaining their senses, the two of them looked at Krista, who was sitting next to them. Their eyes were beaming with curiosity. Since both Krista and Daniel came from the Royal Mint camp, the two of them must surely know each other well. Don't look at me like that. I did not have a clue either. Daniel told me that he only completed a single gene chain. Krista said as she shook her head with a wry smile. Even Krista was shocked beyond belief by Daniel's explosive strength. At the Royal Mint Camp, although she knew that Daniel was very strong, he did not reveal anything related to his second gene chain. Seeing how Daniel's second gene ability was able to injure John to this degree, his second gene chain must be extraordinary. Daniel, seeing John was still recovering from his spiritual attack, took this opportunity to strike with his staff again. While the offensive power of the gold-banded staff was not that great, it was very useful on the defensive end. Under the hands of someone as powerful as Daniel, The gold-banded staff was certainly unlike any other weapon. Even if Daniel was given a bamboo stick, he would somehow be able to use it as a sturdy weapon. Coming to his senses in time, John lifted his pair of wolf claws above his head to block Daniel's attack. Bang! 
Once again, the sound of metal colliding with each other rang out like a bell. John's entire body was forced into the ground by the force of Daniel's attack, creating a large crater on the arena ground. Just when everyone thought that Daniel had won and completely ended John, a faint voice sounded from the crater that John was embedded in. Suddenly, a wave of crazy gene energy gushed out from the crater like a geyser. Hmm, the fluctuation of this gene energy. Even from a long distance away, Samson could feel the gene energy reverberating out of control through the air. He immediately frowned and looked towards the arena worried. Instead of continuing his attacks, Daniel, having felt the same crazy aura, took a few steps back with a serious look in his eyes. Episode 44 Reversal As John stood back up from the crater, a terrifying aura suddenly rose from his body. His faint yet deadly gene energy made everyone fearful. That should be enough playtime. Just do me a favor now and die. John roared violently as the shadow of a giant wolf loomed behind him. Just then, a fluctuation of gene energy was released from his body like a large tide. Wrath of the Wolf King. With the giant phantom of a wolf behind him, John charged towards Daniel with incomparable strength. This gene ability was clearly far superior to any of the genes he used before. Whether it was through brute force or oppressive pressure, it was sufficient to prove just how powerful John was. Not good, all of that killing intent is directed at Daniel, exclaimed Larry, who sensed John's terrifying aura. Oh no, what should we do? When Princess Nala heard those words, her beautiful and delicate face looked nervous. Although Daniel was an awakened practitioner whom she recruited to represent the Wild Lion family in the Gladiator Tournament, she had gotten rather close to him after spending a few days with each other, and she felt especially touched when Daniel had dived into the arena to rescue her. Princess Nala now had a different attitude towards Daniel and was concerned about his safety. If anything bad happened to Daniel, Princess Nala would not know what to do. However, due to the rules of the Gladiator Tournament, even if they knew that John had ill intentions for Daniel, they could only watch helplessly and let the events unfold in the arena. Nala, if Daniel manages to survive this Gladiator Tournament... Samson stared at the arena without blinking as he asked with a serious tone. I will formally accept that kid as the Wild Lion family's son-in-law. What do you think? His unexpected words stunned everyone in the Wild Lion family as they all looked at him in shock. Patriarch, that surely isn't a good idea. Larry muttered as he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Patriarch Samson, this isn't some sort of child's play. You should carefully consider it. Taken aback by the patriarch's suggestion, Krista began to think. She originally brought Daniel to the Roaring Tribe to purchase more supplies. If Daniel gets recruited by the Wild Lion family as a son-in-law, William would definitely strangle her to death. Although becoming the son-in-law of the Wild Lion family looked extremely promising for Daniel, the Roaring Tribe is not a gathering ground only run by the Wild Lion family themselves. The strength of the Wild Lion family had greatly declined in the recent generation. After all, Princess Nala is the only person in the younger generation of the family, and she only has completed a single gene chain. If Daniel really did join the Wild Lion family as his son-in-law, he would immediately be placed in a grim situation that might end up being a disadvantage to him instead. In addition, someone as prideful as Princess Nala may not even be interested in Daniel. Krista thought to herself, which made her feel a bit more at ease. No matter how talented Daniel was, he was just a small fry 
who came from an F-class camp. Furthermore, his potential after completing two gene chains were not clear and would be a gamble too. It would be impossible for one to become the son-in-law of a large family within the Roaring Tribe, and Princess Nala would definitely not be willing to accept someone like Daniel. I will let Father decide for me as I have no objections. As her face flushed bright pink in embarrassment, she lowered her head and muttered softly. Upon hearing her words, the entire wild lion family fell into an uproar. Krista, the other warriors, and Larry looked at Princess Nala in disbelief. Was she still the same prideful princess of the wild lion family? When Patriarch Samson wanted to arrange a marriage for Nala before, he was instead met with a strong resistance from her as she threw a large tantrum in the mansion. In that case, why did she suddenly agree so easily? No one could understand what was going through her mind. In the arena, Daniel looked at the phantom of the giant wolf that was now pouncing towards him with a serious look in his eyes. Boom. The phantom wolf dove into Daniel and swallowed him whole. It was as if a dark wave crashed down on him. Soon, the enormous amount of gene energy exploded like a lightning bolt strike. As the entire Colosseum shook uncontrollably, cries of alarm sounded from the audience. Such terrifying power! So this is the full power of an expert with five gene chains! It's over. This power is comparable to the might of the patriarchs of the three great families. The awakened practitioner of the wild lion family will definitely not be able to endure it. It seems that the Roaring Tribe will soon be undergoing many changes. A strong awakened practitioner, comparable in strength to the patriarchs, has appeared. Upon witnessing such terrifying power, their hearts were filled with despair. Even the patriarchs of the three great families could not sit still as they felt a great sense of agitation. Feeling the strong fluctuations of gene energy in the air, a trace of fear rose in their hearts. As the dust and debris in the arena slowly settled down, Everyone clearly saw John's gene ability. In the center of the arena, a crater, large enough to fit in more than a dozen people, had been formed as a result of John's attack. Such terrifying strength. Even if the one attacked was wearing sturdy armor, let alone a human body, they would definitely still be crushed. At that moment, a figure surrounded by a hint of black aura, could be seen walking slowly out from the deep crater as his body was emitting a small amount of fluctuating gene energy. That figure was John. Having used all of his remaining strength, he had reverted back into his human form, no longer looking like a hybrid of a man and a wolf. As blood trickled down the corner of his mouth, his body was a mess. On the other hand, Daniel was nowhere to be found. In the huge crater formed by John's attack, there was only a thick layer of black aura inside it. Who's next? Come up! Fight me! Letting out a ferocious roar, John stood grandly in the arena like an alpha wolf staring down at his pack of wolves. No one dared to utter even a single word. Not even the awakened practitioners or anyone from the three great families. Everyone focused their gazes on John, their eyes filled with absolute fear towards him. It seemed as if a new king was about to appear in the Roaring Tribe. Hearing nothing but silence, John began to smile until a golden pillar of light suddenly shot up from the bottom of the pit. Stupid dog, I'm not dead yet. Airing out a high-spirited shout, the figure surrounded by golden flames slowly walked out of the darkness-filled crater. Who else could this person be other than Daniel? Daniel's entire body seemed to be soaked in crimson, 
Wounds covered his entire body as blood kept flowing out uncontrollably. A very gruesome sight to see. Despite everything that happened, his ancient-looking armor was now glowing with a bright golden light. The head of a golden lion was faintly embedded as a crest in the chest of the armor, making it difficult for the naked eye to see. Episode 45 Dangerous Counterattack How is he still alive? Such tenacity. Exactly what kind of monster did we recruit into our wild lion family? Could his ridiculous armor be some sort of powerful gene artifact? Daniel's shining figure was as radiant as a small sun attracting the attention of everyone. Everyone was amazed to see how Daniel managed to still be alive even after taking on such a terrifying attack. Even though the audience was seated far away from the arena, a majority of them were able to feel the large amount of gene energy concentrated in John's crazy attack. Even if they had a hundred lives and were in Daniel's position, they would have been killed by that violent attack. Daniel is not dead yet. When Larry saw Daniel's figure re-emerge from the huge crater, he immediately screamed out in shock. Seeing Daniel in pure disbelief, he pointed to his figure and exclaimed, That has our wild lion family's inheritance armor been activated. When Daniel walked onto the arena stage, he had been wearing the wild lion family's inheritance armor. But no one from the wild lion family paid much attention to it because they knew that the set of the inheritance armor was just a decoration. After all, no one could activate this so-called inheritance armor, not even Patriarch Samson himself. Everyone in the Wild Lion family saw this armor as a symbol of spiritual inheritance, but they clearly witnessed how the armor on Daniel's body was now emitting a radiant light as the faint image of a golden lion could be seen enveloping him. Why were they not surprised? As members of the royal family, none of them could activate this set of armor. Instead, it was activated by an outsider. <laughs> the legend is actually real. Patriarch Samson was taken aback as he looked at Daniel beaming and muttered to himself. Of course, the one who was most shocked was not in the audience, but instead, it was John himself, Daniel's opponent. When he heard Daniel's voice, the corners of his mouth stiffened. In disbelief, he turned his head around and saw a figure that was covered in golden flames standing tall behind him. How are you not dead yet? John could not believe his eyes, especially since he had used almost all of his gene energy in that fatal strike. Patriarchs of the three great families would have to go all out to block that attack. Not to mention how an awakened practitioner with only two gene chains would be able to withstand it. No matter how much he thought about it, he could not understand how a mere awakened practitioner with two gene chains could withstand his violent gene ability. Despite standing tall on his two feet, Daniel looked miserable as every part of his body was injured. If it was not for the raging flames, which indicated that Daniel was all right, everyone might have thought that he was on the verge of death. Even so, everyone was still worried about Daniel's condition, as it did not look like he could continue fighting anymore. Father, tell Daniel not to fight anymore. He has already done more than enough. Seeing Daniel's body in such a broken state, Princess Nala became anxious and worried. As an awakened practitioner with only two gene chains, he was already at a severe disadvantage in the gladiator tournament. Not only did Daniel stand his ground, but he still stood up even when facing off against someone with five gene chains. Having fought to such an extent and displayed such tenacity, Princess Nala no longer cared who won, as Daniel had already fully demonstrated his talent. 
He had shown just how much more talented he was compared to Timothy of the fierce Tiger family, just from fighting this battle alone. This is a battle fought only by Daniel. Not interfere with it. Samson said, without turning his head around, as he continued to stare at the arena. The radiance of the inheritance armor reflected on Samson's eyes, and no one could tell what he was thinking at that moment. Huh. So what if you're still alive? Aren't you already at your wit's end? said John with a sneer after seeing Daniel's dreadful appearance. Just then, John concentrated the remaining gene energy into his arm and stretched it towards Daniel. This time, his target was Daniel's neck. Since his attempts to kill him several times failed, John had lost all his patience. His guard was down, and without thinking about it, John charged recklessly towards Daniel. Just when John was about to land his attack, Daniel suddenly started to smile. Although John suddenly felt a great sense of bloodthirst coming from Daniel, he had no choice but to follow through with his attack. Clenching his teeth, John hoped for the best as he clawed Daniel's throat. Just when John was about to grab Daniel by his neck, he repositioned his body so John's attack was on his shoulder. As his fingers pierced through his flesh like a spear, Daniel grunted in agonizing pain. <laughs> Little bastard, just go ahead and die already. John laughed like a lunatic, thinking that Daniel no longer had the strength to retaliate. Cries of shock sounded out from the audience as everyone bit their lips and clenched their fists in suspense. A look of anguish and despair flashed across their faces as they never expected Daniel's effort to be in vain. Suddenly, determination flashed across Daniel's eyes as he tightened his grip on John's hand. What? It was at this moment that John knew he had fallen in Daniel's trap. How do you still have the strength to resist? Didn't I already tell you? I will be the one to take your pathetic life. Letting out a ferocious roar, Daniel raised his other arm as a ball of light suddenly formed in his heavily damaged steel gauntlet. No! John screamed in agony. Now that his body had been completely drained of gene energy, he could no longer charge up an attack that would be powerful enough to resist the incoming blow. Go to hell! Roaring like an enraged beast, Daniel condensed the remaining gene energy from his body into the steel gauntlet and shot out a beam into John's chest at point-blank range. Swish! As a burning string of light burst from Daniel's palm, it pierced through John's body as it penetrated down into the ground behind him and sent the debris flying into the air. You! Blood gushed out of John's mouth as he stared at Daniel. His eyes were filled with pure rage. As the light in his eyes slowly faded, his soul gradually parted from his physical body. Thud. At that moment, John's body turned limp as he collapsed into the arena. Daniel, who was in a lot of pain, knelt on one knee, barely able to support his body as he panted heavily. John's strongest ability, the Wrath of the Wolf King, almost ended Daniel's life. Fortunately, the inheritance armor that he received from the Wild Lion family had activated at the most crucial moment and spared him. If not for that, Daniel could not imagine what would have happened to him. At this moment, his body was a complete wreck, even worse than the previous time when he received three attacks from John back at the Royal Mint camp. This time, he had truly used all his strength like an arrow at the end of its flight. Episode 46 Shameless Behavior Unlike John, Daniel managed to endure the pain and was the one who remained standing. Having suffered so many injuries on his body, Daniel was on the verge of collapsing, 
and could no longer bear to take even the slightest amount of further damage. Through sure willpower, Daniel laughed and slowly propped himself back up and stood proudly. He began looking around and saw debris and remains of the grand arena that was wrecked from their battle. Everyone in the audience stood in silence and stared at Daniel. Most of the spectators were either citizens of the Roaring Tribe or outsiders who came from other camps. But despite their differences, they all had the same exact thoughts. Finally, Daniel turned to look at the platform where the Wild Lion family were watching. Both the members from the Wild Lion family and Krista stood gazing at Daniel from the platform. Daniel raised his hand to indicate that he was all right. He would not die just like that. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. An awakened practitioner with two gene chains managed to defeat an expert with five gene chains. Sitting back down on his seat, Larry stared at Daniel and muttered to himself as if he was stuck in a nightmare. This is far too terrifying. This kind of potential is simply limitless. That boy. After seeing how Daniel won, Krista gradually relaxed and revealed a pretty smile. Very good, Daniel has an even greater potential than Ed of the Fierce Tiger family. Simply limitless, said Patriarch Samson, who spoke with the utmost adoration and praised Daniel nonstop. Just when everyone thought the battle was over with, a figure suddenly rushed out from the audience. Dressed in a red robe, his entire face was covered by his hood, which prevented anyone from seeing his identity. Having rushed out from the platform of the Crimson Dragon family, he slowly walked towards Daniel in the center of the arena. It seems that the gladiator tournament hasn't ended yet, right? The figure suddenly lifted off his crimson robe and revealed a body covered in a strange veined patterns. Since the tournament isn't over yet, I will be challenging you to a fight. You can choose to admit defeat, but if you fight in your current state, there may or may not be an accident. A threat lingered through his voice as he looked coldly at Daniel. This person was the candidate for the Crimson Dragon family in the Gladiator Tournament. When John had previously appeared, none of the people from the Crimson Dragon family dared to make a move. Seeing how Daniel had used all of his strength to kill John and was at his wit's end, the candidate of the Crimson Dragon family took advantage of his injuries and jumped out to challenge him. That person is the young master of the Crimson Dragon family, Ben. His strength is the same as Ed's of the Fierce Tiger family. He has also awakened at least three gene chains. Such a despicable act was not something that one of the great families would ever do. Why did the Crimson Dragon family not send any of their men to fight against John? Why did he only jump out after the awakened practitioner from the Wild Lion family killed John? They have no sense of shame at all. These are the actions of hooligans and rascals. Upon witnessing such a shameless act, the audience began insulting and degrading the Crimson Dragon family. To think that the Crimson Dragon family would be such cowards. Princess Nala fumed with rage as she said, Father, tell Daniel to come back. He has already done more than enough. We should just give up on the gladiator tournament and not let him suffer any more injuries. He is a smart and capable young man, so we can leave this to him, said Samson as he took a deep breath and stared intently at the arena. Although he did not know why, he had a strange feeling that Daniel had another ace up his sleeve. Even though the audience continued shouting and cursing, no one dared to raise any objection or dissatisfaction in the presence of the Crimson Dragon family. After all, even if they acted despicable and shameless, the Crimson Dragon family was still one of the three great families of the Roaring Tribe. They had both the power and influence to back up their actions. Other than the patriarchs from the Wild Lion and the Fierce Tiger family, the patriarch of the Crimson Dragon family and another Waken practitioner completed five of their gene chains. Thus, 
no one dared to offend the Crimson Dragon family. Even though everyone looked down on Ben of the Crimson Dragon family, no one dared to stand up for Daniel. They only dared to grumble and complain to themselves. You have a great and boundless future ahead in your life. There is no need for you to meet your end here just because of this trifling matter. Ben spoke with inexplicable arrogance and remained expressionless as if he was born to be superior to his peers. What do you think? Daniel remained silent for a moment, appearing as though he was seriously considering Ben's words. After a while, Daniel slowly lifted his head and looked at Ben strangely. I'm curious about one thing. Could you explain it to me? When Ben heard Daniel's words, he raised his head slightly with a curious look, indicating to Daniel to ask his question. Actually, my question is very simple. Daniel's mouth slowly curved into a sly smile. He wiped the dried blood off of his body as a dim light flashed past his eyes. How do you know whether I'll lose to you? Before he even finished his sentence, Daniel rushed forward. Daniel was not the type of person to just sit and wait for his death. Even though he had used up most of his energy, he would never give in to someone as arrogant as Ben. Having proven his strength by killing John, who had five gene chains, does the young master of the Crimson Dragon family actually believe that he can defeat Daniel just because he's injured? What? He took the initiative to attack even after suffering such severe injuries. He's looking to die, isn't he? However, seeing how confident he is right now, he might actually have a chance. He just used all his gene energy to take down an expert with five gene chains, and he still dares to take the initiative to attack? Isn't he overestimating himself too much? The people who had been openly expressing their contempt for the Crimson Dragon family burst with surprise when they saw Daniel's unexpected actions. Having just used all of his strength to defeat John, how could he still pose a threat against the young master of the Crimson Dragon family, who was in his peak condition? Isn't Daniel simply overestimating his own abilities and seeking his death at this point? Since you want to die that badly, don't blame me for what happens next. Episode 47 Triumph Seeing how Daniel still dared to take the initiative to attack him, Ben's eyes fumed with intentions to kill. With a loud roar, crimson scales began forming on Ben's body, surrounding his bare skin like armor. As his scales sparkled with fluctuations of gene energy, it possessed extraordinary power. Concentrating his gene energy into his fist, Daniel sent it flying towards Ben. Without any intentions to dodge the attack, Ben sent a punch of his own towards Daniel. Just as their fists were about to collide, a layer of golden aura suddenly enveloped Daniel's body, as a faint image of a golden lion's head appeared before him. What? You actually still have enough strength left to fight? Feeling the huge fluctuation of gene energy coming from Daniel's body, Ben was in absolute shock. No one, including Ben, expected Daniel to still have the energy to pull off another attack. Despite looking like he was on the verge of collapsing, Daniel could actually still unleash a huge amount of energy. In addition to killing the expert with five gene chains, the ferocious aura Daniel was emitting right now caused Ben to feel a great sense of fear as a chill shivered down his spine. At that moment, he even thought about avoiding Daniel's attack. <laughs> Stop bluffing. I want to see just how much strength you have left. However, when Ben thought about it again, the fear in his heart gradually subsided as he sneered at Daniel. As an awakened practitioner who possessed three gene chains, Ben naturally knew how gene energy worked for awakened practitioners. After such a high-intensity battle, Daniel would surely have exhausted all his gene energy. Although Daniel's attack might look ferocious, he should not have much power left. Scram! 
Daniel shouted fiercely as the golden aura surrounding his fist gained a large amount of gene energy. As such, their fists collided heavily as if two meteors had crashed into one another. Bang. As the series of violent shockwaves rippled from the center of the impact, Ben felt his fist crashing, not into a person, but instead into the jaws of a wild lion. The unparalleled force surged through his arm and spread through his entire being, which caused Ben to lose his balance. At that moment, Ben was shot backwards as he spat out a mouthful of blood. His internal organs seemed to have received a shock. One punch. Ben fell heavily onto the ground and looked at Daniel in fear, as half of the crimson scales on his body had been shattered. He could not believe that such a violent attack came from someone who was supposed to have spent all of his gene energy. The strength that Daniel displayed caused Ben to feel as if he was facing an awakened practitioner with five gene chains. The force from the attack was even more powerful than his father's, the patriarch of the Crimson Dragon family. Trash, do you think you can defeat me just because I'm injured? Daniel spoke like an immortal god of war as his eyes shone brightly. Even though his entire body was covered in blood, the aura he emitted was intimidating. Such power. Even in his current state, he can still injure the young master of the Crimson Dragon family to such an extent with a single punch? Does he really only have two gene chains? If so, how could he be so powerful? How is that possible? Didn't he get severely injured? Shouldn't he have used up all of his gene energy? The crowd erupted into a roar as they were all in pure shock. It was already a miracle for Daniel to live through his vicious battle against John. Even now, Daniel had enough strength to heavily injure Ben with a single attack. In the platform where the Crimson Dragon family watched, the other members in crimson robes stood up one after another upon witnessing how Daniel overwhelmed their young master. Not wanting to be outdone by the Crimson Dragon family, all the warriors from the Wild Lion family stood up with their golden armor in a formation that looked like a golden ocean. Those who dare to get in my way shall die. Letting out a loud roar, Daniel's voice filled with a domineering aura as his fighting spirit burned fiercely. Standing alone in the middle of the arena, he looked around at the audience. Those who dare to get in my way shall die. Feeling Daniel's imposing aura, the warriors of the Wild Lion family roared aloud as well. Their voices shook the sky as it resounded across the entire Colosseum. Even Larry, who usually remained calm and composed, wanted to join in on the fun as his face flushed with excitement. But as an elder, he could not possibly shout along with Daniel and the rest of the Wild Lion family. Instead, he held back his desires to do so and remained silent. Daniel seemed like a bright spark in the midst of the night as he ignited the firewood one after another. The flames ignited by Daniel's imposing presence spread through the entire Wild Lion family, like wildfire as the audience in the Colosseum started to join in. Those who dare to get in my way shall die. Those who dare to get in my way shall die. At that moment, a gloomy atmosphere shrouded the Crimson Dragon family. The constant cheers felt like crisp slaps into their face that antagonized them. After helping Ben up, the Crimson Dragon family quickly left the Colosseum, feeling dejected. With that, this year's Gladiator Tournament came to an end, as it became widely known as the most spectacular one since the beginning. The Wild Lion family had won the Gladiator Tournament by a landslide and would receive an extremely generous share of resources for the next three years. With this victory, the Wild Lion family could afford to spend more resources on improving the cultivation of their own awakened practitioners and warriors. Even if the Wild Lion family did not manage to produce any geniuses, unlike the other two great families, their influence in the Roaring Tribe did not waver either. 
It would be safe to say that the wild lion family would not be suppressed by the crimson dragon and fierce tiger families for the next three years. As Daniel slowly dragged himself towards the wild lion family, everyone from the wild lion family jumped down and ran to check up on him. Daniel, are you all right? Krista asked worriedly and was the first to arrive in front of Daniel. Following behind her were the group of warriors and other members of the wild lion family, including the patriarch, elders, and princess. They all waited for the return of their triumphant hero. I'm fine. I just feel... As the adrenaline pumping in his mind gradually wore off, Daniel suddenly lost control of his limbs and collapsed headfirst onto the ground as his vision darkened. A bit tired. Even during his collapse to the ground, Daniel was still muttering to himself. Having completed the Netherwolf gene, Daniel's attribute values had increased by leaps and bounds. Not to mention his strength and stamina. His spiritual force had even reached an unimaginable level. As a result, John's soul-devouring wolf roar did not have any effect on Daniel. Even with such power, Daniel still possessed a human body. After experiencing a series of high-intensity battles and enduring the pain from his severe injuries, his body would naturally collapse as soon as his adrenaline wears off. Daniel's battle of life and death against John was the greatest obstacle he had ever overcome. He relied on many external factors and still barely won, which indicated how he still had a long way to go in his journey. During these life and death situations, however, Daniel had also obtained many great benefits. The most important benefit he gained was his combat experience, as that is not something that can be obtained through mere training alone. Episode 48 Rewards Slowly waking up from his deep slumber and opening his eyes, Daniel was met with an agonizing headache. Looking up at the white ceiling, he could smell medicine in the air. He was at the medical center of the wild lion family. As Daniel tried to move his body, he realized that he was wrapped in a layer of bandages like a mummy. Feeling a sense of deja vu, Daniel did not know whether to laugh or cry as he experienced something similar back at the Royal Mint camp. However, the injuries he suffered this time were much more severe than last time. Seeing the condition he was in, Daniel found that his body was still recovering slowly. For Daniel to not be able to fully heal his injuries, his body must have been in a critical state. If anyone else had suffered such injury, they would have been considered lucky to have even survived. At this rate, it'll take a few more days for my injuries to fully recover. <sighs> Daniel let out a heavy sigh. If the others knew how Daniel was upset by his slow rate of recovery, they would not even know what to think about it. After all, it was a miracle that he managed to survive after such an intense battle. Even so, Daniel still complained that the recovery of his injuries was too slow. Without anything else to do, Daniel pulled out his attribute panel. Daniel, energy, 8,400 points. Stamina, 348 points. Strength, 514 points. Spiritual force, 197 points. Gene chain talent, strength of the ants, ant gene chain. 100% complete. Innate skill. Tenacity. Gene chain talent. Netherwolf gene. Netherwolf gene 100% complete. Innate skill. Roar of the nether. Gene chain talent. Wild lion gene. Broken wild lion gene 31% complete. Gene chain talent. Crimson dragon gene. Broken crimson dragon gene 14% complete. Even though Daniel had consumed a lot of energy during his battle with John, the experience he gained from the life and death battle was undoubtedly more valuable. There were also some unexpected rewards that Daniel did not expect at all. In order to activate the Wild Lion family's inheritance armor, 
Daniel was forced to extract the wild lion gene. During his battle with Ben of the Crimson Dragon family, Daniel had taken advantage of the situation and secretly extracted his Crimson Dragon gene. Since the Crimson Dragon family managed to become one of the three great families in the Roaring Tribe, the Crimson Dragon gene would not be inferior to the wild lion gene in any aspect. Daniel was looking forward to the moment he got his hands on the two great ancestral genes. Now that he had successfully done so, he would soon be fusing the Crimson Dragon and Wild Lion gene into one. What kind of gene would be produced? After resting for a while longer, Daniel felt that he recovered most of his strength as he pushed himself up and sat on his bed with some difficulty. As Daniel's actions attracted the attention of the medical staff in the Wild Lion family's medical center, they came over to analyze the condition of his body. After confirming that there was nothing wrong with Daniel's body, they gave him a look of reverence and reported to his superiors. After receiving the news of Daniel's recovery, Krista and the people from the Wild Lion family rushed over to the medical center at once. Not only Patriarch Samson and Princess Nala were there, but even the fierce Larry stood among them. Daniel, how are you feeling? Asked Krista with concern as she walked next to his bed. Your injuries were horrific to say the least. You've also been in a coma for three days. Is there anything wrong with your body? Hearing her gentle voice and seeing such a beautiful and alluring woman standing next to him after just waking up, Daniel could not help but feel aroused as his heart pounded nonstop. He also felt a feeling of warmth after seeing how much concern Krista had for him. I'm fine. I'll get better after a few days rest. Daniel smiled faintly as he kept his composure. Such a powerful regenerative ability was something that everyone present found difficult to believe. Having seen similar scenes before at the Royal Mint Camp, Krista was used to his inhuman abilities. When the others heard his words, they became extremely agitated. After all, Daniel had killed an awakened practitioner with five gene chains in the gladiator tournament by himself. Not only that, but he even defeated Ben of the Crimson Dragon family, who took advantage of Daniel's injured state. After such a high-intensity battle, even if Daniel were to win by a fluke, he would still end up in a wretched state. Having suffered such severe injuries, it was a miracle he did not become crippled, and it would be understandable if he had to rest for a year or two. Who would have thought that in only three days, not only did Daniel wake up, but he even said that he had almost recovered. Even the experienced and knowledgeable Patriarch Samson had never heard of such abnormal recovery abilities in his entire life. Such a powerful ability was rarely seen even among the awakened practitioners with high-level ancestral genes, not to mention that Daniel possessed the weakest of all superhuman genes. <laughs> Nephew Daniel is truly a young hero to have obtained the top spot in the gladiator tournament. Seeing that Daniel was fine, Patriarch Samson laughed heartily. A trace of surprise flashed across everyone's eyes as they noticed that Patriarch Samson addressed Daniel differently. As the Patriarch of the Wild Lion family, Samson was also Princess Nala's father. While this small change may seem insignificant, it had a deeper meaning to it. Princess Nala, who was standing to the side, blushed and lowered her head shyly when she heard the way her father addressed Daniel. Daniel didn't seem to notice anything amiss as he smiled back at Patriarch Samson and exchanged a few greetings. After chatting for a while and seeing that Daniel was now full of energy, everyone felt a great sense of relief. Therefore, Patriarch Samson took the opportunity to ask Daniel, There are some things that I would like to ask, nephew. I wonder if it would be convenient for you. Sweeping his gaze towards Samson, Daniel nodded and said, It should be fine. May I perhaps know what kind of questions the Patriarch would like to ask? As the eyes of the Patriarch swept across everyone in the room, they all took the hint and left not wishing to interfere with the conversation between the two of them. After everyone had left, 
Patriarch Samson's mouth curled up into a smile as he burst into gales of laughter like a sly fox. Nephew Daniel, I don't know if you still remember, but about the inheritance armor of the wild lion family. The patriarch hesitated for a moment before he continued speaking. You seem to have found a way to activate it during the gladiator tournament. Of course, I remember. If you hadn't lent me the armor, I would have been finished on the spot. Daniel nodded his head and said, The situation at the time was indeed precarious. If Daniel would not have had the protection of the wild lion family's inheritance armor, even if he survived John's fatal attack, he would not have been able to kill him. The wild lion family's inheritance armor was definitely not just a simple piece of armor. Episode 49 Marriage When Daniel received John's most violent attack, the inheritance armor was able to absorb most of the damage for him. Furthermore, the armor was not damaged in the slightest even after taking so much damage. If even John, who possessed five gene chains, could not damage the inheritance armor, it must definitely be more extraordinary than the members of the Wild Lion family had expected. Only after activating the armor and experiencing its effects for oneself would one be able to understand just how powerful it truly is. I'm rather ashamed of myself. Even after these few days of research, I still can't figure out how to activate it. The Patriarch of Samson said in an embarrassed yet inquisitive manner, Nephew Daniel, how did you activate the armor? Asked Samson, who was determined to get an answer. After all, the inheritance armor belonged to his wild lion family. Since he never found a way to activate it, Patriarch Samson had treated it as a family heirloom. However, Daniel managed to activate the armor's effects during the gladiator tournament. Standing on the platform of the wild lion family, Samson detected the abundance of gene energy that surged from the armor after activation. The unexpected amount of gene energy held within the armor even shocked Samson himself. After all, the gene energy in the armor was comparable to the ones unleashed by an expert with five gene chains. Thus, how could Samson, as the patriarch of the wild lion family, sit still after knowing that fact? Despite taking a long time to study the inheritance armor, he still had not found a way to activate it. But yet, a random outsider managed to activate the armor after wearing it for the first time. Samson could not help but ask Daniel about the secret behind the activation of the armor, but he did not know how he managed to activate the armor. The only thing he remembered was how incomplete wild lion gene in his body trembled uncontrollably when the armor activated. This proved that the armor could only be activated by people who possessed the wild lion gene. Aside from that fact, there were still other secrets to this armor that Daniel wanted to keep to himself. He did not intend to reveal any more information. I'm... Not quite sure either, but I suspect that the armor only activates when it detects a fatal threat coming its way?" Daniel said as he looked seriously at Samson. Upon hearing his words, Samson fell into a deep thought. Judging from the pause in his voice, it was obvious that he did not believe Daniel. After all, Daniel had insisted on choosing the inheritance armor when he selected equipment from the treasury of the wild lion family. Samson did not think too much about Daniel's decision, thinking how he was simply intrigued by the strange equipment. Furthermore, Samson did not have much hope for this year's gladiator tournament in the first place, though he had agreed to it. Who knew that Daniel would actually wear the inheritance armor of the wild lion family in his battles? Relying on his physical strength alone, he turned the tide of his fights and won the gladiator tournament in one fell swoop. The incredible amount of gene energy released from the inheritance armor during his battle with John had made even Samson, an awakened practitioner with five completed gene chains, tremble in fear. If Daniel had not known about the effects of this inheritance armor, 
or use some sort of special method to detect the energy contained within it, why would he have chosen such a youthless armor to begin with? Thus, it was clear that Daniel did not want to tell him how to activate the armor. As Daniel was nevertheless a benefactor of the wild lion family, Samson could not force him to say anything. As the atmosphere between the two became rather awkward, the two of them continued staring at each other for a while before Samson broke the tension by laughing. Nephew Daniel, what do you think about Nala? Daniel was instantly confused by the unexpected question, as he thought Samson would still want to inquire about the details regarding the inheritance armor. Though Daniel was unable to keep up with Samson's jumping train of thought, he nodded subconsciously and said, She's not bad. A beautiful young lady, to say the least. This was Daniel's first impression of Nala. Ever since he arrived in this apocalyptic world, Daniel had been fighting battles of life and death while constantly trying to improve his strength. When did he ever have time to get into a relationship with a girl? After he answered the question, Daniel seemed to have noticed something amiss. He realized that Patriarch Samson had been addressing him as nephew the entire time, which immediately made him become alarmed. Wait, Patriarch Samson, is there anything else you would like to ask? Had it not been for the excessive layers of bandages on his body, Daniel would have already jumped up from his bed by now. Then, <laughs> what do you think about marrying into my wild lion family? After all, you are now widely known through the Roaring Tribe as the Golden Prince of my Wild Lion family. Seeing how Daniel caught his hints, Samson got straight to the point without trying to cover up anything. Not only will you be able to enjoy the abundance of resources in my Wild Lion family, but you will even inherit my position as the Patriarch in the future. At the very least, you will have a much brighter future than if you were to stay in your F-Class gathering ground. Samson tried to tempt Daniel by listing out the benefits of marrying into the wild lion family, which were all very true. If Daniel really did marry into the wild lion family, he would definitely have a much easier time raising his strength. With all those benefits, however, you will have to fulfill two of my conditions. The child you have with Nala must be named Samson Jr. And you must guarantee that my wild lion family will continue to flourish for the next hundred years. Samson said, also raising his own conditions. It had to be known that the reason why awakened practitioners were different from ordinary people was that not only because their abilities had increased, but also because of their lifespan. Since they usually live longer than ordinary people, awakened practitioners tended to be rulers of this era. Judging from Daniel's limitless potential, he would at the very least be able to awake five gene chains in the future. If that's to be the case, he could live for as long as 150 years, thus enabling him to ensure the prosperity of the family for the next hundred years. Daniel's jaw dropped to the ground as he looked at Samson in shock. Stunned for a brief moment, Daniel gulped with great difficulty as a cold sweat dripped down his forehead. That, um, was I not only a representative for the wild lion family in the gladiator tournament? Hmm, are you not satisfied? Upon hearing this, Samson's face immediately darkened. He stared menacingly at Daniel as an inexplicable pressure gradually emitted from his body. After seeing Daniel's actions in the gladiator tournament, Almost everyone in the Roaring Tribe knew that Daniel was Princess Nala's chosen one. After all, if he wanted to participate in the Gladiator Tournament, Daniel had to first be a member of the Wild Lion family. If an awakened practitioner who was not related by blood wanted to become a member of the Wild Lion family, they could only do so through marriage. After all, Samson could not possibly let Daniel recognize him as his adoptive father, right? After hearing Samson's proposal for him to marry Nala, there was no way Daniel would agree to this arrangement. Episode 50 The Spring of Life 
Samson's pressure from the wild lion gene did not affect Daniel, but he knew that he could not afford to let Samson, the patriarch of the wild lion family, down. Yes, I am willing. Daniel answered reluctantly, but he did not have any intention of staying behind. In reality, Daniel did not have much talent. The only reason he ended up being so powerful was because of his ability to extract genes. Thus, if he wanted to keep improving his abilities, Daniel would have to fight more awakened practitioners with a wide variety of genes in order to obtain better genes. The wild lion family could provide him with a peaceful place to train along with an abundance of resources, but Daniel did not need any of those things. Even if he did not want to stay in the wild lion family, it was not a good idea to upset or anger Samson right now. If he ends up marrying into the family, wouldn't he end up being a mere son-in-law? Daniel thought back to Princess Nala's slim figure and delicate face. Such a dignified temperament and appearance could only be found in the lady of a noble family. Needless to say, being able to marry someone like her was extremely tempting. Since Daniel agreed, Samson appeared to be more confident regarding his daughter's marriage. Regardless of whether or not Daniel was truly willing in his heart, Samson believed that after Daniel married into the wild lion family, it would be exceedingly difficult for him to escape his responsibilities. With Daniel marrying into and watching over the family, in addition to Samson's current strength, it would be more than enough to guarantee the reign of the wild lion family for the next hundred years. In that case, you will be engaged to Nala for the time being until the day of marriage. But before that, there is another matter of utmost importance to discuss. Samson said after thinking for a moment. Well, the gladiator tournament may be extremely important to the three great families of the Roaring Tribe. The distribution of resources will only be a portion of the initial amount. As expected, I didn't think that the three great families would care too much about these resources given their background and strength, said Daniel. Having already been into the treasury of the wild lion family, Daniel had a rough idea how the Roaring Tribe worked and how rich each of the three great families were. With such abundant resources in their possession, Daniel did not see an understanding why the three great families would pay such a huge price to get the top spots in the ranking of the tournament. After all, the gladiator competition was not as simple as it seemed. Hearing Patriarch Samson's words, there appeared to be a deeper meaning behind the gladiator tournament. After a while, Samson explained everything to Daniel. The reason why the Roaring Tribe is considered an E-class gathering ground is due to the three great families standing side by side. Each family has an awakened practitioner with five gene chains overseeing it. Samson's tone sounded rather glum. The only reason why the three great families had been able to keep the Roaring Tribe under their control was that the patriarchs in every generation would possess at least five gene chains. Only the awakened practitioners with the highest combat strength will be able to reach the upper limit of their respective family. Every generation? Said Daniel, who was taken aback by this. Besides the fact that the three great families would rely on each other to maintain the balance of power in the Roaring Tribe, it was as if the patriarchs of each family were someone without a single gene chain. This seemed very strange. Could it be that in these past few generations, no patriarch had ever completed the sixth chain of genes? Perhaps there were even cases where they did not possess the talent necessary to awaken their fifth chain. That's right. In reality, not every patriarch in each generation of the three great families has such talent. Some of their gene chains were even forced out through artificial methods. Samson said in a serious tone. Shocked by Samson's words, Daniel stared at him in disbelief to confirm that he was not joking. After all, being able to awaken five gene chains through artificial methods was far too shocking. One has to understand that awakened practitioners themselves were rare and precious resources. 
Even the commander of the Royal Mint Camp, William, had only awakened four gene chains himself. If awakened practitioners with five gene chains could be created artificially, then humans wouldn't be in such a difficult situation now. In the center of the Roaring Tribe, there is a three-headed demonic beast that symbolizes the three great families. I wonder if you noticed. Samson said, ignoring Daniel's shocked expression. I had indeed seen it when I first arrived and thought it was simply an ordinary statue. Could there possibly be some other secret behind that statue? Said Daniel, as he thought back to the enormous statue standing at the center of the Roaring Tribe. The statue was meticulously shaped into a magical beast with three different heads, the head of a lion, tiger, and dragon. Each of the heads represented the respective great families of the Roaring Tribe, the wild lion, the fierce tiger, and the crimson dragon family. Since there were symbols in most other human gathering grounds, including the Royal Mint Camp, Daniel did not pay much attention to it. When Samson brought up the existence of the statue, Daniel immediately remembered it. The statue holds the entrance leading to a secret underground realm that contains the spring of life. By cultivating in the spring, one would be able to further strengthen and refine their gene chains. Samson paused a moment before continuing. The underground secret realm, however, would naturally have its own restrictions. Only awakened practitioners with three gene chains or below are able to enter the place. Moreover, several dangerous and rampant mutant beasts roam its grounds. If one is not careful enough, they could possibly meet their end within the realm. Oh, in other words, the spring of life in this secret realm can increase the strength of an awakened practitioner? Daniel's eyes widened as he began analyzing Samson from head to toe. Since he is the patriarch of the wild lion family, he must have had quite a bit of training in the spring of life. Knowing what Daniel was already thinking and without hiding its past, Samson exclaimed, There's no need to make wild guesses. Only by cultivating in the spring of life did I manage to awaken five gene chains. There are unfortunately limitations to this spring of life, as it can only produce a certain amount of its water every three years and its effects will differ between each awakened practitioner according to each of their talents. In other words, if an ordinary person were to refine their body before entering the spring, they would still be able to improve in terms of strength. However, the degree of improvement would be extremely small. While it could possibly allow them to become an awakened practitioner, in theory, ordinary people would simply be unable to withstand the pure gene energy seeping into their body. Will there be any side effects resulting from the spring of life? Daniel asked. Even the gene drugs that awakened practitioners would do anything to obtain would contain an abundance of gene energy that an ordinary person could not endure. Thus, Daniel did not believe that the unrefined gene energy from the spring of life would not produce any negative side effects on its user. Episode 51 New Mission This is indeed a side effect. When you are being tempered by the spring of life, not only do you have to withstand the violent gene energy, you also have to deal with the mental demon illusion that keeps appearing. Samson glanced at Daniel and said in a deep voice, But there is no absolute insurance. If you want to improve your own strength, you have to take the risk. Samson's tone carried a deep sense of helplessness and melancholy. Just think about it. If the three major families of the Roaring Tribe were to compete for the spring of life, they would have to nurture an awakened practitioner. The other two families would have to send their disciples into the spring of life, although they might lose some of them along the way. But as long as someone was able to stand out, this person would become a rising star in the clan. Samson was helpless and felt that he could only choose this method to nurture his disciples. If the wild lion family's strength is weaker than the other two families, then the other two families wouldn't be at peace like they are now. 
they wouldn't even have the resources to provide for their families. There wasn't anything to even discuss. What do you want me to do by telling me this? Daniel asked curiously. Samson told him all these secrets about the Roaring Tribe and the three families for no reason. Daniel thought that Samson must be trying to use him to achieve something. The reason why an awakened practitioner has transcended the mortal realm is because he has unlimited possibilities in his body. Samson's expression became serious as this seemed to be a very sensitive issue. The wild lion family needs someone who can handle handle the situation, so I hope you can bring Nala to the Spring of Life. There are a lot of risks in the underground secret realm. Apart from the monsters that run amok everywhere, you also need to be wary of the people from the other tribes. The people who enter the secret realm are not only the three big families of the Roaring Tribe, but also some other E-grade tribe who possess the entrance to the underground secret realm. The duels that happen every three years are to fight for the number of people who can enter the underground secret realm. The families who get the first place can send three people. The families who get the second place can send two, and families who get the last place can only send one person. The wild lion family has always been the third place. I didn't let Nala enter because she's a girl and I was worried that she would enter the secret realm alone. However, with you accompanying me this time, I feel much more safe. After listening to Samson's slow explanation, Daniel became silent. In fact, he had already made up his mind. Whether he would marry into the wild lion family or not, it didn't matter. This trip to the secret realm was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If what Samson said was true, the opportunities in the secret realm must be countless. Even the other people from the E-grade tribe would participate. The battle here would surely be intense. This kind of dangerous environment could allow Daniel to quickly increase his strength, and he could also encounter all kinds of different genes. After all, the higher the level of the gene extracted by Daniel, the faster his strength would increase. No problem, said Daniel after he thought about it for a while. Leave the task of escorting Nala to me, but you said there are three people. Who is the other candidate? You will know when you set off. There is still one month until the opening of the underground secret realm. Take this month to recuperate and prepare. Samson waved his hand at Daniel then got up and began leaving. Come back from the underground secret realm? You will be engaged to Nala and officially enter the wild lion family, said Samson as he left the ward, leaving Daniel who was lost in thought. In the next few days, Daniel had started making plans. Daniel's injuries had basically recovered. Although he was still feeling some pain when he used the gene energy, with the existence of the tenacity, he would only need half a month to recover back to his peak condition. When he was in the gladiator tournament, the genetic weapon and steel gauntlet that Daniel had fused with had been completely destroyed by John's violent attack. Also, the inheritance armor of the wild lion family had been tightly guarded by Samson after being activated by Daniel, but now both of Daniel's luxurious equipment were no longer in existence. Luckily, Daniel had gained something from the Gladiator Tournament. In addition to his rich combat experience in life and death battles, he had also extracted the genes of the Crimson Dragon family. In fact, these were all secondary. What Daniel cared about most was that Princess Nala seemed to suddenly become passionate about him. Basically, every day when Daniel got up, he would see Princess Nala bring an exquisite breakfast to his room. Daniel had never thought of having the princess of the wild lion family personally deliver breakfast to him. At first, Daniel didn't like that, and he had tactfully told Princess Nala not to deliver any food. But Princess Nala had no intention of listening to him. 
She still came to Daniel's room every morning to deliver food on time. Because of this, every time Daniel went out, he would feel the strange gazes of everyone in the wild lion family. Daniel instantly felt like he was a giant panda in a zoo. Every day, everyone would stare at him. One day, Daniel took advantage of Princess Nala's absence and slipped out of the territory of the wild lion family by himself. Daniel felt that his body had almost recovered. He could start to do what he had always wanted to do. That was fusion genes. A single strength from distress and sandwolf gene could fuse together to produce a netherwolf gene that could greatly increase Daniel's strength. If two great ancestral genes, the berserk lion gene and the crimson dragon gene were to fuse together, what kind of result would that produce? Daniel was looking forward to it. In order to prevent the fusion gene from releasing some gene energy fluctuations that would attract the attention of the people from the wild lion family, Daniel found a secluded place. He still had to go to the market to purchase some items that he needed. After walking on the streets of the Ruin tribe for a while, Daniel found a medium-sized inn. He used a few beast cores to rent a room for the day. Although the Roaring Tribe was large, the number of awakened practitioners was small. Therefore, Daniel's stay at the inn should not attract the attention of the other awakened practitioner. After making all the preparations, Daniel sat on the bed and closed his eyes. His mind became calm and focused. The gene fusion had begun. <laughs>